Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this Parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to his warning about the economy in August 1986. That, and I quote, we are now in a crisis which is as great as the crisis of war. I ask the Prime Minister, given that foreign debt has significantly worsened and that we are in the worst recession for 60 years, why haven't you shown the same leadership in the economic war that has ravaged almost, almost, almost all Australians as you did in making our commitment to the Gulf War? Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister. Well, Mr uh, Speaker, it's very interesting that uh, the Leader of the Opposition goes back to uh, 1986 because I understand that uh, there has been a good deal of uh, uh, retracking to 1986 uh, relating to a comment by my colleague the Treasurer back uh, in that period. And uh, it seems appropriate, therefore, Mr Speaker, to satisfy the Leader of the Opposition that I should, uh, in fact, indicate to the Leader of the Opposition, at some length, because presumably he regards it as a serious question, just what leadership has been provided in that period and the achievements that have been made for this country in that period. And it only came uh, from uh, the leadership that this government provided. Now let me, first of all, uh, Mr Speaker, look at the macroeconomic change in that period since 1986. Uh, in the year to the June quarter uh, 1986, the underlying inflation rate was 9.8 per cent. In the year to the December quarter 1990, it was 5.4 per cent. Uh, a remarkable uh, reduction, Mr Speaker, by any standards. Looking at employment, since May 1986, almost three quarters of a million new jobs have been created, with employment growing at an average annual rate of 2 per cent. And that, in that period, is some three times uh, the rate of employment growth that you were able to achieve in the government that you were advising. And the question of manufactured exports, Mr Speaker. The volume of manufactured exports in 1988, 1989-90 uh, was 90 per cent up on the period from 1985-86. That was an average annual real rate of growth of 17.5 per cent over the period. If we look in the area of tax, there has been a whole raft of tax reforms in that period, Mr Speaker, uh, in, uh, including reductions in personal and corporate tax. Let's uh, look at the question of the top rate of personal tax. In 1985-86, it was 60 per cent, the level that you walked out of office with. That's the best you could do, 60 per cent. It is currently 47 per cent. The refer to the opposition rather than you, lest people think he's referring to me. <laughs> Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I can assure you I would never find you guilty of what they were guilty of, Mr Speaker. Now, Mr Speaker, let me uh, say that uh, when they, the opposition, uh, were in government, they walked out of office with a top uh, personal rate of 60 per cent. We reduced that to 47 per cent. The corporate tax rate in 85-86 uh, was 46 per cent. It's now 39 per cent. In 1985-86, the gold mining industry enjoyed a quite unjustified exemption from corporate tax. That situation was remedied with effect from the 1st of January this year. Looking at the budget deficit, uh, Mr Speaker, they don't like being reminded of the budget deficit that we inherited, but I'll tell you what it was. It was $9.6 billion. In 1985-86, Mr Speaker, Order. Mr Speaker, the budget deficit Order. Well, you ask, you, you ask, you ask your friend, uh, 
the ex-Senator Stone what was in prospect. He'll tell you. $9.6 billion. Now, in 1985 86, uh, Mr. Speaker, the budget, deficit, the budget deficit was almost five and three quarter billion dollars. In 1989 uh, 1989 90, we'd achieved a surplus of just over $8 billion, a turnaround in that period from 85 86 of just on $14 billion. If you look at investment, Mr. Speaker, business fixed investment as a share of real non farm GDP was 11.2 per cent in 85-86. It peaked at a record 13.7 per cent in 88-89 and remained well above average at 13.2 per cent in 89-90. And if you look very importantly, Mr Speaker, at something that those opposite should hang their sh head in shames about, if you look at the area of superannuation, Mr Speaker, we're changing the face of superannuation in this country, turning turning something which was a privilege for the few into a right for all workers, working both through the Accord and through the sort of reforms to the tax system we announced in May 1988. Now, those are the changes, the great changes, the enduring changes for the benefit of this country in the area of macroeconomic reform. If you look at the area of microeconomic reform, Mr Speaker, let me just take up a little bit of the House's time in referring to the massive changes since then. We have continuously, continually, continuously in that period since 1986 pushed back the constraints on what is achievable. Mr Speaker, I suggest that if in 1986 you had been told that a government in this country, any government, could have gone as far as we have in reforming the microeconomy, you would have been met, met with utter disbelief. For example, in the area of tariff cuts, Mr Speaker, an area where you never did anything. You were there in office year after year after year and you kept an economy insular, protected by these high tariff walls. Now, Mr Speaker, what we have done is uh, virtually knock those walls down, and they have been virtually eradicated by the decisions we have taken in just five years. The average effective rates of assistance were 22 per cent, 93 today they are 12 per cent, by the end of the decade 5 per cent. Nominal rates, of course, Mr Speaker, are similarly falling from 13 per cent on average to 3 per cent. In other areas of microeconomic reform, Mr Speaker, look at what's been done in this period. Deregulation of domestic aviation, deregulation of foreign investment, the Royal Commission on Grain Handling and the great reforms that have been acknowledged that have come from that. Telecommunications reform, first in 1988, to remove some of the more obvious impediments in that area to competition in secondary markets, and then more recently for direct competition. Award restructuring, Mr Speaker, and productivity bargaining to add flexibility to a wage system while, in the outcome, retaining an achievable national aggregate uh, result. Deregulation of oil marketing, major reforms of the defence industries, removing a large drain on the taxpayers' resources, reduction of crew sizes, Mr. Speaker, reduction of crew sizes in the area of maritime industry, bringing down the uh, manning levels in Australia to the OECD averages by 1992 and a program of waterfront reform, Mr Speaker, firstly to reduce manning levels in the industry, secondly to lift productivity, thirdly to remove industry levies and thirdly, uh, fourthly, Mr Speaker, to create a genuine system of company-based employment and the competitive dynamic which that will produce. Now, Mr Speaker, let me add that while all those things have been done in this period under the leadership of this government in the era of macro reform and micro reform, this government has also been about building a more just society. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, now, Mr. Mr. Speaker, let, Mr. Speaker, let me prove my point. The fundamental building blocks that this government has provided for creating a more just Australian society are, firstly, firstly, Medicare; secondly, taxation reform including the capital gains tax and uh, the fringe benefits tax, and thirdly, Mr Speaker, increasing, increasing real benefits for those in society most in need. There have been further improvements, Mr Speaker, in social justice since 1986, despite the constraints that have been placed upon this country by the external adjustment task. Mr Speaker, without doubt, the most important of these achievements has been the family allowance supplement, which was introduced in December 1987. And, uh, Mr Speaker, that was uh, introduced to assist low-income families. In 1990, uh, 1991, Mr Speaker, 
We provided over half a billion dollars for family allowance supplement, $587 million to be precise. Combined with family allowance, Mr Speaker, we now provide the equivalent of $50 net income per week to low-income families with two children. In addition, Mr Speaker, rent assistance was extended to low-income families in December 1987. Commonwealth-funded childcare places, Mr Speaker, have increased by more than 80 per cent to 155,600 places. Since 1986, Mr Speaker, there have been further increases in social welfare benefits and pensions in real terms, bringing the pension, bringing the pension up, bringing the pension up to over 25 per cent. Order. Mr Speaker, bringing the pension up to over 25 per cent of average weekly earnings. And that reform process is continuing. The Minister assisting me on social justice is overseeing an important agenda reform, including, Mr Speaker, ameliorating locational disadvantage through addressing problems of access to employment, education and services faced by people living in particular areas, such as the outer fringes of our major cities and rural and remote areas. Now, Mr Speaker, of course, the coalition, to the contrary, are not at all interested in social justice. What they are about is re-entrenching privilege in this country, and they would do that, Mr. Speaker, by abandoning, by abandoning the fundamental building blocks of Medicare and capital gains tax, and by an attack on the social welfare system. Mr. Speaker, when you look at all those areas of macroeconomic reform, microeconomic reform social justice, you have a total refutation of this absurd allegation that leadership has not been provided by myself and the Treasurer and this government since 1986. As a result of all that's been done, Mr Speaker, this economy is going to be a stronger economy and the foundations of social justice Order. in this country have been advanced. The Honourable Member for the Northern Territory. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Community Services and Health. Is the Minister aware of media reports last week about the poor diet of many school children? What is the government doing to educate school children about improving their diet? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, I thank uh, the Honourable Member for Northern Territory uh, for his question. Uh, one that goes to the issue of uh, nutrition and diet, but of course it's one that uh, is extraordinarily important uh, to all Australians. The question of nutrition and uh, diet and uh, the lack of the poor nutrition that uh, a number of Australians suffer from is a major cause uh, of many, many illnesses. And of course, uh, particularly for Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory, uh, the situation uh, faced by so many people uh, reflects, uh, in fact, these problems of nutrition and diet. The reports uh, that the Honourable Member referred to uh, were uh, following the launch of a booklet called The Nutritional Value of Australian Foods. That uh, booklet uh, was launched uh, at Darabin Parkland's uh, uh, secondary college uh, in my electorate. The department uh, assisted the food science class at Darabin College to conduct a snapshot briskets breakfast survey of 100 students the day before the launch. And that showed that 14 boys and 17 girls consumed no food or drink before school on that day. Of the children that had eaten breakfast, 10% of the boys and 16.5% of the girls had eaten only one thing. For example, fruit tubes, cheap cheese twisties, a wagon wheel, Coca-Cola, cough lollies or che chewing gum. The media around the country, Mr Speaker, conducted their own snapshot surveys, which backed up both this finding and the more authoritative results from the National Dietary Survey of School Children, aged 10 to 15 years, which found that 8.5 per cent of boys and nearly 10 per cent, 9.8 per cent of girls, did not consume anything before 9am on a school day. In a total number of respondents, uh, Mr Speaker, of over 5,000, a very significant, uh, uh, very significant number. These uh, figures, Mr. Speaker, are shocking figures in many respects. They indicate an underlying problem, which results uh, in uh, very, very substantial health risks and ultimately uh, poor health for many, many Australians. 
It's one of the reasons why the government, uh, as part of its Better Health program, has given uh, the strongest uh, emphasis to the whole area of nutrition. It's one of the reasons why uh, the uh, ABC program Everybody, which uh, many members would have seen, has been uh, supported by the government and has very rapidly achieved uh, one of the highest ranking uh, programs within the ABC as it seeks to deal with the issue of poor nutrition uh, in Australia. Mr Speaker, uh, obviously a great deal needs to be done in the area of nutrition. I can't think, and I'm sure uh, my colleague the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs would agree with me, that there is no more significant uh, problem to be faced if we're going to deal with the appalling health problems of Aboriginal people than seeking to improve the level of nutrition. The issue for people in remote areas, Mr Speaker, is a much more serious one in many respects uh, than those that live and live in metropolitan areas. It's one of the reasons, Mr Speaker, that one has to uh, find oneself uh, rather shocked and amazed that the opposition, Mr Speaker, should float, uh, as uh, indeed they have, the notion of a consumption tax, recognising that the cost of food uh, in the Kimberleys is already 40 per cent uh, above the cost in metropolitan areas. Now, Mr. Speaker, when one goes to order, the, the member for O'Connor on a point of order. The order. minister for health for firstly has no. Does the response. member for O'Connor have a point of order? Yes, section 145 relevance. The minister was asked a very serious question o order. about children's order. diet and has order. been the given a good hearing. Suddenly, seat. he's on the consumption the member for tax, and that is irrelevant. His seat. The minister is Get in order. Back. I warn the member for well, O'Connor to cease interjecting. Perhaps it's, uh, perhaps it's not news in Western Australia, uh, Mr Speaker, that the concept of a consumption tax is being floated by the opposition and simply the fact that I point out that when you go to the question of nutrition, a tax on food, a tax on food which is integral to a consumption tax, must have distributional consequences which uh, would worsen the situation that's already serious. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is uh, to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, the highest rate of unemployment in 1982 was 9.4 per cent, and the current Treasurer described the Australian economy in 1982 as being in depression. As unemployment is now 9.9 per cent and rising, on the Treasurer's own definition, is Australia now in a depression? The Honourable the Prime well, uh, Minister. Mr uh, Speaker, I'll come to uh, the uh, honourable gentleman's uh, definitions in a moment, but uh, let me uh, point out, Mr Speaker, uh, that the uh, peak of uh, unemployment uh, in the 1982-83 recession was, of course, uh, in double digits. I think it was 10.4 per cent. And of course, Mr Speaker, let me point out, if you'd had the participation, if you'd had the participation rate then that you've got now, it would have been about 14.5 per cent. Uh, so uh, don't take any comfort from that. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it's very interesting to note uh, that uh, the uh, honourable uh, gentleman has uh, now produced uh, uh, an index in which he uh, purports that uh, he can uh, draw some comfort in regard to the government's uh, performance vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the opposition in these matters. Now let me say before I go to the details of this uh, subject, Mr. Speaker, that of course no one. Uh, can draw any joy at all out of the recent increases un in unemployment. I have said, the Treasurer has said and uh, relevant ministers have said uh, that we deeply regret the hurt that has been caused as a result of the necessary economic decisions that we have taken. Mr Speaker, very unfortunately in this uh, country today, the opposition, and particularly the shadow Treasurer, are taking every opportunity to talk down the Australian economy. As they, they gleefully, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Order. they gleefully greet, gleefully greet any bad news, dismiss any good news, and their latest uh, performance, uh, Mr. Speaker, the latest performance is the so-called misery index uh, that's been produced uh, by uh, uh, by the uh, gentleman who asked the question. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's very interesting that uh, according to uh, popular economics where this misery index has been used, the fact is, Mr Speaker, that the misery index has traditionally been the sum, the sum of the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. And on that basis, Mr Speaker, the traditional misery index that's been used, that uh, index peaked 
in 1982-83 at over 21. And uh, in the December quarter of last year, Mr Speaker, it was 15. In other words, the traditional misery index peaked in your recession at 21. It was 15 in December of this uh, December quarter of last year. And it's likely, Mr Speaker, that it will remain that that index will remain broadly unchanged with the release of the uh, March quarter CPI tomorrow. So, Mr Speaker, quite clearly, the traditional misery index didn't suit the member for Flinders. That was, that, that was no good to him, because when you use the traditional misery index, it revealed 21 for you, 15 in December under this government. So that didn't fit the opposition's rhetoric, Mr Speaker, the traditional misery index. So, uh, so undeterred by that, they decided to invent one of their own. And, uh, Mr Speaker, it was released over the weekend by the member for Flinders. Now, it should be dubbed, of course, the Wreath Index because uh, wreath and misery are synonymous, Mr. Speaker. We're told, we're told, Mr. Speaker, we are told that this creation of the shadow treasurer is made up. It's made up of unemployment, Mr. Speaker. It's made up. We're told of unemployment, inflation, interest rates, taxation, and foreign debt. Of course, we're not told how it's compiled, Mr. Speaker. But one can only, only assume, of course, coming from that source, that the figures are arranged in a way that provides the best light from the coalition's point of view. So it's not a great uh, surprise, Mr Speaker, that when you have a look at this uh, index that's been released by the member for Flinders, well, I don't mind showing you because I'm going to demolish it. There it is. There it is. Now, Mr Speaker, when you look at this, when you look at this uh, index, you will find, Mr Speaker, that uh, Order. Just looking at it, you'll find that from 1983 to 1991, the graph seems to show, Mr. Speaker, that the index rose by the order of 35%. Now that's the that's the figures that uh, you produced at your index, and it seems on your uh, on your index to have gone up from 1983 to 1991, order. gone up here, Mr. Speaker, the by the, the order of 35%. Now, what, did, what does surprise you, Mr Speaker, Order. when you have a look at this index, you'll find that uh, the shadow treasurer included Order. the figures, included the figures, Mr Speaker, for the, the period... The member for Young will cease interjecting. The member for Mayo will cease interjecting, as will the member for Benelong. Order. There, there is far too much interjection on my left. The member for Mayo has been a persistent interjector throughout throughout this order throughout this week throughout this order members on my right will cease interjecting the member for mayo has been a persistent interjector throughout this week i have called him to order on a number of occasions this week i have called him to order again if the member for mayo persists in interjecting i will name him without warning the honourable the prime minister now, Mr Speaker, as I was saying, if you look at this uh, so-called index, you find in the period from 83 to uh, 91 that it rose by 35 per cent. Mr Speaker, if you look at the period from 1975 to 1983, the period for which they had responsibility, the misery index produced by this gentleman increased by 50 per cent. In other words, in their period of office, a 50 per cent increase, a 35 per cent increase under this, uh, under this government, Mr Speaker. Now, the uh, member for Flinders uh, can't even, out of his own production, Mr. Speaker, produce a case which would establish that there has been uh, uh, a degree of uh, incompetence in regard to the production of misery greater on this side than on his own. We don't accept, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, the compilation of the index. But all I'm saying is that, on the face of it, you did infinitely worse in your period of office than we have done in ours. But the, po the important point, Mr Speaker, is this, that by the production of these sorts of indices, by the way they get up in this House, they attempt to produce the impression that they have some sort of compassion for those who are in this community suffering the uh, from the uh, current economic difficulties. The fact is, Mr Speaker, that nothing could be further from the truth. You simply have to ask yourself the question, what is it that those opposite want to do which will impact upon these people about whom they are speaking. And there are four things, Mr Speaker. First of all, they would, first of all, as I said in this House yesterday, Mr Speaker, they would abolish 
they would abolish unemployment benefits after nine months, throw people under the dole. Secondly, secondly, Mr. Speaker. Order. Secondly, Mr. Speaker. Order. Secondly, Mr. Order. Speaker, they would introduce. Order. Secondly, Members Mr. Speaker, they would introduce objection. a voucher system for education and for health. Thirdly, Mr. Speaker. Thirdly, Order. Mr. Speaker. Thirdly, Mr. Speaker, they would introduce an inflationary consumption tax, and they then, Mr. Speaker, we found out in this House last week that, in regard to workers in this country who would be required to undertake uh, a whole process of restructuring, retraining, undertaking uh, reforms that would bring in enormous productivity increases in this country, we find that the position of those opposite is that the reward of those workers would be exactly nothing. They would get nothing, Mr. Speaker. They criticised in this House Order. By, way, Order. by way of interjection last week, Mr. Speaker. They said in regard to the waterfront that waterside workers should get no increase at all for a situation where they produced a 60% increase in productivity. Now that's the sort of that's the sort of compassion. That's the sort of compassion, Order. Mr. Speaker, that Order. these people have. It is. It is a charade, it is mass hypocrisy, Mr Speaker, to suggest that in respect of those opposite, they have the beginning of compassion for those people in this community who are suffering as they are in these present tough economic circumstances. Everything that the opposition are saying that they would do would compound the misery of these people and give no incentive whatsoever to any worker in this country to undertake the reform which is necessary to make for a more competitive economy in this country. The Honourable Member for Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I address my question, Mr. Speaker. Order, order. Ha ha. My question, Mr. Speaker, without notice, is to the Treasurer and Deputy Prime Minister. I ask the Treasurer: Is he aware of recent comments comparing Australia's order. economic position now with the position in 1986? Can the Treasurer advise the House? as to the accuracy of these comments and provide details of the structural economic progress which has been made since 1986. Order. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I can't. Mr Speaker. Order. The, Mr. Member, Speaker. the member for Benelong will cease interjecting. The shadow, the shadow Treasurer is afraid to question me, so obviously uh, the uh, Government backbench feels that they should take up the uh, the running. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, today the shadow treasurer said today the shadow treasurer said well unfortunately sadly the Australian economy is much worse today, and uh, he is referring to remarks I made five years ago. The essence of those remarks were never never about the cyclical position of the economy at that time. They were simply about the structural position. And I said, uh, uh, and uh, what they said, uh, yes, I did. I said just that. No, and then I'll read it out to you. Order. Order. There is far too much noise. The member for Gippsland will cease interjecting. Let me read it to you. An extract that said, what we inherited in 1983 was not just a budget deficit but a massive current account problem, a totally uncompetitive economy. And I said uh, earlier in that interview, if this government cannot get the adjustment, get manufacturing going again, keep moderate wage outcomes and a sensible economic policy, then Australia is basically done for. Now, now Mr Speaker, but I've the fact is, the Mr. Speaker, Mr. The fact is, Mr Speaker, those changes have been those structural changes have been very profound. Let me let me refer to read some of them. The Prime Minister has referred to many of them. But let me just go to the principal one. On the balance of payments, the balance of merchandise trade in April 1986 was a deficit of $675 million for the month. In March 1991, it was a surplus of $615 million for the month. That is a shift from a deficit of $675 million in merchandise trade to the month to a surplus of $615 million for the month. On the balance of goods and services, on the balance of goods and services, oh, they don't like it, they don't like it. On the balance of goods and services, 
In April 1986, Mr Speaker, that balance was a deficit of $952 million for the month. In March 1991, the latest available figures, it is for a surplus of 231, from a deficit of 952 to a surplus of 231. On merchandise exports, from May 1986 to March 1991, monthly merchandise exports have increased by 18 per cent, 13 per cent per annum, annum average annual rate of improvement. Manufactured exports, as distinct from merchandise exports, from May 86 to March 91, monthly manufactured exports have increased by 178 per cent. That's per month, 178 per cent. That's a 23.6 per cent per annum average annual rate of improvement in manufactured exports. Now, if we're talking about structural change, we must be talking about manufactured exports, merchandise exports, balance of goods and services and balance on merchandise trade, all a huge, vast change. On the current account deficit, Mr Speaker, in April 86 to March 91, the monthly current account deficit improved by 24 per cent. In terms of GDP, another measure, now, off the balance of payments and on to GDP, constant price, seasonally adjusted GDP increased by 15 per cent on a quarterly basis from the June quarter of 86 to the December quarter of 1990. In the same period, Mr Speaker, GDP per head increased by 7 per cent. That's GDP per capita by 7 per cent. Employment, total employment seasonally adjusted has increased by 11 per cent from May 86 to April 1991. And if we look at inflation, the Prime Minister covered, covered the inflation uh, figures adequately. When he said the, uh, when he said the, the uh, CPI quarterly change in the same period for the year before, the June quarter 86 was 9.8 per cent, and to the December quarter 1990 it was 6.88 at an underlying rate, as he said, of 5.4 per cent. On investment, capital expenditure, constant prices, seasonally adjusted, all industries total has increased by 23 per cent. 23 per cent from the March quarter of 86 to the December quarter of 1990. So if you're listening to a retinue of structural change, if you think you're hearing it, you're right, you're hearing it. Change in public spending. Changes in public spending. In the 85, six outlays were 30 per cent of GDP. Revenues were 27. In 1989-90, outlays were 23.6 per cent of GDP and revenues 25.8. On a radio program today, Mr Speaker, the Shadow Treasurer was asked about the 7 per cent of GDP and 30 billion, which I had said a day or two earlier, had been given to the private sector to invest. Reith. Well, he'll never tell us how he worked out that 30 billion, you know, because it's just a figure plucked from, pluck from thin air. I mean, I mean the deceit of that answer, Mr Speaker. That is, we've taken, out, we've taken outlays down from 30 per cent of GDP to just under 24, 23.6, 7 per cent of GDP. GDP is running in the order of 400 billion. Seven times that is 28 billion. In round figures, 30. That's where the number came from, as you well know, with your dishonest answers, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. In terms of uh, for the in, Northern Territory. in terms of revenue, revenue over the period fell 6.4 per cent of GDP. Outlays fell 6.4. Revenue by 1.2 per cent of GDP. Now, in terms of international comparisons, the Shadow Treasurer had this to say. He said in this interview this morning that Australia, he said, was going. Whilst everyone else has been going well, we've been going backwards. According to the OECD, between 86 and 90. The following cumulative GDP increases were recorded. Japan, 23 per cent. Australia, 16 per cent. Germany, 14 per cent. Italy, 14 per cent. UK, 14 per cent. Canada, 13 per cent. US, 12 per cent. France, 11 per cent. So far from going backwards, well, everyone else has been going well, Mr Speaker. Australia has had a faster rate of growth than all of the big seven economies other than Japan. That nails that lie. That nails that lie. That nails that lie. Now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so when when I when I made these references to the fact we inherited in '83 not just a budget deficit but a massive current account problem, a totally uncompetitive economy in that interview in 1986, those statistics—the balance of payments, 
balance of goods and services, merchandise exports, manufactured exports, the current account de deficit, the GDP measures, the employment, inflation, investment, change in public spending and international comparisons nail the lie, and I table the statistics. The Honourable Member for North Sydney. <coughs> Mr Speaker, I direct a question without notice to the Minister for Arts, Sport, Environment, Tourism and Territories. Uh, I ask the Minister, does she agree with the view exp expressed by the leader of the National Party in New South Wales, Mr Walt Murray, that the proposed toxic waste incinerators should be located in Sydney? Are any sites in the Sydney area being considered as a possible location for the incinerator, and if so, what are they? Will the minister rule out Sydney as a possible site for the toxic waste incinerator? The Honourable the Minister, the Leader of the National Party on a point of order. Clearly, the very the first part of that uh, question is asking for an out and out opinion, and under the standing orders is out of order, and you should so rule. The rest of the question was in order. The Honourable the Minister. The Honourable, the Honourable, if the Leader of the National Party would like me to ask the member for North Sydney to rephrase his question, I'd be happy to do that. Well, because I think I'd, the, the minister will answer the question. I can assure the House that, unlike uh, Mr Murray, I will not be giving an opinion. I'll be outlining a process, and I think that's the point. And I think that's the point of the exercise, because because what has happened is that currently there is underway a process which has been agreed to by the New South Wales government as well as by the Commonwealth Government and, I understand, also by the Opposition and the Victorian Government and every other environment minister in this country, a process to try and find a site for a high-temperature incinerator. Now, the process that is underway is a process that is laid down in New South Wales legislation, where, but whereby we will be doing an environmental assessment on seven sites that have been selected. The process the process will be conducted by an independent panel of four people. The four people are Professor Charles Kerr, who is Professor of Preventive and Social Medicine at the Sydney University, Wendy MacArthur, Executive Director of the National Trust, Dr Ben Salinger from the Department of Chemistry at the ANU, and Michael Davidson, former President of the National Farmers Federation. So those four people are there to oversee the process. Now the process, the first part of that process now is to examine the technical aspects of the seven sites. One of the other parts of the process is to also look at the whole concept of high temperature incineration and assess the concept of storage versus incineration. Now it is unfortunate that Mr Wall Murray has made comments about the site. It just happens that some of those sites that have been selected are in his electorate. But on the other hand, <laughs> well, order, order. What, but what Mr. Murray has said is he doesn't object to the concept of an incinerator. He just objects to it being in his electorate. <laughs> but. But he is also part. But he is also, as deputy leader, is part and parcel of a process Order. Members that of the his opposition will cease and eject the leader of the national and party. And I have to say that the New South Wales Environment Minister Tim Moore, spokesman, said yesterday, and I endorse this statement. He says the New South Wales government has been is locked into this process and will not be diverted from it. And I endorse that statement because it is a statement that is very important that we retain the integrity of the process, because it is a much more important process than the sectoral interests, the particular interests of Mr Wal Murray and his particular electorate. Because what we have in Sydney and in Melbourne, in, in electorates like Maribyrnong, in electorates like Botany, we have a disaster waiting to happen. Now it is right, nobody wants, nobody wants high temperature incinerated, but the problem is we have had years of neglect in these areas of the environment, and we have got this material Order. in storage. Process is underway, and it will be adhered to. The honourable member for Kennedy. 
Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. And my question, without notice, is to the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. Can the minister um, inform the House what role the government expect, expects farm organisations to play in assisting to overcome the difficulties currently being experienced in rural seats like Kennedy and the bush generally? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much. The um, question the Honourable Gentleman asks is a general one, um, and, uh, but it does reflect a very important matter, particularly during this um, situation of um, a downturn. Um, on a number of occasions in the last few months I've commented that, uh, on the desirability of a cooperative approach uh, between the Commonwealth and state governments and uh, between all pe people involved uh, in handling these, uh, the rural crisis. In relation to farm financial matters, for instance, there are many uh, parties involved. The Commonwealth Government has a responsibility which it is discharging through managing the economy so as to get sustainable reductions in interest rates and uh, also by providing targeted money for the individuals, individual farmers in crisis through the Rural Adjustment Scheme. The banks also have a responsibility. Last month, when I announced the increase in funds for the Rural Adjustment Scheme, I stressed the importance of the banks doing what they can to help in the present circumstances. And, uh, when I talked to the banks recently, they said that they would certainly involve themselves very much with the State Rural Adjustment Authorities and also with the Farm Counselling Service. And the banks have exhibited an indication that they will be flexible, and I would hope that they be very sympathetic to individual uh, clients, because uh, the rural sector has an enormous capacity to recover, but we know the year ahead, particularly for wool, is going to be very difficult. Uh, the state governments are also involved because of their capacity to provide assistance for farm families, which are financially strapped and through their ability to match carry-on loans under Part B of the Rural Adjustment Scheme. And uh, the Queensland and South Australian governments have been uh, uh, very sympathetic in that regard. Advisors such as accountants, rural councillors and extension agents are involved because of the importance uh, that farmers having access to the best financial advice and skills possible. Now, after I announced the Rural Adjustment Scheme package last month, I was critical of the reception given to it by some state farm organisations. Uh, the New South Wales farmers, for example, um, seen intent on marginalising cells with saying things which are just plainly wrong as well as politically motivated, and their attitude wasn't constructive, and, uh, nor was it informative. The approach, on the other hand, of the National Farmers Federation has been professional, positive and broad-ranging. The National Farmers Federation can be proud of the fact that it has succeeded in helping uh, get farmers to understand macroeconomics, international trade, microeconomic reform and soil conservation. All of these topics are now well and truly on the agendas of farm organisations and therefore on the agendas of so many individual farmers. And I think there is a proper understanding that these are matters which really count for farmers and farm incomes. And I think uh, slowly it's starting to dawn on people, certainly not the National Party, but it is slowly starting to dawn on people that there needs to be a proper understanding that it is analysis, uh, that it is ideas that really count. Uh, lobbying, of course, is still uh, very, um, very active, and we understand that. Um, but it is ideas more than simply trying to exercise numbers or some of the crude thuggery um, that we often see exhibited with some of the farm organisations. And uh, I do give credit uh, to the National Farmers Federation because they are concentrating more and more on ideas. And I was pleased to see even. Mr Mac Drysdale, the incoming chairperson of the Wool Corporation, saying that uh, it is ideas that count a lot more rather than uh, crude politics. And I think while I'm on the feet, I might uh, pay uh, credit to the outgoing president of the National Farmers Federation because John Allwright uh, has uh, succeeded in continuing to make the National Farmers Federation an adornment to rural politics uh, rather than carrying on with some of the uh, stupidity that the National Party has inculcated and encouraged in farm organisations for so many years to the detriment of farmers. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question without notice uh, is again to the Prime Minister, and I, I refer him to the remarks of the Treasurer about deception. Prime Minister, I refer to the Treasurer's statement after the 87 budget that this is the great coming of age of Australia and his comment after the, the May 88 uh, mini-statement. We have acted decisively to turn the situation around. And to his statement after the August 88 budget, this is the one which brings home the bacon. And finally, 
to his comment after, uh, after the 1990 budget when commenting on recent times, he said these were definitely the golden years of change. I asked the Prime Minister, given that by the end of this term Labor will have been in office for 13 out of the last 20 years, I mean, how long do we have to wait before these golden times arrive? Yeah. The Honourable the Prime Minister. If the uh, Honourable Gentleman had been listening, uh, uh, Mr uh, Speaker, he would have heard from the answers that I've given and that the, and, and that the uh, Treasurer has given. Order. Mr Speaker, let me repeat. If the Honourable Gentleman had been listening to the answers that have been given by myself and the Treasurer, he would have understood that fundamental changes have been initiated over this period of office. That will mean that the Australian economy is going to be significantly more competitive in the future. The figures that I gave and that the Treasurer supplemented in regard to the enormous growth in uh, manufactured exports uh, would show, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, that the, uh, uh, the changes that are necessary to make Australia more competitive have in fact uh, occurred. Let me, Mr Speaker, refer to uh, some uh, statistics. I hope I've got them here. I think I have. Um, Order. Mr Speaker, let me, uh, for instance, uh, refer, and I, I suppose these aren't reliable enough statistics because they only come from the OECD. But let's uh, look at this uh, table, uh, Mr Speaker. This is a table covering uh, the period uh, uh, from uh, 85 uh, to uh, 89, uh, which takes in the, uh, the period that you're talking about, the latest available statistics, and this, regard, uh, this relates to manufacturing employment, production and exports over this period. Now this is the, from the OECD. If we look at employment, if we look at employment uh, Mr Speaker, the figure for the OECD as a whole shows that manufacturing employment between 1985 and 1989 went from increased by 1 per cent in the OECD. 100 to 101. That was the OECD. In Australia, it moved from 100 to 109. And on a quick inspection, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think, in fact, that there was only one other country, one other country, which had a higher growth in manufacturing employment in that period, and that was Spain, where the index went from 100 to 113. So there you have it. In terms of manufacturing employment in this period, the OECD up by 1%. Australia up by 9 per cent. If you look in terms of uh, production, the OECD, uh, the OECD moved from 100 to 120. Australia was above the OECD average. It went from 100 uh, to 121. Uh, Mr Speaker, if you look at the volume of exports, now this goes right to the heart of the question that was addressed to me. What sort of changes are happening? What fundamental changes are happening in regard to Australia's capacity to be a competitor in a, uh, an increasingly competitive world? This is what happened in regard, Mr Speaker, to export volumes. For, OECD, for the OECD as a whole, uh, the index went up from 100 in 1985 to 131. That's a 31 per cent increase for the OECD as a whole. Mr Speaker, Australia went from 100 to 179. That's in terms of the exports of manufactured goods. Against an OECD average of 31 per cent, we went up to 79. And again, on a quick inspection, only one, only one country, only one country in the OECD had a better performance, and that was the United States, which pipped us by 2 per cent. The United States went to 81, from 100 to 181. Now here you have again, Mr Speaker, the opposition trying to write Australia down. They don't want to acknowledge the enormous performance that's been made by Australia, better than any other country in the OECD in terms of the volume of exports of manufactured goods. What you ought to be doing is clapping and applauding that your country has done better than any other country in the OECD. That's what you ought to be doing. If you were concerned about your country, you wouldn't be trying to play it down. You would say, what a marvellous thing that only one country in the OECD, the United States, has done better than us. Well, I can say from this side of the House that we in government take pride in the fact that the great changes that we have overseen in this country have enabled this country to do better than any other country in the United States. And if you want to go on in the next two years trying to write your country down in the way you are now, you'll pay the price, and it'll be a deadly price that you'll pay in two years' time.
The honourable member for Fraser. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Resources and concerns the current review of the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme. Can the minister advise the House whether it's intended to have Australian Capital Territory participation in the review process? Is there any basis for the reported concern that electricity charges will increase as a result of the review? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for Fraser for his question and uh, place on record his continuing and close uh, interest and involvement in this important issue. The Snowy Mountain Scheme, as honourable members will be aware, is internationally regarded as, and properly so, as an engineering masterpiece and uh, something that uh, represents Australia's best endeavours. Uh, more than 100,000 people coming from over 30 countries contributed to its construction, and in scale and vision in this country, it really only has been uh, matched by the North West Shelf Project. Now, the scheme is governed by the Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Agreement, under which it operates as a joint venture arrangement between the Commonwealth and the states of New South Wales and Victoria. In recent years, it has become increasingly evident that existing arrangements have major deficiencies, and consequently, the aim of the review is to put in place new arrangements which will improve the efficiency of the scheme, simplify and modernise management and institutional structures and provide for a proper rate of return on the scheme's assets. Now, the Commonwealth believes that as the Snowy Scheme provides around 30 per cent of the ACT's electricity, the ACT should be involved in the review process. However, the Snowy Mountains Agreement cannot be changed without the concurrence of all three parties, and both the governments of New South Wales and Victoria have consistently refused to allow the ACT to become involved in the review process. And of course, under the existing constitutional arrangements, unless uh, both New South Wales and Victoria change their position, uh, most unlikely in my view, it is regrettably not uh, possible for the ACT to be directly involved. Now, as to the uh, second part of the member's question, it's of course only speculation whether ACT electricity prices will rise until such time as a reform package is decided. However, I should stress that under existing arrangements, the scheme is almost totally reliant on borrowings for capital expenditure. And if the scheme is to maintain its role as Australia's premier provider of in environmentally benign peak load power, then on some estimates up to about $400 million will be needed to provide uh, uh, over the next 20 years uh, for major refurbishment of generating plant and equipment. Uh, my preferred view is that these funds should be generated internally from a proper rate of return on funds invested. Uh, as I indicated, that is precluded under the existing arrangements. Now, rectifying this will um, obviously require either increased prices um, for uh, some uh, constituents in Canberra <laughs> or increased efficiency and obviously to the extent possible um, a reliance on the latter, that is increased efficiencies, and I believe there is considerable room for improvement there, will dictate uh, less reliance on increased prices. Now, in the final analysis, uh, we'll be probably looking at a combination of both. Uh, but can I assure, assure the member for Fraser and the member for Canberra that the Commonwealth will continue to ensure that the ACT's interests are recognised in the negotiations and that the ACT is consulted on changes resulting from the review? And in conclusion, I think everyone in the House would agree that a scheme like the Snowy, with the massive investment uh, that the Australian people have placed in that uh, important scheme, uh, does require uh, a commitment by, uh, by everyone to ensure that over time the necessary refurbishment takes place that will ensure that uh, the Snowy goes into the next century as an important uh, entity in its own right, but perhaps uh, uh, even more importantly as possible, possibly a central component of the emerging uh, developments in terms of a national electricity grid. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Mr Speaker, my question is directed without notice to the Prime Minister. 
Prime Minister would be aware of today's front page story in The Australian, which included the following analysis, and I quote, Australia has entered the dark world Mr Keating himself conjured up five years ago. Long-term high unemployment, low growth, social division, shattered confidence and talk of depression. Well, the Prime Minister sacked the man who made the prediction and who then blithely watched it all happen. And getting back to fundamentals, what hope, what encouragement and what future do you offer to the 800,000 unemployed in these economic circumstances? Yeah. The Honourable the Prime Minister. If I, had any, uh, any, if I had any choice in the sacking, it would be the sacking of the editor for such uh, misleading uh, uh, headlines, uh, Mr. Uh, but, uh, Order. Order. That is not within my province. It's not within my province to deal with the editor of the Australian, and it is certainly within my province uh, to deal with the uh, treasurer. And as far as the treasurer is concerned, uh, uh, he will be uh, staying and doing uh, the job of treasurer, which has produced a situation. If you want to, uh, I'll play quotes with you. I mean, you've uh, quoted one paper. I'll try the uh, try the Sun Herald today. A Bankers Trust chief uh, chief economist Stephen Miller said yesterday. The structure of the Australian economy was much better now than it was five years ago. Now, now, Order. The Leader of the oh, Opposition. Oh, I see. So, I warned uh, the member for Kuyong. So you should cease saying, interjecting. What we're saying, as usual, on the other side, Stephen Miller is a liar because he worked for the Treasurer. That's what we're saying. Good on you. OK, good on you. Anyone who's worked for anyone in this... Uh, I mean, I, I suppose, according to that logic, according to that logic, that uh, I should question any report coming out of, uh, of the Irish Embassy at the moment, because the person there worked for you. <laughs> I mean, what, what a remarkable, pitiable, despicable logic that is. According to your logic, because someone has worked for the Treasurer, he is now incapable of giving an honest report or an honest analysis. The, the inevitable logic of that is that I should instruct... I should inst order. Oh. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. M M Mr Speaker, I simply point out to the Prime Minister the inconsistency in his argument position. when he attacks if me as being an advisor in the phrase he is. The Leader of the o Order. Uh, Mr. Mr. Order. In attacking, the, in attacking the, the Leader of the Opposition when he was advising Order. the Order. The Prime Minister might resume his seat for a moment. The Leader of the Opposition should not take uh, frivolous points of order. If the, leader of the opposition, if the Leader of the Opposition has a point of order, he should make a point of order. He should not endeavour to interject into the debate by standing at the dispatch box. The Honourable the Prime Minister. And, Mr Speaker, let, 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 me dis, let me dismiss his interjection. May I say that when I referred to him when he was working for the, uh, when he was working for the then government, I was not questioning his honesty, only his competence. <laughs> now, uh, Mr Speaker, but let, 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 let me just make the point, just to show the, the despicable depths to which these people opposite descend. We have now established the position that because a person has worked for someone in this government, their integrity is gone. You can't rely on what they've said, what they say subsequently, once they've worked for anyone on this side. Now, I simply say to you, according to the logic of that position, I should instruct the Minister for Foreign Affairs to discount, disregard anything that comes out of uh, the Irish Embassy because the person there used to work for the Leader of the Opposition. You only have to state such a proposition to see what a despicable sort of uh, interjection came from that side. If you want to say that Stephen Miller is a liar and can't be relied upon, Order. say it. But you won't, be, you won't be casting any reflection on Stephen Miller, you'll be casting a reflection party. upon yourselves. So, uh, Mr Speaker, let me say in respect to the uh, question asked by the uh, Leader of the uh, National Party. I simply would say this, uh, if you're asking a question about social divisiveness, I would say that there has been no point in the post-war history of this country when there was greater social divisiveness in Australia than in 1983. This country, after seven years of Conservative government, had been reduced to a situation where there was no sense of co uh, social or economic cohesiveness. You'd abandon any system, any concept of trying to have a sensible wages outcome which could result from discussions between employers and trade unions and government. You'd set yourself against workers. You'd set workers against employers, employers against workers. You'd had an 18 per cent blowout, which was the worst we'd seen in that period. And you had Australian set against Australian. 
There was never any period in the post-war history of this country of greater social divisiveness than that period over which you presided. We came into government. We called the summit in 83, and for the first time in the history of this country, we brought employers, we brought workers together. And as a result of that, the, uh, the uh, country has produced a situation under that era, that unprecedented era of cooperation, where these things have happened, which you couldn't even dream about, let, let alone start to produce. 11 per cent reduction in real unit labour cost, because people weren't at one another's throat. You had employers and trade unions and government sitting down together and working. You had a situation where you'd had a pitifully low profit level, profit division in this country, and because you had the trade union sitting down cooperatively, working with employers and governments, you had a shift from wages to profits, something that you couldn't engineer because you'd set workers against their employers and one against the other and governments against a lot of them. Now, we change that and you've got a position where if you want to test it by uh, a pretty uh, well-known criteria, the level of industrial disputation, not a bad sort of indicator as to what sort of degree of cohesiveness in the country, you brought industrial disputation under your government to unheard of levels. Under my government, industrial disputation has been reduced by 60 per cent compared to the period when you were in office. So whatever criterion you want to look at, whatever criterion you want to look at, I'll tell you how, how socially, co how socially cohesive you were when you were in office. Your concept of social justice, of co social cohesion in this country was that one child out of three, one child out of three would stay on and go on to uh, year 12. And you know, they weren't the kids, they weren't the kids of the poor and the lower middle income. They were the kids of the well-to-do in this country. That was your concept of social cohesiveness. That was your concept of offering hope. You couldn't, for two, Order. For, for two out of three of every Australian children, the hope that you held out to them was two out of three of you won't get to year 12. That was the hope you held out for Australian kids. And in eight short years, in eight short years, we've changed that from one out of three kids going on to year 12 to oh, being two out of Gilmore. three of kids going on to year 12. We've created 140,000 additional places in our universities so that they can go on and develop and train their talents. That's the hope that we hold out to kids. True it is that at the moment there is higher unemployment. But it is certain, as a result of the basic changes that we've made in this country, that with the lower inflation regime that we're bringing in, that this country will move out of recession in the second half of this I'll year, and you will go into a position where Australia will have rates of inflation comparable with its trading partners, where it will be infinitely more competitive than it's ever been before. And those kids who can now go to school and stay on in school that never could under you will have the opportunity of either going on to university or going into technical institutions or going into employment. They will have the chance that they've never had before under the Tories of this country to have an equal opportunity of having their talents trained. That's what we're doing about social cohesion in this country. The Honourable Member for Coria. Speaker, my question without notice is also to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is aware that it is now over two months since the March 12th industry statement in which he indicated that $40 million would be made available for assistance for those affected uh, by changes in the automotive plans. The Prime Minister also indicated that assistance to the textile and footwear industries would continue. I asked the Prime Minister, is he aware? that there are now 2,500 persons who have lost their jobs in the automobile industry in the Geelong region and in excess of 2,000 in the textile, footwear and clothing um, industries in the two months since the March statement. When can, I, when can I expect and the people of Geelong expect positive announcements on the proposals which were contained in his statement for assistance? Order. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank, uh, I thank the honourable member for Corio for his question, and I, I say to him that the government recognises the uh, extent to which regions like Geelong have been affected by the downturn in the economy. As part, Mr. Speaker, as part of the uh, March the 12th uh, statement, my colleague, uh, uh, the minister uh, John Dawkins, announced a comprehensive package 
Uh, as the honourable member will recall, he announced a comprehensive package uh, to ease the effect of the recession on the labour market and uh, a number of options for providing help to those workers whose employment is affected by continuing structural change. Now, of these, uh, the measures most relevant are an expansion of the Office of Labor Market Adjustment, the introduction of the Passenger Motor Vehicle Labor Adjustment Package, the introduction of the Training and Skills Task Package and the Job Skills Program. The Office of uh, Labor Market Adjustment has been expanded with the primary objective, Mr Speaker, of improving the employment uh, futures of the individuals and the regions and industries affected by structural change. A package of assistance, uh, I can uh, say to the honourable uh, member, is currently being developed specifically for the Geelong region. An initial element of assistance was approved in mid-February 1991 for the training of retrenchees and unemployed for placement at aerospace technologies and Australian uh, aircraft uh, services at a cost of $300,000. Further elements of assistance are being developed uh, through e extensive community uh, consultation with a view to that package being finalised in uh, June of this year. The Passenger Motor Vehicle Labor Adjustment Package was introduced retrospectively from 1 February 1991 and it replaces the previous package of assistance to the industry under the Labor Adjustment Training Arrangements and it provides immediate assistance to retrenchees from the major plan producers and component manufacturers. Mr Speaker, up to $40 million has been allocated for the uh, Passenger Motor Vehicle Labor Adjustment Program from the period from the 1st of uh, February of this year to the uh, 31st of December 2000. There's already been some take-up under the package and an increasing number of participants are expected to be assisted over the next two months. In addition, a labour adjustment package already exists for workers affected by reductions in assistance to the TCF industry. The adequacy of that package in assisting uh, displaced workers is presently under review. However, displaced workers can continue to access the package during the review period, and under present arrangements, $50 million was allocated to the package to assist adjustments to 1995. The training and skills, that is the task program also announced, is designed to assist the employment retention and improve the skills base of employees who would otherwise be retrenched. Under task, assistance will be provided to companies from the 1st of July 1991, uh, I point out to the honourable member, for these purposes for the development and delivery of a training package for the affected employees and as a contribution towards a training wage which will be paid to employees while they are participating in training. Consultations and negotiations on this matter are currently being carried out with the peak union and employer bodies. $15 million has been allocated to the program in 1991-92, rising to $25 million in subsequent years. Now, while uh, I would say to the honourable gentleman, Mr. Speaker, that the program will not formally commence until the 1st of July, negotiations with the ACTU and peak employers on the concept of the training wage and the administrative arrangements for the program are well advanced, and consultation in regions such as Geelong are being currently undertaken to identify enterprises with potential uh, for assistance from that date. The introduction of the new work experience and training program, job skills is also the 1st of July of this year. Negotiations with unions and employers about the level of the proposed training wage are currently being conducted and further consultations will be held with individual state and local government authorities, with Skillshare projects and other organisations which have the capacity to implement job skills. And Mr Speaker, may I conclude by saying to the honourable gentleman that as soon as the industrial, administrative and uh, program delivery arrangements are formalised, Placements will commence under the program. The Honourable Member for Isaacs. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Is it a fact that more than 5,000 people lined up in Melbourne recently to try to gain employment at a new department store which is not due to open for more than five months? How can the Prime Minister explain to the average Australian and the people in my electorate that this is the recession we had to have? And what can the Prime Minister offer to these people trying to survive in the depths of the worst depression since the 1930s? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I won't uh, burden the Honourable Member for Isaacs with the uh, list of uh, programs 
uh, that uh, are in place as distinct from uh, the situation when you people uh, brought in the recession of 1982-83. There is a range of programs, and if the honourable gentleman is not aware of them, I will uh, undertake to submit to him a, a total list of the uh, training uh, packages and programs that are available to assist those who at this time are unemployed. There has been an unparalleled expenditure by this government on such programs. And uh, I'm not surprised, Mr Speaker, in response to the first part of the honourable gentleman's question, uh, that a very large number of people are seen to be queuing up for that and for other jobs, because if you have got unemployment at the level you've got at the moment, of course you're going to have people queued up for jobs. But as distinct, Mr uh, Speaker, as I've said earlier this week, uh, from the attitude of the party to which you belong and to which you're committed, we don't adopt the position that when people are disadvantaged by the change in economic circumstances that you throw them on the scrap heap. What your party did, what your party did, and uh, let me remind you, let me remind you so that you have uh, no doubt at all as to what your policy is in this area, you not only created record unemployment, but then you delivered order. Oh. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Isaacs on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I did ask a specific question in relationship to the 5,000 people and issues in Isaacs, not for the Does Prime the Honourable Minister member to talk have a point about of order? what my political party Does the Honourable did. Member have a... I warn the Honourable Member for Isaacs that if he... If, if order... Oh. Members of the Opposition will cease interjecting. If the Honourable Member for Isaacs wishes to take a point of order, he should do it in the form of the House, not just attempt to join in the debate. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I, I'm not surprised at all that the Honourable Gentleman doesn't want to hear the facts about his own party. You ask me uh, uh, what uh, we could offer, and I'm telling you, and by way of uh, substantiating the virtue and the merit of what we can offer, it is a very relevant uh, thing to point out that this is substantially different from what you and your party have not only done in the past but what your principles still are. Now, what you did was to create record unemployment, but instead, instead in that situation of having some compassion for those that you threw out of work, you deliberately reduced in real terms, you deliberately reduced in real terms the benefits that would be available to them. And let me remind the House again, Mr Speaker, of precisely what the philosophy of those opposite is in regard to this matter. In the period when you were in office before, leading up to those record levels of unemployment, what did you do in regard to people who depended upon you in government to be able to, looked after, to be looked after in times of difficulty? I'll go through the list. It's not only those who are unemployed, and looking up to the ceiling won't save you from your sins because this is a matter of record. Now, Mr. Speaker, let's look at the position of the sole parent. Let's look at the position of the sole parent with two kids. What did you do? I tell you how compassionate you were for that category, for that most disadvantaged category of society. You reduced the real value of the benefit by 4%. This government has increased it by 32% in real terms. What did you do, as I said the other day, for the married pensioner with two kids? Your concept of compassion was to do this, to deliberately reduce the real value of their benefit by 2 per cent in real terms. That's what your concept of compassion was. Well, I tell you what our concept of compassion is. It's been to increase the real value by 26 per cent. You reduced it by 2 per cent. We've put it up by 26 per cent. And the unemployed single adult, what was your concept of compassion for the unemployed single adult? I'll tell you what it was, to reduce the benefit by 19 per cent in real terms. That was your concept of compassion. Our concept of compassion for that person uh, renting privately has been to increase the real benefit by 54 per cent. The single pensioner, what was your concept of compassion? Reduce the real benefit by 2 per cent. Our concept of compassion has been to increase it in real terms by 21 per cent. What about the married pensioner couple with uh, no dependents? Your concept of compassion was to reduce it by 2 per cent in real terms. Our concept of compassion is to increase it by 18 per cent. So if you want to know about uh, what the difference is between your party, your philosophy, this government and its philosophy, you will find, you will find it's stark and clear. 
Not only did you create the record levels of unemployment, but you kicked them in the guts by reducing the real value of benefits. Now, as far as we, and that, Order. and that represents not only your policy, but it represents your philosophy. As far as this side of politics is concerned, we are different in terms of policy because we're different in terms of philosophy. Our philosophy is that if people in the community become disadvantaged through no fault of their own, then the community will increase the real benefits available to them. That's what we've done. That's what we'll continue to do. And when the time comes to be judged in 1993, I'll come down to Isaacs with you and you'll get rolled. The Honourable Member Mr. for Speaker. Philip. Mr Speaker, I, I seek leave to move. Order, I've called the Honourable Member for Philip. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. She was, the Honourable Member was on her feet. The Honourable Thank Member you, for Mr. Philip. My, my question is addressed to the Minister for uh, Transport and Communications, and I ask whether... Order. And I ask whether he's aware of a study done by the Australian Broadcasting Tribunal into the um, implementation of new program standards for Australian television. And I wonder if he can let the House know how the commercial broadcasters are implementing the new standards. The Honourable Minister. I thank the Honourable Member for Philip for a question, not least because it yet again exposed the inadequacies of the Leader of the Opposition in his comprehension of the forms of the House. <laughs> but, uh, Indeed, uh, very good progress has been made in implementation of the standards brought down by the ABT uh, uh, last, uh, last year. And uh, it's been done in circumstances which I think uh, uh, in sh show that the, uh, the licensees in these difficult times are deserving of substantial credit for what they've managed to do. You'd recollect that the quota which came into force on the 1st of January 1990 set a transmission quota of something like 35 per cent for Australian product, Australian programs, rising by 5 per cent per annum to 50 per cent in 1993. Uh, every service uh, screened more than 40 per cent Australian content, and 30 of the 43 services exceeded 50 per cent in the standards first year, making an average level of Australian content between 6, PM, 6 AM and midnight of 52 per cent. All licensees met the requirements for Australian drama, including children's drama and diversity programs. Diversity programs shown by licensees included social documentaries, new concept, news and current uh, affairs, specials and variety. And this was in addition to a range of Australian drama and children's drama. The tribunal regards the results as a positive sign of the ability of the television industry to provide pro Australians with a diverse range of Australian programming. I think it should also provide some encouragement to the production industry that there is continuing commitment to locally made programming. The, the Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I move, that so, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition moving forth with the following motion, that this House censures the Prime Minister for his lack of leadership and failure in economic policy which has put a million Australians out of work sent thousands of businesses broke and pushed Australia five years further down the road to a banana republic. Yeah, 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 yeah. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Oh, the... Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move, oh, I move that this House censures the Prime Minister for his lack of leadership and order, failure in economic policy. Order, order, order. The question is that standing orders be suspended. All those with that opinion, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Unanimous. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. I move that this House censures the Prime Minister for his lack of leadership and failure in economic policy, which has put a million Australians out of work, sent thousands of businesses broke, and pushed Australia five years further down the road to a banana republic. Mr Speaker. It's a very serious matter when the opposition decides to move censure on the Prime Minister. And we've had a classic display in the course of question time today of the, uh, well, disgraceful display in the course of question time today of an attempt by the Prime Minister to fob off their failure over the last five years. Failures to hear the, war the warning, the very clear warning that the Treasurer gave this country quite correctly in May of 1986 
just five years ago today. And the great tragedy of the last five years is that, uh, in a sense, the 14th of May 1986 was the Treasurer's finest hour. Of course, he had created in that statement a unique opportunity to focus the minds of the government and the people of Australia on the magnitude of our economic problems. So for that, for that particular reason, it's a significant tragedy that, no, that there's been a, a fundamental failure of leadership since that time. And secondly, he created a unique opportunity to build a constituency for change, which is very difficult as we know in this country. You get very few opportunities to get the attention of the electorate as to the magnitude of the problem and to build a constituency which emerged following that statement to make substantial change. And the fact that that uh, warning wasn't heeded has seen our country now slide through bad economic management and appalling leadership into the worst recession in, um, in uh, 60 years. And as we saw today in the parliament, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have got no concept, absolutely no concept of the pain and hardship that's being felt by average Australians today. They got up in the House uh, sequentially. Uh, the uh, Treasurer's um, pride somewhat hurt that he wasn't able to get the call first, but got up sequentially and listed a whole string of boring statistics, boring statistics selectively quoted to try and demonstrate the fact that they hadn't failed in economic management in the course of the last five years. And as you go through the statistics that both of them listed, it's very easy to knock over their case. They pick, for example, underlying rates of inflation rather than the actual rate of inflation. And forget to mention that why wouldn't inflation fall in the midst of the deepest recession in 60 years? You'd be appalled if it didn't. Three quarters of a million jobs, the Prime Minister said, he's created. But they're on the way out. We now have 844,000 people unemployed. Uh, on, one on a CES basis, a million people looking for work and upwards of a million other people who've been pushed onto some other sort of benefit or are unable to work more than about 15 hours a week. I selectively quoted data on the balance of payments, but forgot to mention the fact that the current account deficit <coughs> has increased from about $12 billion to about $18 billion. And it doesn't matter, really, uh, Treasurer, that the, uh, the current that the trade account has started to improve in the midst of the deepest recession in 60 years because the country is now locked in a debt trap. It's deeply in a debt trap where the great bulk of this year's current account deficit is going to be paying interest on the accumulated deficits of the past several years. And so you can go on through all the um, statistics that both of them quoted, and many of them deliberately misrepresenting, talking about investment booms which no longer survive, and indeed we're looking at the first a uh, significant fall in our capital stock on record in the course of this year, focusing attention on uh, micro-reform uh, 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 to which they were unable to uh, document or provide the detail of that significant uh, shift. So very selectively quoted uh, data to substantiate their case. Right. But the most disturbing thing, when uh, subject to interjection and so on uh, from our side in the course of uh, question time today, the Prime Minister then turned on us and used the last refuge of the scoundrel, patriotism, right. turned on us and said that we were talking our country down. It's not a question of talking our country down, Prime Minister. It's a question of facing reality before Australia is finally written off. It is a question of facing reality before Australia is finally written off. It is not a question of talking our country down. And as I say, the tragedy of uh, May the, six, uh, the 14th, uh, 1986, was it was on one occasion where the Treasurer got it right and nobody in your government listened to him and you've pushed Australians now into the worst recession they've seen in the course of 60 years. And so it's for that reason, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we feel it is fundamentally important to bring the Prime Minister to account for his government's negligence and his government's incompetence in meeting the challenge which his, his Treasurer identified back there in early 1986. Second, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it's important for us on this side of the House to start to voice the mood of disillusionment and the mood of anger that exists out there in Australia as, as the people of Australia struggle in the circumstances that have been created by the government's incompetence and neglect. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it's fundamentally important that we try and bring the Prime Minister back to reality, to understand the magnitude of our problems 
and to understand the hard, hard choices and the leadership that is required in order to turn our country around. He's shown no capacity for leadership in the course of the last five years. He's shown a particularly appalling lack of capacity for leadership since the last election. But if we look back over those five years, he and his government have, have had a very significant number of opportunities to actually put in place the correct policies. There's five budgets, four mini budgets, one major industry statement, six premiers' conferences, and a host of other policy statements and, uh, and uh, summits and talk fests and reviews and consultations and processes of advice, none of which have led to this government either facing reality or to this government to, to, starting to take the decisions that are required to turn our country around. So Prime Minister worries, as we've heard on many occasions as recently as yesterday, that he worries about his place in history. His real place in history will be to record the fact that he wasted the last five years. He wasted a very real opportunity created by his Treasurer to put our country on the path to an improved international standing, an improved status in terms of living standards, an improved status in terms of our credit rating, an improved status in terms of our significance in our region and in the rest of the world. But he chose instead, by neglect and incompetence, to push us down the Argentinian road. And we are now five years further down that road than otherwise would have been the case. Now, there are many, of course, examples of this Prime Minister's lack of leadership, but perhaps the most telling example is the fact that he will not face the reality of the failures of his Treasurer. Anybody else in any other position in this country performing the way the Treasurer has performed in the course of the last five years would have been given their marching orders a long time ago. And he can't understand that. But the people of Australia can't understand how it is that you sit there and, and applaud the Treasurer and talk about his beautiful performance and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, neglect the fact that he has inflicted more pain and hardship on average Australians than any other Treasurer in the history of this country. You've allowed him to get away with constant breaches of Cabinet solidarity in terms of attacking his colleagues. You allow him to wander all over the place, undermining you. You've shown an appalling lack of leadership in dealing with that Treasurer. You've shown an appalling lack of leadership in not being able to bring either your front bench or your back bench under control. And on any policy issue these days as it emerges, you've got as many views as, as there are people on your side of the parliament, openly speaking to the gallery and uh, to whoever will listen to them about their particular views on policy. You've, uh, most importantly, though, shown an appalling lack of understanding of what's in the national interest. How is it that in the midst, for example, of the worst crisis in 60 years, you can play politics with projects like Coronation Hill, or you can play co politics with projects like Wesley Vale, or you can, you can say that you're reforming telecommunications while you're protecting the monopolistic-based feather-bedded jobs of your mates in, the te in, in telecom, or you can claim that you're cleaning up the waterfront and embarked on a major program of waterfront reform when you're only really protecting your mates in the union leadership and, uh, and uh, in the Waterside Workers' Federation. You have shown only one capacity in terms of uh, government in the last five years, and that is looking after your mates. You have put mateship above leadership to the point where it's become a national disgrace and embarrassment. And uh, the best example I can give you of that is your performance in the last several weeks in relation to your mate Brian Burke. When everyone else in the country could see that Brian Burke had to go, and even Brian Burke, in his moment of disgrace, had a better concept of what is right than you did, but you couldn't bring yourself to show the leadership that is essential to turning our country around. You preferred to stand by the mateship. It only begs the question, what hold has Brian Burke got over you? Uh, secondly, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, we've seen uh, wasted years in terms of the rhetoric that this man has embarked on and the failure to deliver action. And just one quote, we can go back to his address to the nation, his war address of the 11th of June 1986, when he said, I will not shirk the hard decisions that are necessary to ensure a bright future for us and for our children. Well, go tell that to the million people that are unemployed out there today and tell that to the, uh, to the uh, 800,000 babies that uh, Australians that have been born in the last five years. 
or to the more than 500,000 migrants that have arrived in the last five years. I was walking through the Doncaster shopping centre the other day in Melbourne and a woman stopped me and identified herself as a migrant of uh, the Menzies period. And she said, do you know, if I arrived today, I would get back on the next boat and go home and beg me to do what we could to get rid of those two wonderful characters, Hawke and Keating. And that is the feeling that exists in the migrant community, large parts of the migrant community today. They came here to build a country and build an opportunity for their children, which they now can't can't guarantee their children and they are very concerned about the future of their children and their children's children. Because in the last five years alone, the bottom line of your economic incompetence has been that our debt levels internationally have risen from about $92 billion to $165 billion. You have knowingly mortgaged the future of those children uh, in, uh, as a result of the incompetence of your economic, uh, your economic management. And all through the last five years, we've been subjected to a barrage, as we were again today, of rhetoric about how you can take the tough decisions, and yet we can't identify one tough decision you've taken in the course of the last five years. And the bottom line is debt keeps going up, and pain and hardship of the average Australians reflects the fact that you can't take the decisions that are required to turn this country around. The third disturbing feature, the third disturbing feature of uh, of the wasted years, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the fact that this economic crisis was not inevitable. This economic crisis could have been avoided. This was an economic crisis of this government's own making. Not, uh, can't be blamed on what happened in the rest of the world, can't be blamed on anybody else. It's the, we, we slate the blame directly, directly to the Prime Minister and his Treasurer, who were in full control of the economic circumstances over the last five years. And I think the key point that uh, we can make in this regard is just to look back over those five years at how they consistently misread the economic circumstances or they tried to manipulate economic circumstances for political ends. And the combination of those two things has created the fundamental mess uh, on which, uh, uh, that we today observe in our economy. They've missed, for example, the significance of the pickup in the terms of trade in December 1986. They then played politics in 1987 and 88 by trying to force interest rates down in the run-up to the federal election and the New South Wales election in early 88. And they then reluctantly saw that they had to do something and chose one instrument to do it, interest rates, and that blunt instrument has been the source of the principal source of the, the recession that they have imposed over and above all the structural problems the Treasurer was talking about back in early 1986. It is a crisis in this country in terms of expectations and it is a crisis of confidence. People have been consistently told that things are better than they are. The government has never once stood up and had the courage to tell the truth about the nature of our circumstances and the direction in which we were going and uh, now they've driven those people to a state of total despair. The lucky country is now the frustrated and angry country as a consequence of the Prime Minister's gross incompetence and lack of leadership. And for the first time, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are looking at the possibility of the current generation of Australians leaving a lower standard of living to their children than they themselves enjoyed. And that is what concerns people. That is what concerns people uh, in the rest of this country, beyond uh, the confines of this place and the artificiality of Canberra. They understand the magnitude of the problems that have been imposed on them by this government's incompetence. Of course, every time you pressure the government, the Treasurer and the Prime Minister, for reasons, uh, and for uh, explanations as to why things have happened, you just get a barrage of excuses, you get a barrage of uh, irrelevant uh, excuses and broken promises. Prime Minister talks in the past. I mean, on almost every question today, he referred back to the Fraser years. We are eight years on from the Fraser years. There's no reason to live in the past. The people of Australia want you to look to the future. The people can't understand why you always live in the past. Or you boast about the fact that you created one and a half million jobs. They all know you borrowed the money to do that. And any fool can create jobs by borrowing money at about $70,000 in debt per job. You know, the average wage of about twenty-five to 30000 would have been cheaper to just give them the money than run up that much debt in order to create those jobs. Any fool can do that. And they know that in doing that and in boasting about that, you've mortgaged the future of their children. And uh, of course, uh, 
You won't go on with these uh, artificial comparisons of the social wage and the benefits that were given under the Fraser year compared to under you. And you attack us for a lack of compassion. There is nothing more, there is nothing that reveals a lack of compassion than the way you have managed the, mismanaged the economy in the course of the last five years. There's nothing more compassionate you can do for a person in Australia than to give them a job and create the opportunity for them to have a job and to better themselves and to raise their standard of living and give their children a better standard of living than they in fact enjoyed themselves. And you talk about uh, compassion and you go away and uh, play games with environmental issues and resource issues and immerse them in a pile of uh, red tape and green tape and black tape. But you do not, you do not, you do not understand. You know, it's a good line because it goes to the very heart of your incompetence. Do you realise that there's a whole string of mineral projects that wouldn't get off the ground today under you? Hammersley Iron Ore, for example, North West Shelf. None of those projects would get off the ground because of what you're making light of, red tape, green tape and black tape. You can't even take a soft option decision like Coronation Hill and you pride yourself that you can take tough decisions around this place. So what we are left with is a government that is riddled with division, with, with no sense of direction, with no vision for the future, with a Prime Minister that only looks to the past, lived in, lives in the past, and uh, pretends that none of these current problems exist, and a Prime Minister who persistently has put mateship over leadership in everything he's done. Well, Prime Minister, I think you should start to answer some questions to average Australians. I mean, you should start telling the 844,000 people who have lost their job when they can expect to get another job. That's a reasonable question on, on the part of those people who are now desperately concerned that they perhaps are looking at an economy that is locked into over 10 per cent unemployment for years to come. And you should tell some of the small business people in Australia when they can expect to recoup their savings and their wealth that you've stripped off them through high interest rates and the collapse of those businesses. Or to the farmers who are in the worst rural crisis since the 1930s, they want you to show a bit of genuine compassion and deal with the structural problems that have been impacting on their industry and the impact of high interest rates and uncompetitive exchange rates that have reduced the earnings of farmers all over Australia and are now pushing tens and if not hundreds of farmers off their farms in the course of every single week. What about the miners that you mocked when I raised the point about red tape, green tape and black tape? They are all genuinely un very concerned that they won't be able to develop their businesses much more than they have, that they won't be able to initiate new projects when the country desperately needs to boost its export potential. What do you do? You tie up all those projects in any area rather than uh, have the courage uh, to take the decisions that are required. Manufacturers, for example, you hit them on one side by cutting protection, you fail to deliver the other side, which is uh, genuine micro-reform, genuine reductions in the costs of waterfront and uh, coastal shipping and other shipping, transportation, land transport. You wouldn't have a clue either. You're presiding over a couple of major... Of the House. Anyway, Mr. 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 Speaker, the House. Let, me finish my, let me finish my position. The Leader by, of the House. Let me finish my presentation by quoting just one, one view, which maybe the Prime Minister Order, can the understand. Of the House. Maybe the Prime Minister can understand this letter from Hayden Slater, who says, I am a 13-year-old student at Cummins Area School, and I am witnessing many of our close friends and my family having great financial trouble. My parents are doing their best to educate myself and my brothers, but our income is cut in halves. I have seen my parents work so hard, but are not getting anywhere because we have no money. I hope this crisis will not break up the families. If it does, it will be the fault of politicians that run Australia. It's not fair if we have to suffer, and you don't. I hope someone reads this letter. Now you know how I and thousands of other people around Australia feel right now. Please help. You can stand up with your statistics. You can talk your head off. But Hayden Slater Order. and millions of Australians will never the understand the, the consequences of your incompetence. Yeah. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, let me uh, say that I, uh, I trust that... Um, order. Order. Members of the Opposition. I trust that uh, when uh, the Leader of the Opposition replies to Hayden Slater, he will do what he's not yet been prepared to do for the rest of Australia, and that is spell out to Hayden Slater the policies exactly. that you would implement exactly. to deal with the issues that you're talking about. 
You have not once, you have not once in this place told this House, let alone Hayden Slater, what this opposition and this opposition leader would do differently from this government other than this, and that is that you say that you would have kept interest rates higher and for longer. And I hope you'll therefore have the honesty to tell Hayden Slater that in those circumstances he would be looking, he would be looking to a situation of deeper and more prolonged recession uh, under the leadership of this country if you are ever in that position. But listen, Mr Speaker, the uh, speech of the Leader of the Opposition was riddled with hypocrisy. Let me start, let me start from the beginning. Let me start from the beginning. The he, said, he, said, Mr. Speaker, he said, Mr Speaker, that I produced a string, that I and the Treasurer had produced a string of boring statistics. And he let us know that he was going to immediately demolish. He was going to immediately demolish this string of boring statistics. So, as you can imagine, I sat here in trepidation, waiting for this attack upon my string of boring statistics. What was the attack, Mr Speaker? This was the attack. He said, let's look at inflation. Let's look at inflation. Order. What did he say Order. then? The he, said, he said, look at inflation. Yes, it has come down. But his words were, wouldn't it be amazing, wouldn't it be amazing if inflation didn't fall in a recession? Wouldn't it be appalling? He said, you would expect inflation to fall in a recession. Well, that's a very interesting attack upon my statistic, because I regret very much, Mr Speaker, having to go back in history, because I know he doesn't like it, but perhaps the Leader of the Opposition will recall what, would hap what happened in 1982-83. You had a recession then, the worst since 1930. But what happened to inflation, Mr Speaker? You, of course, would expect inflation to fall in a recession. You just said so. So it must be true. But what happened in your recession? Inflation didn't fall. It went up to 11.2 per cent. I mean, what are you talking about, this so-called professor of economics? who says it's absolutely inevitable that in, an in, that in a recession inflation must fall. Professor, the visiting professor said so. It must be true. Well, visiting professor, look up the statistics of your recession, the one in which you guided the Conservative government, and you were unique, as we've said before. You were absolutely unique. You did what no other government had ever done before. You simultaneously produced double-digit unemployment and double-digit inflation. So where are you, Professor? Why is it true? Why is it true? Why must it inevitably be so that inflation falls in a recession? If it is inevitably true, why didn't it happen in your recession? Or is it just that you are totally incompetent? Or have you a convenient bout of amnesia? The fact is that you won't face up to is why you had simultaneous double-digit unemployment and double-digit inflation was because you had no idea of how to run a wages policy in this country. You walked away from trying to get some acceptable aggregate outcome in wages. And so you had an 18 per cent blowout in wages. And that, Professor Hewson, is why it is not inevitable that in a recession you'll get falling inflation. Because if you are so comprehensively incompetent as you have proved yourself to be when you've had the opportunity of having a hand in running the Australian economy, you and only you in the history of this country will produce at one and the same time double-digit unemployment and double-digit inflation. You were the guiding hand in that and you have the temerity now, eight years later, to stand up and say, Please give me back control to do the same things to you again that I did before. You must be a joke. But then, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, he went on from that performance to talk about the question of courage in decision taking. Well, I would just like to quote back to Professor Hewson his own words on this matter of courage, respective political courage between me and my colleagues and the Conservatives. Could I just, could I just uh, share with the House these words, these words of Professor Hewson? The assets test, the assets test, I quote Professor Hewson. 
I, I, the uh, Prime Minister as, as he was then, as he was then, in his current capacity, as leader. Well, he wasn't speaking. He was speaking in his then incapacity. He was then he was speaking in his then incapacity as Professor Hewson. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is what he said: the 17th of September. Not, I know you don't like it, nor should you, because this is what your now leader had to say about courage in the political parties. Okay, well let's see. Okay, would you like to hear what he had to say? Yeah. Okay. Order the deputy yeah. leader. Okay. Listen to what he had to say. Member for Gilmore. Quote: The assets test on pensions and the lump sum superannuation decisions are fundamentally sound decisions economically. They are the sort of decisions that a conservative government may want to introduce, but may not have the courage to. Now, how do you like that? There's the analysis by the then uh, Professor Hewson, the now Leader of the Opposition, analysing the nature of politics in this country. I repeat, the assets test on pensions and the lump sum superannuation decisions are fundamentally sound decisions economically. They are the sort of decisions that a Conservative government may want to introduce but may not have the courage to. It gets better. In such circumstances, presumably, it is better to let the other guys take the political flack for implementing these decisions. And this man, this man gets up and talks about political courage. He says, name one tough decision you've taken. I'll name tough decisions until he gets sick of hearing them. I'll start with the assets test. A correct decision, but one which your party ran away from conducted the most vicious campaign around this country. I'll talk about the fringe benefits test. And going from great things like that, I've come to the period now that you've been leader, and we'll find out about the massive reserves of courage with which you've been so uniquely endowed. You came along and on a great big decision, a great big fiscal decision about a charge at the War Memorial, you had a call from Beryl Bow Repair. Beryl Bow Repair decided, in a context where she was totally satisfied with the decision this government had made about the, the allocation of revenue, the allocation of money, perfectly satisfied, that she wanted to do some more things at the War Memorial. So she decided that she'd impose a rather modest charge. She spoke to the minister. The minister said, well, yes, uh, yes that's OK. And uh, she said, well, I'm talking to the opposition. Talk to uh, Dr Hewson. And I raised it with him. And he said, yes, that's all right. And she said, uh, Dame Beryl said, well, should I talk to uh, Senator Newman? No, says this courageous leader. No, says this courageous leader. Leave Jocelyn to me. That'll be all right. <laughs> Leave Jocelyn to me. Leave Jocelyn to me, indeed. What happened? Captain, Captain Courageous walks into the, uh, into the joint party room and he's not heard. Not a boo from him. He's rolled by Jocelyn Newman. Oh, and he's got the hide to get up here and talk about courage. If you haven't got the courage, to stand up to Jocelyn Newman in the joint party room on a small charge for the war memorial, what chance will you have of being any different from the people in the Conservative Party that you so properly analysed? Never had the courage to take a tough decision. Let's look at them. And these will be related to the tough decisions that I've taken with my colleagues. What about the question of tariffs? Yeah, you were in office all those period of time and you kept those high tariff walls, which were the single most damaging and damning thing you could do for the future of this country. And it wasn't until I came along, and I only personalise it because you personalised the censure motion, it wasn't until I came along with my string of able colleagues and we said, and we said, that's not good enough. And if you think it was easy, if you think it was easy to reduce the tariffs, well, have another think. Because a raid against me and my colleagues, I had the serried ranks there of a whole range of employers, not all of them, because some of them have learned better than you, but we certainly had a whole lot of the trade unions as well, and we had a whole lot of community organisations. Well, I had mayor Coronel. after mayor coming to me and saying, no, no, no. 
trade unions, employers, civic leaders, Mr. the whole Coronel. ranks of them saying don't do it. But we knew it was the right thing to do, and we had the courage to do it. Now, very interestingly, on this question of leadership, let me quote uh, what the uh, Leader of the Opposition had to say. You'll show what little substance this man has, what a hollow man he is. The 28th of April this year, he was doorstop. You got to doorstop him. He's not too keen on having full press conferences, I tell you. You got to be quick to catch him. Order, now, Mr. Speaker, Ballarat. in a doorstop, Order, the in a doorstep, on the, in a doorstop on the 28th of April, the leader of the opposition said on the waterfront issue. He said this: "What we need is the prime minister to show some leadership. The sooner the prime minister shows that kind of leadership." He's got to provide some leadership. And specifically, he was demanding, Mr. Speaker, that I show some leadership by ensuring genuine enterprise bargaining on the waterfront. Now, Mr. Speaker, normally, as you know, and you know me very well over a long period of time, normally modesty would prevent me taking up that. Uh, uh, very modest. But, but I, have to, uh, I have to, on this occasion, do a little bit of quotation. Because, uh, as you know, just uh, two or three days after that uh, challenge to my leadership to do something about waterfront reform, I spent a few hours on this issue. And uh, then, uh, uh, after it, a journalist asked uh, uh, a person who is not really normally well known as being one of our supporters, asked Captain Setchell, journalist, as a captain, you must be used to giving orders. What was it like to be taking orders from Mr Hawke? And as I say, uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to say this, but Captain Setchell's answer was in these terms. I think he demonstrated to us the leadership qualities that he truly has. I think he was quite remarkable. Well, uh, uh, as, a, as, I, as I say, uh, um, oh, oh. no, no, I can't. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. No, no, once, once, once is enough. Once is enough. But uh, on the substance, on the substance of it, which is uh, very disturbing as far as the philosophy and the attitude of those opposite are concerned, after asking me to show the leadership, to go in, produce something on the waterfront, as usual, as they try to write down not just me and my colleagues, but write down employers, write down trade unions, write down their country. They then wanted to write down what was truly, not just because of me, but because of the cooperation I was able to get from employers and workers, what was a truly great achievement. They wanted to write it down. But uh, what's the analysis that's made by others? I quote from uh, the Australian Business, May the 15th, says one pro-reform waterfront employer, quote, actually we did quite well relative to uh, the union's original claim. The wages out... Well, see, the employer doesn't know. They know much better than the employer on the waterfront. Now, I, I see, warn the member for uh, Coronella. Okay, we have the position, Mr. Speaker, where where this where this array of talent knows better. This array of talent knows better than the employers on the waterfront, and this is what they Order. had to say. The this is what they had to say. The member for Aston. We did Member quite well relative to their original claim. The wages outcome was lower than the unions wanted, and we got a commitment to finalising the award negotiations and to reclassifications. They then had to say this. Anyone who criticises the deal is either taking a short-term view of it or doesn't understand the complexities of getting the changes we want. In other words, Mr Speaker, what we did there was simply another illustration of what we've done in leadership in government for eight years. When there are tough decisions to be taken, I, as Prime Minister, and Minister this government McEwen. as government, this Treasurer as Treasurer, Order. we Minister take McEwen. those tough decisions. And that is why, Mr Speaker, when the time comes, when the test is to be made in two years' time, you'll finish where you finished before. You said, what have Order. I done in terms of leadership the, the last Prime two Minister's years? I tell you what, expired. I've led them to victory twice and I'll lead them again. The question is a motion to be agreed to. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Yeah.
Thank you, uh, Mr Dis Deputy Speaker. I must say, after that uh, shrill and excitable performance from the Prime Minister, it is no wonder that your own backbench are uh, literally openly in the corridors of this place saying that it's time you went. Yeah. And if ever I saw a performance of a bloke whose career was a swinging carcass, then I've just, just seen it from Bob. I mean, talk about a man under siege, a man under pressure. I mean, you'd never know. I mean, from that pathetic performance, you'd never know that the motion before the House today concerned the rising level of unemployment. He barely addressed the, the basis of the censure motion. Let me read it out to him. This House censures the Prime Minister for his lack of leadership, his failure in economic policy, which has put a million Australians out of work, sent thousands of businesses broke and pushed Australia five years further down the road to, to a banana republic. Look, this is an open and shut case. The fact is, go back five years, and I mean, wasn't it entertaining? The Treasurer, you know, there he was rewriting history about what he said back in 1986. But go back to 1986. The significance of the anniversary of your Republic, uh, Banana Republic statement last uh, five years ago, uh, Treasurer, is simply this. The fact is, you have failed your own test. Not a test that we established, not a test established by some uh, economic commentators or by business or by your own party, a test you yourself established. You were the one with the Prime Minister who established the height at which the high jump bar would be set. And the, and the, the five years today marks that failure of your own very own test. And in that whole time, in the last five years, We've had nothing but deception from you people as to the state of the economy. And some of the leadership, one aspect of the leadership that we rightfully look to a Prime Minister to provide is some leadership as to the assessment, a realistic assessment of the Australian economy. I mean, go back to September 87, when this Treasurer said, had the audacity to say, this is the great coming of age of Australia. Every year, a year later, the mini budget uh, in 88, he said, We have acted decisively to turn the situation around. And then remember this one, August 1988, he said, This is the one that brings home the bacon. And last year, he said, uh, you know, when referring to the 1990 budget, he said, uh, these, these, were the definitely, these were definitely the golden years of change. And I went back actually to the debate that we had this day 12 months ago to see what the Treasurer was then saying and how revealing it is. Year in, year out, he deceives people about the state of the economy. He said, I mean, this is classic Keating Ease. He said, the honourable member for Flinders now has the indecency to talk about a slowdown in the economy as though it were a deep recession. <laughs> well, those words come back to haunt you, Treasurer, as well they might. Now, look, Australia is not heading towards a recovery. We are heading towards a depression. We're not a banana republic. This is basically a good country. We've got good people, we've got good natural resources, we've got a stable political system. But the truth is that the economic fabric, the economic structure of this country is literally wasting away in front of our very eyes. I don't, I don't use that word depression lightly, and it is a matter of balance between you know, the importance of telling people the truth about the economy and giving people a realistic assessment of the economy and the danger of a sense of uh, doom and gloom becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. But you just can't avoid a sense of apprehension about what's going on in Australia today. By Labor's own words, the situation is now worse uh, than what it was in 82 and 83. And Bob Carr, the leader of the Labor Party in New South Wales, said that, what, only 10 days ago. The data highlighting an unabated continuation of the recession that has come out in recent days legitimately provides the question as to whether or not Australia is, in fact, heading for a depression. There's no doubt that Australia is in the grips of the worst recession since the horrific experience of the 1930s. And look, no one wants to talk the economy down. But accepting the government's rose-coloured glasses view of the economy doesn't do anybody any good either. The evidence that is emerging across the broad, uh, you know, both statistical and analytical, raises serious concern that the recession 
Australia is currently experiencing is deep enough for the term depression to be at least introduced into the public debate. And the situation is worsening. If you look at the figures uh, from the BCA over the weekend, I had a bloke bring me up from, up from Sydney this morning, and he said that he'd been in business for 40 years, he employed 40 people, and they're about to all go out of business and to lose their jobs. And I just say, I mean, if the images of thousands of people queuing up for blocks in Melbourne, uh, for, for jobs uh, in Melbourne recently, uh, you know, were uh, months for jobs that were months away, I mean, surely it, it ought to remind members of the government you know, of the desperation of the unemployed in the Great Depression. I mean, surely those images of the, you know, of the moonlight marches to bring to people's attention uh, the plight of the unemployed in the 1930s is, a, is a, an image which we see now outside some shops uh, in the 1990s. And the former finance minister, Senator Peter, Wal Peter Walsh, has already said publicly that it's arguable that Australia is in a depression. Labor MPs used the word depression to describe the circumstances in 1982. Now, 1990-91 is worse than 1982, but in 1982, these guys, they really know a depression when they see one. And in fact, if you go back to what they said, look at, uh, look at the, the uh, Treasurer's own remarks. It, he said uh, in the parliament, going back, looking at 1982, he said, in 1982, when the honourable gentleman had interest rates at the level they now are, the, econ the economy was in a state of depression. It was at the bottom of its worst depression since the Great Depression. Well, if that was the worst, where are we now, Treasurer? And I asked the, uh, the Prime Minister a very simple question. On the basis of the Treasurer's own definition in 1982, would he countenance the word depression? And he skipped away very quickly. But it wasn't just the Treasurer. It was people like uh, the Minister for Employment, uh, who uh, referred to 1982 as a depression, the former Housing Minister, Mr Herford, the Minister for Finance, uh, Mr Willis, and the former Leader of the Opposition, leading the pack back in those times are all on the public record in Hansard describing the economic downturn of 1982 as a depression. If they believe Australia was experiencing a depression then, then why are they so reluctant to confront the same terminology now? And, and if, if regardless of your view about the general state of the economy, the fact is that some sectors of the Australian economy are in a depression, and it's about time you people faced up to it. And I refer specifically to Victoria, where they've been downgraded again. And I refer specifically to the rural crisis, where hard times for many Australians are unfortunately still ahead of them. Now, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is not just a short-term phenomenon that we face. I mean, it is true that many of our problems are chronic in the sense that we've had them for a long time. I mean, I think of the Commonwealth state relations mess, the financial mess there. I mean, I think it is no wonder that the states have been big spenders and acted irresponsibly in recent years, given the way in which Commonwealth financial relations have become established in recent years. Uh, on, on, tax, on the tax system, you were saying during question time that you'd made major reforms to the tax system, but, Treasurer, you're damned out of your own words, because in 1985 you yourself said, you yourself said in 1985, unless we were prepared to introduce a consumption tax, as part of an overall package, then we would only ever be making peripheral changes to the tax system. You were right then. You were right then. You have no answer to uh, the need for, for radical tax reform. Industrial relations. Since 1968, this country has had a poor industrial relations system. Since they let Clary O'Shea out of jail in Melbourne, we've had the rule of the jungle, in, rule of the jungle in industrial relations and waterfront and shipping. In fact, wherever you look in the Australian economy, the truth of the matter is that our problems are, tr uh, are in fact chronic. And you see, that's the great thing about the 1986 statement. You yourself recognised that our problems were exactly that. Chronic had been with us for a long time and were building up to exacerbate you know, our economic circumstances. And the charge against you and the charge against your leader is that you recognised the problem and then you sat pat and did nothing about it. You blame everybody else, banks, bishops, business people, anybody else. The truth is you can't escape your own mouth. When you said it was a recession that we had to have, when you admitted that it was a recession that you deliberately engineered, I mean, really, no one should have been surprised. Because you see, if you go back to 1986, you actually predicted that if you were so undisciplined, so disinterested in our salvation, 
then that would be the inevitable consequence. Your own words, Treasurer. I mean, I, uh, I say to you, I mean, in a sense, the, the Leader of the Opposition was right. In a sense, it was your finest hour. I mean, it was chillingly accurate what you said then. Look what you said. You sent shockwaves literally through the stock market. And, and you used the occasion, rightly, to sort of shock the Australian community into supporting the changes that we would need to make. You said we were too complacent. In that sense, you are right. I say to you that, in a way, I pay you a compliment you know, without reservation. It was a public exhibition of political frankness, a display of honesty that we've rarely seen from the government side. But quite frankly, that honesty, that frankness, uh, was transitory. It's deserted you, the courage is gone, and what is left now is nothing but blind ambition. Treasurer, five years ago, you honestly set the standard by which the Australian economy should be judged, and you failed. You know you've failed, and you don't have the courage to face it. I say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that in the next couple of years, I mean, not only is the Prime Minister the problem, but our problem is that, in one sense, he's the solution for the next two years. And what this country needs is a recognition of our problems and some determination to do something about it. And uh, as the recession delivers the message through rising unemployment uh, of Labor's failures, then increasingly people look for the answers. Well, there are no simple answers, and we make that very clear in our appreciation of today's economic circumstances. But there are things that could be done. I mean, you could start in the next week or so and send a message to investors that you've got some confidence and that they can have some confidence in the future of this country. So you could say yes to Coronation Hill. You could say yes to the Australian tourist industry by supporting that third runway at Sydney Airport. It's been waiting for years and years and years, nearly as long as you've been Treasurer. And you could say yes to uranium mining so we could start to do something about exports. But you should and need to go beyond that. We need a national savings policy. Our problem is that we rely on the savings of foreigners. That's our debt, $160-odd billion in gross terms, grown from 90 just five years ago. We need radical changes to the tax system. You ought to abolish the capital gains tax. Why? Because we want to give people some incentive to see if we can drag this country into a recovery. We ought to have a, a change in the tax system because your tax system taxes people who export. You penalise the very people who provide for this country some opportunity to go for better times. You ought to introduce a goods and services tax because there are still a lot of people who cheat the tax system. There are still a lot of people who are PAYE taxpayers who pay more tax. The very people you claim to represent uh, have a millstone around their neck of PAYE tax as a result of your failure to introduce meaningful tax reform. And of course, I mean, you blame everybody. We never hear and blame the ACTU. Why? Because they're your conspirators, your co-conspirators uh, in, uh, in, in Australia's circumstances. On industrial relations, we still have a very inflexible system. We need voluntary employment agreements. Your idea of enterprise bargaining, just mugging enterprises, going around with a shotgun and saying to enterprises, you know, sign on the bottom line in accordance with a deal that Bill and Paul have worked out. Now, that's not genuine. You know it. We ought to have genuine enterprise uh, agreements. We ought to have secret ballots before strikes so that the union members, the rank and file, can have say, some say in their unions. And we ought to abolish compulsory trade unionism and give people some of their rights back. And your waterfront reforms clearly not adequate. Again, I mean, not a test that I've set for you, a test by David White, the minister in Victoria, a Labor minister, who said it was clearly not enough. Or shipping. You ought to do something about the Reserve Bank. We ought to get the politicians out of the printing presses so we can do something about inflation. We ought to have a decent competitive policy in telecommunications, not the two-phone policy, not the two-telephone policy that you've introduced. The fact is, uh, Mr Deputy, as I conclude, as you look at, the, as you look at this uh, censure motion, it is an open and shut case. The Prime Minister is deserving of the, of the strongest censure of this motion. You put the test, Treasurer, in five years. He's failed it. You've failed it. And at the next election, you deserve the censure which the Australian people will deliver to you. The question is most to be agreed to. The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr Speaker, it is, it is a sad commentary on, on Australian public life 
that that no 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 deputy that leader it's a sad the commentary on australian the public life that a debate of this nature which is keyed off statements that i made 5 years ago and policies which were introduced over the period which pointed to the need for structural change in australia and the difficulties australia would face without it that in the opposition believing that such remarks were significant enough to mount a motion in the parliament on the anniversary of them having been said, that the contributions of the Leader of the Opposition and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition were rhetorical, empty, free of logic, free of any acknowledgement of change, free of any qualify, qualified analysis free of any positive feature which would point to the needs, the progress having been made and the need for per further progress to be made. If you are an Australian person viewing Ballarat. Parliament and watching this debate, you would take a very jaundiced view of our national prospects. Whereas in fact, Mr Speaker, in this period it has been a period of vast change in Australia. And while you may say and while you may say, I know what you're saying, while you may say that we are, as the deputy leader said, he said we are now heading towards a depression, although I might say Mr Howard had this to say on that subject today. The member for McEwen. Australia, the member for Benelong said, was not heading for a depression, and any comparison with the 1930s was an exaggeration, he said. He said uh, the, the economy was nowhere near as bad as in the 1930s, the spectre of the 1930s which was not an accurate picture of the economy. He said, I don't want to do that because in my heart, I don't believe things are as bad as they were in those days. Well, I compliment him on his honesty. He's correct, of course. Of course he's correct. But of course we had no such honesty from the Leader of the Opposition who said it was the worst recession in 60 years, or the Deputy Leader of the Opposition who said it was a depression. And can I say, can I say, Mr. Can I, can I say, Mr. Speaker, well, I asked the Treasury today. I asked the Treasury the today to tell me what the unemployment rate in 1991 would be if the March 1983 participation rate applied, and similarly, the unemployment rate in March 1983 if the April participation, April 91 participation rate applied. And the answer is that the unemployment rate today. If the March 83 participation rate applied, would be 5 per cent, and the unemployment rate in the time of the former government in March 83, if today's participation rate applied, would be 14.7 per cent. And I table the document with the uh, with the assumptions. Now, now there it is. This is that the leader of the opposition said this is the worst worst recession in 60 years, but by the by any measure, a simple analysis of participation rates puts the unemployment rate at 15 per cent in 83, and on the same basis, 5 per cent today. Now, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so I, I I demolish that point. Then we had the leader of the opposition saying he was select, we were selectively quoting statistics. For the past five years, we have taken no hard decisions, which, of course, any observer of Australian public life would know that was patently untrue. Uh, he went on to say that any fool can create jobs. He had nothing to say of the job creation of the period between 1983 and 1990. Uh, and, uh, and then he said that, uh, and then uh, the, leader, the deputy leader said that uh, we'd failed our own tests. Uh, he said that uh, it's no wonder the states there acted irresponsibly and we had no national savings policy. Now that was the sum total of their contribution. Whereas the fact of the matter is this, Mr Deputy Speaker, in these years, this is what Australia faces now in the 1990s, as distinct from what it faced at the beginning of the 80s. It has a competitive exchange rate mechanism. It has a, a structural fiscal surplus in the national budget. It has a high profit share brought about by a change in wage levels and prices. It has a rational tax system which supports income producing, earning businesses with cash flows and doesn't tax their dividends twice. It has a huge shift in it to a more educated, to a more educated and trained workforce through high retention rates in school and training. In merchandise exports, a shift in the basic productive capacity of the economy 
of merchandise exports increasing by 80 per cent between May 86 and March 91, of manufactured exports increasing by 178 per cent between May 86 and March 91, a current account deficit improved by 24 per cent between April 1986 and March 1981, with GDP having risen by 15 per cent over the same period and employment having risen by 11. And we face the 1990s with those things, the competitive exchange rate, the structural budget surplus, the high profit share, the sensible tax system, the shift to an educated workforce, a basic shift to exports and a savings policy underpinning it through occupational superannuation. Now, that occupational superannuation levels will be five times our national debt in the year 2000. Five times our national So, as we face the 1990s, sure, in cyclical terms, we face a recession and we face rising unemployment. But as we face the 1990s, we face all those structural things having been changed a competitive exchange rate, the fiscal surplus, the high profit share, the capacity for higher investment, the further shift to the external sectors away from domestic demand, a more sensible rationing of credit through the banking system and, coming down the back of it, a huge savings pipeline plugged into it through dividend imputation and the equities market. Now, that's what we face through that. That's what we face in the 1980s. What do we face in the 1980s? A recession, as the Prime Minister said, with a recession with high inflation with high inflation, not a recession with low inflation, a recession with high inflation, with profits smashed to pieces, with investment having fallen apart for five or seven years, with no shift to the external sector, with an uncompetitive exchange rate mechanism and no savings policy and a tax system which favoured speculative investment against income producing value added investment. That is the structural change we face. It's almost so that nobody can muck it up. As we get back to better prices on today's export volumes, on today's export volumes, on today's export volumes and 1989 terms of trade prices, we would have now a stable debt position this very day. Now, if our exports continue to grow as they have right through the 1980s, as they have right through the 1980s, and there's the December quarter balance of payments export line, a continuous line of growth right through the 1980s right through the 1980s into the 1990s, that as that, those volumes continue to grow, and if there is any, even without a lift in prices, Australia will stabilise its debt with a low inflation rate, with a low inflation rate, a lower cost of capital, kicking along investment, and that investment funded by the huge savings pipeline of occupational superannuation. That's what we offer Australia. With a train work, what have you ever offered? In your barren sterility, what have you ever offered? Oh, look, all, you can, all, all that you're about is a few negative cuts. You, you think that negative, stupid, like, like the remark you made, the last remark you made. Fancy saying, as you said, get the politicians out of the printing presses of the Reserve Bank. <laughs> with, with, the tu with having administered the toughest monetary policy in the OECD, which you then say, on the one hand, we've had high interest rates and pushed the economy in a recession. On the other hand, you say, we've had the politicians with the printing press. I mean, the fact is, the fact is you're absurd. You're absurd, you're stupid and absurd. And Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if, if, if you look at the 1990s now, with, with the competitiveness coming off the exchange rate, with, in, with, in, with inflation, with a low inflation rate, with that structural budget surplus, with those savings coming into to, uh, the business community, with the high profit share funding that investment, and with a lower cost of capital, and even halfway decent terms of trade, it's game, set and match for Australia. Game, set and match for Australia. It is. Now, the member Ben Long hangs his, hangs his head. I mean, I don't mind an irrational. Look, I can cop irrational debate. I can cop it any day of the week. We've just heard two irrational speeches. Member but when you see those prospects, I mean, frankly, the only difficulty for the government, the only difficulty for the government, is being around long enough to see it. That's all. That's all. Not that it won't happen. No, not that it won't happen. No, no. We recognise the economic difficulties where the political the difficulties we're in. But being around long enough. Order, the but there the can be no doubt about that Australia Including will be a low inflation, McEwen. productive country 
Not with a seat. huge merchandise trade surplus right through the 1990s, as sure as I stand here. And, uh, Mr Speaker, that is what the Liberals want to get their hands on. That's, right. That's why they want to win the next election, because they may say in their more tawdry moments and try and dismiss the changes of the middle 80s and the late 80s, what they want to get their hands on is on that structure. They want to put their name on the maker's label on a structure we created. That's what they're about. And that's why, and that's why you wanted to win the Member last Ballarat. one and the 87 one. But the fact of the matter is you won't win, you won't win the next one because out there, now you 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 traffic in the pessimism of, uh, of, uh, that, com that comes from uh, this kind of circumstance. You traffic in it and you rejoice in it. You rejoice in that pessimism. But I'm telling you this, that as it dawns on people, as that inflation rate comes down, as that cost of capital comes down, as the savings build up in superannuation, as that profit share holds, as the investment picks up and as those export volumes continue to grow, as they now do inexorably month after month in a structural way, you'll eat your hearts out as that structure comes good for us and for Australia. And as sure as I stand here, it will. Now, the fact is, you may think that the times are made for you, that there is a recession, that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, we're, we're in a position— well, I don't know whether you notice the, the, the Economist today, and it's got the position in the cycle, and it's, uh, this is the trough of the recession, it's got Australia first in and first out, then Canada, Sweden, Britain, Switzerland, France, Italy, Spain, Holland, Germany and Japan. We will be first out, and we'll be first out with that structure in place. With that structure in place. As if you, as if you could ever have the wit to put something of this comprehension and quality together. As if you could ever have the wit. You useless people. You useless people. You sat there for years. You had, you had profits falling to pieces. You had wages all over the place. You had inflation up. You had a recession at the same time. You had merchandise exports dying. You had imports surging. You created by in the first two. This government wasn't in office two years, and you took our debt to 32 per cent of GDP through your ineptitude. And there you are. You sit back. There's not a solid idea amongst any of you on the front bench, and you're sitting praying, waiting like a, like a praying mantis to spring the electoral trap and to pick up the structure the government's painstakingly put into office. Well, don't think that our political embarrassment with the recession or the difficulties which the Australian people unhappily face are such that that will camouflage basically a long-term structure for their prosperity into the 1990s, because it won't and that will be apparent to you. And you think, if only we could be lucky Order to the inherit Minfrey, their creativity. If only we could be lucky enough to inherit their creativity. Well, you won't be. You won't be. We'll fight like hell to deny it to you, to deny it, to claim what's ours. That is the new economic society of this country created by us. Created by us. Created by Order. us. Yes. Members well, of the opposition. We've got, yes, we've got, but we've kept 1.5 million of those jobs. Sure, we've got those, uh, the higher unemployment, but they will come down because of those high participation rate. rates. And as, as they've gone up, they will come down. And we won't have to fill two jobs for every job, like we did with the long-term unemployment you left us in the 1980s. Because this time, the participation rate is at such a level that as the jobs are created, they'll come straight off the unemployment lists. And that's what you fear, and well you might. So the fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, let me conclude on this point, that one would have thought at this moment, when there is a chance, a chance to stand back for five years and say, well, what has happened? There would have been some acknowledgement of the structural change, some positive elements from the opposition about Australia's portents, but rather what they do, they made cheap, miserable, hollow political speeches. And you can only say, if you, if you were an outsider looking at the opposition, you'd say, God help Australia. God help us with these sort of people. Well, on this side of the thing, we're not a, we're not, we're, we can all do with God's help, but over here we help ourselves as we're helping the nation. And, uh, and uh, the fact is, Mr Speaker, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be helping opposition. Australia to a more prosperous society into the 1990s on the back of those structural chains. And in saying that, I say we reject absolutely the uh, motion of censure against the Prime Minister in the terms it's written, and I move that the question be now put.
the question is the motion be agreed to. Um, is is leave granted for the document to be tabled? Leave's granted. Uh, the question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is the question be now put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point the honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield tell us for the noes.
the score, George. Order. The result of the division is eyes 71, no 66. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion of censure be agreed to. Those of that opinion please say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Eyes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point the honourable members for Wakefield and Riverine and Darling tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is eyes 66, noes 71. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. Presentation of papers. Uh, I'll um, ask members to resume their seats and we'll move on to the question of presentation of papers. Uh, ministerial statements. Any ministerial statements?
And Mr Speaker has received a letter from the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition proposing a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the Prime Minister's failure to implement economic policies to arrest Australia's slide into banana republic status. I call upon those members who approve the proposed discussion to rise in their places. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Leave the house. David Bullong. The question Sorry, is business to David Bullong. Those in that opinion, please say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Wakefield and Riverina Darling tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is eyes 70, nose 64. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. <laughs> Mr Speaker has received a message from the Senate transmitting the following resolution agreed to by the Senate, that the time for presentation of the report of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts on the Midford Paramount case and related matters be extended to 7 November 1991. I'll call the member for throws me in a moment when uh, members have left the chamber or resumed their seats.
If the member for Burke, member for Riverend Darling, member for Higgins would assist the chamber by resuming their seats. All in. The Honourable Member for Throsby. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the fifth report of the Committee for 1991 relating to the, the proposed built custom, purpose-built customs uh, computer centre for Australian C Customs Services, Bruce ACT, and I move that the report be printed. The question is a motion to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say I have the contrary. No, I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Throsby. I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the report. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Throsby. I thank the House. Mr Deputy Speaker, the report I have just tabled proposes the construction of a two-storey structure of approximately 3780 square metres gross floor area, which will provide 1425 square metres of computer floor area and associated office space, staff amenities, loading dock, storage and plant rooms. The limit of cost estimate for the project is $16.9 million at November 1990 prices. Mr Deputy Speaker, the committee has approved this project, but with reservations which relate principally to the location of the proposed building on a site next to a similar facility being built for the Australian Taxation Office and the arrangements for the power supply to the building. Mr Deputy Speaker, the committee received a considerable amount of material dealing with the proposed location of the customs building next to the taxation office building, which is currently under construction. Evidence was given that during 1985 there had been attempts to build a computer facility to be shared by three or four departments. Until sometime in 1990, customs and tax were planning a shared facility. Only when customs fell behind in the approval process did the two facilities side by side become inevitable. We accept that it is now too late to delay either project. We also accept evidence that amalgamation of both facilities would incur significant costs. On the other hand, we, the committee, are of the view that substantial overall savings would have been made if both facilities had been in the same building from the earliest planning stage. Accordingly, the committee has recommended that the Minister for Administrative Services should conduct a review of all Commonwealth departments and authorities to ensure that, as far as practical, facilities such as computer installations are co-located. We believe this review is very important and should be undertaken as a matter of urgency because of the sums of money which could be involved. It is also important because of the long-term and rational development of Commonwealth facilities which could result from it. While at one time neither customs nor tax appeared to have any problems about sharing a facility, at a later stage in the planning process Concerns were expressed about having them in the same building because of the risks of industrial disputation or sabotage. The committee found this an intriguing situation and believed it was an excellent example of a two-way bet which could not be sustained. If the two facilities were at risk in the same building, we are at a loss to understand how that risk is reduced by having them in separate buildings on adjacent sites. Mr Deputy Speaker, in the committee's sixth report of 1990, dealing with the Taxation's Office Computer Centre, the committee drew attention to the power supply arrangements for that building. In particular, we questioned the need for two independent high voltage supplies and asked that this be reviewed because of the provisions of other substantial backup facilities. The Public Works Committee was never informed whether there was a review or not. The inquiry into this reference revealed the same independent power supply arrangement was required with similar backup facilities. While we accept that there must be backup arrangements, we are not convinced of the need for a double power supply. 
We also accept that this is a requirement of the supplying authority, not an additional item included by customs. The committee has therefore recommended that customs and Australian construction services take up with the AC ACT Electricity and Water Authority its insistence th that independent power supplies be provided to the two computer installations. I would now like briefly to consider some of the other issues which came up during this inquiry. After the project was referred to the committee, we became aware that the Joint Committee on the ACT was conducting an, an inquiry into proposals for the transport system to service a new part of Canberra, Gungala. One of the components of that system which was causing community concern was the route of a proposed major north-south road, John Denham Parkway. This route would have been very close to the site proposed for the customs building. The committee took evidence from the chairman and deputy chairman of the ACT committee. And I should mention here, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it is quite unusual for one committee to ask members of another committee to give evidence before it. It is, was also perhaps unusual that they were so keen to appear before us. The Honourable Member for Fraser and Senator Margaret Reid did appear before us, and on behalf of the, of the members of the Public Works Committee, I would like to thank them for their contribution. As a result of our concern, the planners at the national and the local level got together and produced an alignment which would not compromise the custom site. The planners gave evidence that this proposed westerly alignment would meet their needs if, in fact, it was ever built. The committee also received evidence that, provided appropriate precautions were taken, construction of the parkway would not endanger either the customs or the taxation buildings. This committee can only report to the parliament on the reference it has received. It will be for the Joint Committee on the ACT to make a recommendation on the route of the John Denman Parkway. The Australian Sports Commission forwarded two submissions which set out its concern, principally reductions in car parking spaces and worsened access to this part of Bruce if the parkway was to be built on the westerly route. These are issues more appropriately, uh, more appropriately dealt with by the Joint Committee on the ACT. The Public Works Committee would also like to acknowledge the contribution of community groups such as the North Canberra Protection Group. Its concerns with another possible route on the parkway led to a delineation of this westerly option. The committee also received a detailed submission from Windus Hammer Partnership in Sydney. This submission argued that the proposed custom building was too expensive for what was needed and overspecified in many details. The committee sought additional information from Customs, Australian Construction Services and the taxation on the issues it raised in that submission. The committee concluded that the Windless Hemmer Partnership was not able to sustain its view. During this inquiry, issues of some significance to the approval process for Commonwealth facilities were raised. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is our hope that the Minister's review will mean that comparable facilities are not duplicated as unnecessarily as were these two. To ensure this does not happen, planning and approval processes need to be more effectively coordinated between departments and authorities. If this is done, the committee's inde endeavours in this reference will have been justified. I commend the report to the House. The Honourable Member for Groom. Speaker, I seek leave to make a very short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't want to go over all the ground that the Honourable Member for Throsby has, other than to say, uh, uh, as a member of the Opposition and uh, as the Vice Chairman of the Public Works Committee, uh, that uh, I support everything he had to say, uh, making the point uh, very strongly of the need for ministerial review. We find in, uh, in that committee uh, a very large amounts of money uh, being expended uh, from the public purse. And I think it is uh, incumbent on the Minister for Administrative Services uh, to implement uh, the review that uh, is contained in the report just presented by the Honourable Member for Throsby. So I have uh, pleasure in supporting uh, what uh, he had to say 
uh, and hope that this ministerial review will get underway as quickly as possible. Order. Clerk. Notice number one, National Food Authority Bill. The Honourable the Minister for Resources. Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Minister for Aged, Family and Health Services, I present the National Food Authority Bill 1991. First reading, a bill for an act to establish a national food authority with functions relating to the development of food standards and for related purposes. Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I, now, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, this country has a long history of food legislation. According to the Times of London in 1914, Australia was the first of the dominions of the British Empire and probably the first country in the world to enact pure food legislation and to establish standards to which manufacturers of food must conform. That newspaper reported that there was, quote, a pure food act of the amplest description in force in Australia before the bill for the American Act came before Congress, unquote. Deputy Speaker, the need to establish food legislation in Australia was recognised as early as 1838, when the colony of New South Wales passed its Adulteration of Bread Act. In 1863, a Melbourne newspaper published lists of common adulterations in food and then went on to expose practices such as colouring sweets with lead chromate. In 1896, New South Wales passed its Public Health Act which made it an offence to sell unwholesome or adulterated food or food which was falsely described. Adulteration was seen as both a health safety problem and a fair trading issue. States retained the right to make food laws after Federation and in 1905 Victoria passed its Pure Food Act and was followed over the next five years by the remaining four states. Change conditions after World War II made a new approach essential. In the late 1940s, the industry established food technology associations in each state, and through their federal body, the Australian Food Technology Association, these associations approached the government with an offer to undertake preliminary work towards developing uniform regulations. In 1953, the federal machinery to develop uniform food regulations was set up within the National Health and Medical Research Council. The NH and MRC had been established much earlier, in 1938, to advise governments on public health matters. Food fell within its interests and when moves were made towards uniform regulation, it was considered to be the obvious body with a scope of interests and expertise to guide the regulation process. Mr Deputy Speaker, despite substantial reforms to food industry regulation since then, most notably an agreement by the Commonwealth and states for the joint development of standards, the need for reform remained evident both because of the impact of the food regulation system, the growth of the processed food industry and the capacity of the regulatory system to respond swiftly to public health and safety issues, which are, of course, of increasing interest to consumers. And much more needs to be done to ensure that the public have a better opportunity to contribute to the framing of standards. The food processing industry is a very important industry to all Australians. Not only is it a major contributor to our health and well-being through the production of safe and nutritious food, it also provides employment for many. The food processing and beverages industry represents the largest sector of our manufacturing industries. It accounts for approximately 20 per cent, that is, in excess of $30 billion a year, of manufacturing turnover and it employs some 173,000 people. Australia is a major exporter of food. Our exports amount to over $8.5 billion a year, which is over 20 per cent of total Australian exports. Most of these are, however, low value added products. The opportunities are there to expand our exports of the processed foods. Indeed, Austrade believes that our exports of processed foods to the Asian region could be doubled. But a number of studies have shown that there are continuing difficulties with achieving our full export potential. The industry was examined by what was then the Industries Assistance Commission in October 1988. 
The IAC's final report agreed that the current system of food regulation was a significant impediment to the development of an efficient and competitive industry in Australia, that is, to the development of our export industry. Similar conclusions have been reached in a series of reports by the then Business Regulation Review Unit. The IAC concluded that current administrative mechanisms were costly in terms of time and resources and had reduced the efficiency and competitiveness of the Australian food industry through increased costs and impediments to product innovation and adoption of new technologies. Moreover, difficulties with the current standards and their administration were impeding gains in public safety and consumer protection sought by the community. It is also the case that in recent years consumers have become increasingly conscious of the significance of food for health and are rightly concerned at a range of potential issues affecting its safety. They are also concerned about the levels of residues from pesticides and naturally occurring heavy metals that find their way into our food chain and about the type of additives and processing aids used in preparing the food for supermarket shelves. Mr Deputy Speaker, despite the commitment and the dedication of a large number of people, the current arrangements for developing domestic food standards are cumbersome and they are time consuming. Under these arrangements, new and revised food standards are developed through a cooperative arrangement with the states and territories. At the federal level, responsibility is split between the National Health and Medical Research Council and its various expert committees under the Community Services and Health Portfolio and the Federal Bureau of Consumer Affairs under the Attorney General's Portfolio. Standards are then implemented through state and territory legislation. The major problems with the current regulation system can be attributed to a lack of clearly defined objectives for food regulation together with the lack of a single body with responsibility for driving the system and developing standards. Complexities and rigidities which render the present system ineffective at responding swiftly to public health problems and innovations in food product technology and deficiencies in the mechanisms for setting and reviewing food standards. Mr Deputy Speaker, we also believe that there needs to be more openness in the system with real opportunities for interested parties to contribute to the process. The current approach to state implementation could also be improved. While some states now adopt food standards by reference to the standards formulated by the National Health and Medical Research Council system, there are delays in states drafting their own regulations and differences in drafting between states increase the difficulty of ensuring uniform interpretation. Also, there are differences between state approaches in areas such as food hygiene and food recalls. Against the background of the IAC report, the government agreed that a revised mechanism for setting food standards was necessary and should be developed jointly by the Commonwealth states and territories. And this position was endorsed by the Australian Health Minister's Conference in June 1990. In close consultation with the states and territories, we have developed a reformed process for setting food standards which addresses the problems of the current arrangements. In October 1990, the direction of these reforms was agreed by the heads of all governments at the Special Premier's Conference on Commonwealth State Relations. And now, Mr Deputy Speaker, after such an impressive history in food regulation, originally led by the states and then bringing on board the industry scientists and consumers for the first time, the Federal Parliament is to have the opportunity to debate the issues and to contribute to the reforms. The basic principles of the reforms being proposed are to consolidate responsibility for domestic food standards development with a minimum number of decision-making layers, to ensure uniformity between jurisdictions, to establish objectives for food standards, to promote coordination of domestic and international food standards, to ensure an open and publicly accountable arrangement which would allow input by interested parties and provide for public hearings where appropriate, and importantly, to retain the involvement of the states and territories in standards development and administration. These principles, Mr Deputy Speaker, are to be adopted by the Commonwealth States and Territories 
through the bill before the House and via a formal agreement between all heads of government. Let me first describe the Commonwealth State Agreement. Under the existing agreement, each state and territory adopts the food standards that have been developed by the National Health and Medical Research Council and agreed to unanimously by members of the National Food Standards Council. The National Food Standards Council comprises the responsible ministers from all jurisdictions in Australia. The existing agreement also allows for each state to make unilateral variations to those food standards. It is now necessary to revise that agreement to take account of the decision of the Special Premier's Conference that uniform national food standards should apply across the nation and be regulated by a national food authority. Under the revised agreement presently being considered by states and the territories, they would adopt food standards that have been recommended by the National Food Authority and agreed to by the National Food Standards Council by majority decision. Mr Deputy Speaker, now let me turn to the bill before the House. This bill will establish the National Food Authority as an independent statutory authority and make provision for its membership, staffing, functions and objectives. It will also prescribe the process by which food standards are to be developed so as to ensure that all interests, that is consumers, industry and scientific experts, are involved in the development of standards by providing adequate information about proposals and an opportunity to contribute. The authority is to comprise a full-time chair supported by four part-time members. One of the part-time members would be an officer of a state or territory health authority with a good knowledge of the food regulation system. The bill requires that the members of the authority are to have experience or expertise in relevant fields such as public health, food science, the food industry or consumer advocacy. The members are, however, not representatives of the various interest groups. The bill requires the proposed National Food Authority to pursue set objectives in making recommendations for the introduction, removal or amendment of food standards. The authority will be required to have regard in priority order two, the need to protect public health and safety, the provision of adequate information relating to food and to enable consumers to make informed choices, the promotion of fair trading in food, the promotion of trade and commerce in the food industry, and the promotion of consistency with standards applied to food in international trade. The fifth objective referring to the requirements for international trade is likely to be of increasing relevance. The food standards recommended by the Food Authority apply to all foods sold in Australia, to imported food as well as to domestically produced food. And of course the producers who produce to meet domestic standards would be advantaged if these standards were consistent with overseas requirements. The role of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, negotiations is also relevant. Those negotiations have identified the need to avoid food standards being used as barriers to trade. The GATT goal is to ensure that national standards should be based upon the standards developed by the Codex Alimentarius Commission, or where they differ, they do so on a scientifically justified basis. The National Food Authority will contribute to the decision making on codex standards and in turn harmonise our domestic food regulations where appropriate with codex. This harmonisation would remove the potential for accusations that Australia was using food standards as a non-tariff trade barrier. The principal function of the authority as set out in the bill is to develop and review the standards relating to food available in Australia. Food standards prescribe a range of matters that relate to food composition, to the use of additives, production storage, maximum levels of environmental contamination including heavy metals and pesticide residues, labelling and packaging. The bill also gives the authority a range of functions which are ancillary to the development of those standards. Generally, these relate to working with the states and territories to conduct surveys of the food available, to arrange the recall of unsafe food and to conduct food safety awareness and education programs. The authority will also develop and publish recommended codes of practice 
and guidelines to assist industry in maintaining hygienic production and handling procedures to ensure the safety of the food. The bill goes into considerable detail to prescribe the process to be followed by the authority in relation to its principal function, that is, the development of standards. The bill requires the authority to notify interested organisations, including all state and territory health authorities and the National Health and Medical Research Council, and to place notices in the Commonwealth Gazette about all proposals to develop or amend a food standard and to invite submissions on the proposals. The New Zealand Government will also be advised so as to ensure a continuing exchange of information and consistent approach to food regulation between ourselves and our close trading partner. After considering any submissions, the authority will draft a standard and once again notify interested parties and the public and invite comment on the draft. When considering the more significant of proposed standards, the authority will be empowered to hold a public hearing to give interested parties the opportunity to debate the issues in open forum. This requirement for an open and public process is an essential element of the reform and I believe that it will become a model for the approach to making regulations in many other areas. In order to avoid the process itself becoming a barrier to necessary swift action, the authority may simplify the process where issues are of minor significance and has a fast track available to it there is an, except where there is an exceptional public health risk. There are limited review processes including in the, included in the legislation. For an example, an applicant for development of a standard may seek review of the NFA's decision by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal where the authority rejects an application without having developed a draft standard. The final recommendation of the, the NFA and the decisions of the NFSC are not subject, however, to review. Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the complaints about the present system is that it can take far too long to consider an application and process it through the complex National Health and Medical Research Council committee structure. The reforms proposed in this system will be overcome by imposing a time frame within which the authority must complete its scientific assessment of a proposed standard and make a recommendation to the National Food Standards Council. This period is first established as a maximum of 12 months and it may be reduced by regulation. The authority will also employ scientists over a range of disciplines whose expertise will be supplemented as needed by experts either called on an ad hoc basis to advise on individual standards or employed, by, employed as consultants. At the end of this process, the authority will present a draft standard and recommendation to the Council of State, Territory and Commonwealth Ministers responsible for food regulation, that is the National Food Standards Council. Mr Deputy Speaker, obviously under our federal system whereby the Commonwealth will provide the facilities and processes to develop the standards which are to be implemented by states and territories, it is essential that the states and territories are fully involved. As I've already mentioned, they will be represented on the management of the authority and will be advised of all proposals coming before the authority, thus having an opportunity to make submissions. In addition, the bill provides a mechanism for states and territories to be involved in the broader issues, such as the development of policies within which food standards are set. This involvement will be through a high-level advisory committee which would be established by the bill. This committee would comprise the chairperson of the authority, a representative of each state and territory, a representative of the departments of community services and health and primary industries and energy, and a representative of the New Zealand government. Provision is also made for the chairman to appoint other members for specific purposes such as to provide advice on industry and consumer issues. This is not a committee to routinely examine proposals for food standards. It is intended as a top-level policy advisory body to assist the authority in setting its broad policy guidelines and its directions. It would only become involved in consideration of an individual standard when the chair of the authority believes that top-level policy advice is needed. The development of that standard would remain subject to the fixed timescales. Mr Deputy Speaker, 
the procedures set out in the bill represent the best thinking of people working within the present system and have been developed to ensure that the principles of the reforms that I mentioned earlier are carried through into practice. However, with such a major change to industry regulation, we must keep the system under review to ensure that the reforms actually achieve the efficiencies that they were designed to achieve. The government will therefore instruct the authority to review its operating procedures after they've been in place for two years to assess any changes that may be necessary to improve efficiency. The government also proposes that within its first 18 months of operation, the Food Authority should review the policy for setting food standards and prepare a timetable for the review of each existing food standard. Mr Deputy Speaker, public confidence in the food supply is essential to protect the marketability of agricultural produce and processed foods. Both Commonwealth and state governments have, res have responsibility complementary to the role of industry to promote quality and hygiene, and this can be effectively provided through a national food authority. The establishment of such a body, together with the proposed heads of government agreement, will be a major achievement in removing regulatory impediments to the development of the Australian food industry and establishing an effective mechanism for responding to food safety concerns. The proposed approach is strongly supported by the food industry. <coughs> Mr Speaker, the bill before the House ensures that consumer groups have the opportunity to contribute to food standards and recognises the need for all of us to be able to be confident that the food we purchase is safe and wholesome and that the information about that food is comprehensive and is adequate. The bill also recognises the significance of the food industry and the need for interstate and international trade means that the process for setting food standards should be efficient and dynamic. The bringing together of the administrative responsibility for food standards and imported food risk assessment policies into one body will bring about some efficiencies of operations. However, the tight timeframes for finalising applications for new standards and the need to review all existing standards for conformity with the objectives set out in the bill will involve a modest additional resource commitment. Mr Speaker, I commend this bill to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Dundas. Yes, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. The debate is adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Notice number two, National Health Amendment Bill. Minister for Mr. Resources. Dep Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Minister for Aged, Family and Health Services, I present the National Health Amendment Bill 1991. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes. Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, the bill, this bill gives effect to a number of government initiatives relating to nursing homes and to the domiciliary nursing care benefit. The bill aims to change the Commonwealth nursing home benefit arrangements for a specified number of government nursing homes. The purpose of these amendments is to allow payment of increased Commonwealth nursing home benefits to a special category of government nursing homes to be referred to as adjusted fee government nursing homes. The increased benefit will be paid on the same general basis as that paid to non-government nursing homes and will be based on the CAM system and a modification of the SAM or SAM system currently used for non-government homes. The Commonwealth nursing home benefits paid in respect of residents of government nursing homes has been frozen at November 1984 levels. Since 1987, the government has progressively taken steps to introduce an equitable national standard funding approach to financing nursing home care. This approach links Commonwealth funding to the care needs of individual nursing home residents. Quality of life and quality of care standards are a key element of the government's policy on nursing home care. The new arrangements will result in a higher level of benefit for these adjusted fee government homes. The higher level of benefit will only apply to a limited number of recently established smaller government homes, 
which are likely to meet the Commonwealth's outcome standards for quality of care and quality of life. The nursing homes to become adjusted fee government nursing homes are listed in this bill. This list will become a schedule to the Act. For these homes, the new rate of benefit will apply retrospectively to 1 January 1991. Mr Deputy Speaker, payment of higher levels of nursing home benefits to this limited number of government nursing homes will be defrayed by the offset provided by the relevant state government's withdrawal of a number of other government nursing home beds in that state. The only long-term financial impact will be through the routine process of indexation, which is currently applied to non-government nursing home funding and will now apply to adjusted fee government nursing homes. Several amendments are proposed in this bill for the exempt nursing home arrangements. The government introduced the exempt nursing home provisions last year. These cater for residents who wish to pay a higher resident contribution in return for receiving a higher level of accommodation and services. However, the experience in the operation of these provisions has shown that they do not adequately cater for those people who did not choose to enter an exempt home, but were already in the home at the time it became exempt. Under the existing legislation, a resident in a nursing home at the time it is given exempt bed status can remain in the home for two years after that date without paying an additional contribution. Beyond that period, they are automatically classified as exempt and so must pay the additional contribution or leave the home. Mr Deputy Speaker, many of these people cannot afford the additional contribution and so must leave the home. This provision has caused distress to many of the residents of the homes which were given exempt status last year and to their relatives. The bill proposes changes to the legislation to allow residents in homes given exempt bed status in the future to stay permanently without paying the additional exempt bed resident contribution. Under the current legislation, if a home's approval as exempt expires and is not renewed, its exempt residents will immediately cease to be exempt. These people chose to enter that home specifically to obtain the additional accommodation and services an exempt home provides and it is reasonable that they be allowed to remain exempt for as long as they stay in the home. This would also ease the home's transition to non-exempt status. This bill will implement these changes sought by the industry. Currently, if a nursing home, in its application for exempt status, makes an error in the list of additional accommodation and services it pr promises to provide, it is bound by that list. The bill will give the minister the power to amend this list if the proprietor so requests. When a nursing home applies for exempt status, it promises to provide certain services. If the home then does not provide these services, the minister can currently take no effective action to remedy that situation. People choosing to enter exempt homes deserve better protection than this. Accordingly, the bill will allow the minister to remove a home's exempt status where it does not meet the conditions under which it has been given this status. Other related changes in the bill in relation to exempt homes improve the safeguards for residents in exempt homes and make minor changes to assist the proprietors of exempt homes. The bill also introduces an amendment to allow certain payments to nursing homes outside the fees and benefits system. This is a purely machinery amendment with no policy or funding implications. It is designed solely to reduce the administrative workload on the department and on the industry. Mr Deputy Speaker, currently all nursing homes are eligible for additional funding to assist them to employ a registered nurse at all times. Only the smaller homes, however, need this assistance, so the funding formula is such that only these smaller homes receive it. The funding formula and other necessary details are set out in the principles formulated pursuant to the Act. The bill retains this situation. Mr Deputy Speaker, Currently, the additional funding is provided by way of a variation to the home's approved fees, which means that for all the homes receiving this funding, the fees change each month. These fees have to be authorised, fed into the computer and notified to the home. This creates considerable work for the department. It also creates considerable work for the industry, which must change its billing arrangements each month to allow for this. This bill will allow the additional funding to be provided directly without the need to change the home's fees. 
A similar situation applies for some small nursing homes which are receiving additional funding to assist them to achieve financial viability. The bill retains the existing arrangements for determining eligibility and the level of additional funding and allows this funding to be provided without the need to change the home's fees every month. The bill also clarifies the Commonwealth's power to recover overpayments from nursing homes. This bill also strengthens the legal power of the government to take action against nursing homes with poor standards of care. In a number of cases, nursing home proprietors do have not provided the quality of life and care expected by the government. As the Commonwealth subsidises each resident in a nursing home, an average of $23,000 per year, as well as the resident's contribution from their own pension, it is essential for the Commonwealth to be in a position to ensure accountability for the funds it makes available and to protect the rights of a potentially powerless group of individuals in our community. This bill makes it clear that the satisfaction of the Commonwealth outcome standards is a condition of approval of all Commonwealth funded nursing homes. It also clarifies the ability of the Commonwealth either to take sanctions against the home or, if necessary, to withdraw or suspend a nursing home's approval before it receives Commonwealth funding. A minor amendment is also included in this bill to ensure that the role of the community visitor, as spelled out in the Act, does not conflict with the role of standards monitoring teams and departmental complaints officers. Mr Deputy Speaker, changes to the method of approving applications for domiciliary nursing care benefit are also contained in this bill. Under the National Health Act, as it currently stands, the Secretary's power to approve a person for domiciliary nursing care benefit can only be delegated to a medical practitioner employed by the Commonwealth. The proposed amendment will have the effect of extending this delegation to registered nurses. Delegates will also no longer be required to be employed in a Commonwealth department. This will allow the Secretary to delegate this power to medical practitioners and registered nurses who are not officers of the department, but who may, for example, be employees of a state or territory department. Mr Deputy Speaker, since the decision to approve an application for domiciliary nursing care benefit is primarily a decision about the need for continuing nursing care, it is appropriate that nurses be included as delegates of the Secretary. Medical certificates, however, will still be required with every application. Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House and I now present the explanatory memorandum to this bill. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Dundas. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the debate be adjourned. The debate is, is adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Order of the day number one, Student Assistance Amendment Bill, resumption of debate on second reading. Order the question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Goldstein. Rise to speak on the Student Assistance Amendment Bill. This debate takes place under the operation of the guillotine, um, which is quite unsatisfactory. It means that the debate on this very important area is going to be truncated. Um, and cut off uh, this evening. I will endeavour to be brief in what I say, but uh, I wish to register a strong protest at the fact that this uh, bill is not going to receive the debate that it merits. And I must say also that uh, it is indicative of the, uh, the way in which this area is being managed by the government that uh, before the debate on this bill has even been commenced, the government is already proposing amendments to its amendment bill. Uh, it finds it very hard to get this area right, and it's an area which, as I shall indicate in my speech, deserves considerably more coherent thinking and attention from the government than it has so far received. The bill is designed to amend the operation of the Student Assistance Amendment Bill, its refunding procedures and appeal procedures. Student assistance is a very significant part of total Commonwealth spending on education. Outlays for student assistance have grown 
at an average rate of 6.9 per cent in real terms since 1980-81. The 1990-91 budget provided $1.2 billion for student assistance, including $936 million for Ausstudy. Indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, 16 per cent of total Commonwealth expenditure on education is spent on student assistance. The bill before the House is one which makes a number of specific amendments to the student assistance arrangements. It is not a bill which in any way addresses the important problems and inequities of the Ausstudy scheme and, consequently, it is not a bill which will in any way allay the widespread concern in the community and in this parliament over the operation of student assistance in this country. The bill seeks to increase savings from the administration of the Student Assistance Act 1973 and to strengthen the safeguards against fraud, and we welcome that as far as it goes, which isn't very far. One amendment contained in the bill will require students and parents or the spouse of a student applying for Ausstudy to provide a tax file number. The government estimates savings to be approximately $8 million, $7 million from the tax file number requirement and associated package involving data comparison, and $1 million from the restructuring of the data proposal change. The provisions outlined therefore reduce expenditure by uh, ensuring a tighter policing of the regulations, but only by what must be seen as a relatively small amount given expenditure on this scheme. There remains a need, Mr Deputy Speaker, for a thorough review of Ausstudy. The bill will also put in place recovery mechanisms for overpayments of student assistance payments and require the Student Assistance Review Tribunal to give written reasons within 10 working days of the handing down of its decision. This is a measure to speed up the review process and is welcomed. The bill further provides that the Minister's determinations on the approval of courses become subject to disallowance. This is a response to the concern expressed by the Senate Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills that ministerial determinations under the Act were not subject to parliamentary review. We support this and we also support the replacement of the Minister's power to make determinations about the manner in which Ausstudy should be paid by regulation. The opposition will not, however, be supporting the proposal under which the obligation on the government to provide an annual report to the parliament is removed. The government proposes that the annual report on the Act be incorporated into the department's annual report. This is the one measure in the bill we are not prepared to accept, and I will be moving an amendment to the bill during the committee stage to delete this proposed amendment from the bill. I am also proposing to move a second reading amendment to the bill, and uh, this amendment is being circulated in my name, and I now formally move that amendment. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to have the opportunity to be able to address the House on the issue of the student assistance scheme and Ausstudy in particular. It is indicative of the piecemeal approach that the Minister for Employment, Education and Training and the Minister for Higher Education have continued to adopt towards the administration of their portfolios and indicative of what has been the administration of Ausstudy. Ausstudy today is a ramshackle scheme. The inequity, the hardship felt by so many families and children reflects the incompetent ad hoc administration in this as in each other area of education policy at the present time. The notion of a clever country has been turned into a murky pool of bitterness and disillusion and student distress by the damage to both quality and opportunity resulting from the Minister for Employment, Education and Training's bright ideas, ideas which produce upheaval but rarely, if ever, have any follow through and leave usually a disastrous chain of consequences in their wake. Professor Ross Garno, um, an adviser whom the government respects, gave an address to young graduates at the Australian National University and expressed feelings which uh, state very clearly feelings which are felt throughout Australia about the government's education policies when he said, and I quote, a few days ago, a Commonwealth minister, 
I think it may be the minister at the table, said that it is important that we develop a positive vision of the Australian National University. Meagre and mediocre minds are as incapable of seeing the reality of a great centre of scholarship as of sharing the vision from which it grew. You are the latest inheritors, Professor Garno went on to say to the students, of a great tradition. I hope that you will join with many others to protect and to build this tradition against the powerful levelling, the corrosion which grinds away at every mountain, hill and promontory which rises above the flat lines of this ancient continent. Now, Professor Garno was talking about the impact of the government's policies on higher education. It was a very perceptive comment and it expressed very widespread feelings throughout higher education in this country. Let me reiterate, Mr Deputy Speaker, at the outset the Coalition's commitment to the importance and regard it has for the quality of educational institutions and the rights of access that all students should have to primary and secondary and tertiary education. In Australia today, every person with the will and the capacity to pursue higher education should be able to get access. The opportunity to learn to improve <coughs> one's ability and knowledge to make the best of one's opportunities is central to the Coalition's philosophy. And it is imperative that the opportunity should be there regardless of a person's financial situation. The Coalition is totally committed in its support for student assistance. This is not a matter for equivocation. It is a matter of stated policy. And the Coalition, unlike the government, will meet that commitment. In cases of need, there must be financial assistance available. The evidence at the moment, however, is that we do not have student assistance arrangements which are providing such assistance. We do not have student assistance arrangements which are meeting clear objectives and achieving those objectives efficiently and in a fair and equitable way. Ausstudy has neither clear objectives nor is it administered efficiently and it does not operate in a fair and equitable way. A most useful source of information in this regard is the recent report of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training. And I would like to pay particular tribute to uh, not only to all the members of that committee who are in the House, and in particular to the members for La Trobe, Guida, the member for Isaacs, the member for McPherson and the member for Maranoa on this side of the chamber, who contributed effectively to this report. The report contains uh, many significant criticisms. Well, you will hear a number of them in the course of this debate. Um, as, usual, as usual, the opposition has a much longer list of speakers in a debate on education than the government is able to muster. And those members will be here to speak to this chamber to the extent that the government allows them to speak. The report contains many significant criticisms of existing student assistance arrangements and of the way in which the government has mismanaged this very important policy area. And to remind those members of the committee who are in the chamber and other members uh, who were not on that committee, let me read one of the major conclusions of that committee. It's stated in its report that the Department of Employment, Education and Training's current performance indicators emphasise processing efficiency rather than program effectiveness. Programs such as AusStudy, AbStudy and the Assistance for Isolated Children scheme have never been properly evaluated. The committee finds it disturbing that billions of dollars have been spent on programs for which the success or otherwise has never been assessed. Further, the committee found that despite its supposed targeting towards students in financial need, Ausstudy is in fact, under current legislation, going to students who are not in such need. The committee cited, for example, its, its view that it is unacceptable, and I quote it, that dependent students who have extensive assets should be eligible for financial support. Also, according to the report of that committee, Ausstudy is continuing to go to some families that can well afford to meet their children's education costs. The committee found that it is unacceptable 
that inequalities in the taxation system result in the payment of allowances to those who are well able to meet their own or their children's education costs. Members of this House will also be aware of reports that our study is not being paid to people who are uh, sorry, our study is, is being paid to people who are not complying with the spirit and intent of the scheme. There are repeated reports from teachers and their representatives that secondary students in receipt of our study benefits are not attending classes and there is no satisfactory monitoring system which could ensure that they were in fact attending and that this abuse was being prevented. Again, it has been said that all that is required to get independent OS study is for parents to be willing to sign a statutory declaration that they will no longer support their child, regardless of their means. So bedevilled is the administration of student assistance that the committee found it necessary to recommend to the government and to the minister sitting on the front benches here that the government take the lead and develop some clear objectives for student financial assistance. The government has now been operating student assistance programs for more than eight years, but it still has not determined what, in fact, are the policy objectives of these programs. Is it the purpose of Ausstudy to bring into formal education students who would not otherwise participate? That would seem to be one of the objectives. Yet, at a time, when the government says that it cannot find the money to fund, to fund enough places for qualified students in higher education, almost $1 billion, $1,000 million is being spent annually, presumably to increase demand from students who would not otherwise participate in higher education, if that is an objective. Few facts more starkly indicate the lack of coherence in the government's policies in education. While the system trembles under an excessive demand, the government is spending $1 billion a year to increase demand still further, but says it cannot find the money to fund the additional places. If the purpose of the scheme is indeed to assist students without discrimination, it is totally unsatisfactory at the present time that our study is not available to students entering private tertiary institutions. This clearly reveals the ideological elements and the political bias which permeate the government's thinking behind this scheme. The coalition believes that our study should be available to students in private tertiary institutions and we will do away with this discrimination on coming to government. In April, Mr Deputy Speaker, there were no less than three reports tabled in the parliament reporting on various aspects of the Department of Employment, Education and Training. They were not effusive in their praise of the department. They were, I regret to say, damning in their condemnation. There was a certain awe at the department's ability to spend vast sums of money combined with a shocked sense of disbelief in its ability to manage money in its avoidance of review of its activities and its constant promotion of ill-considered programs, each criticism impinging directly on the vital area of student assistance. First, as I've noted, we had the report of the Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training. Then we had the Australian National Audit Office report, which drew attention to what it called in the Department of Employment, Education and Training, and I quote, a significant number of unsatisfactory matters which highlighted underlying inadequacies. The National Audit Office was concerned, as we should all be, that satisfactory standards were not maintained in accounting for certain public monies. It pointed out that overseas students in New South Wales and Victoria owed a total of almost $5 million in fees to August last year, but that the department had not pursued the money. It was also criticised for not clearing its overseas student charge account a failure which cost the Commonwealth a considerable amount of interest. Again, we find an audit office report on the Department of Employment, Education and Training's implementation of program evaluation. And it finds in this uh, report both a failure of the department to manage its programs properly and a coyness, if not an outright reluctance, to submit to the evaluation procedures of the Department of Finance. 
In its own words, the report noted that DEET, and I quote, exercises substantial autonomy in the management of evaluations. In other words, it tells nobody what's going on and it won't allow others to measure its performance. It's a secret. These concerns, and they are by no means minor concerns, are symptomatic of an underlying malaise in the administration of education in this country. Mr Deputy Speaker, I turn to one of the most serious issues which is currently concerning the community about our study, and that is the matter of rural educational disadvantage. Students and potential students throughout Australia are suffering because of the inadequacies of the government's programs, and there's no doubt that one of the most severely disadvantaged groups are students in regional, rural and isolated areas. Many rural families are missing out or can't afford to send their children to school or university because of the costs of transport, board and communications. In Victoria, for instance, in the just published study entitled Patterns of Participation in Higher Education, the participation rate in all country areas is below the state average. In some country areas, the participation rate is barely one third of that of parts of the metropolitan area. And let me state now that the Minister for Higher Education is rapidly building a reputation for his insensitivity towards the needs of students from rural areas and in difficult economic circumstances. The inequities and rigidities of student assistance programs at a time of severe rural downturn are once again widening the gap between country and city, and many rural families are being forced to abandon their children's studies. The inappropriateness of the OS study scheme has forced students to leave and be withdrawn from schools and universities for lack of financial support. When they turn to the government for assistance, the ministers uh, for education treat them with contempt, send them terse little notes simply saying, you are not eligible for assistance. The rural crisis has exposed a significant weakness in our study, as families with little or no real income are being excluded by the asset test, a situation that makes a cynical mockery of the clever country boast. There is a need, there is an urgent need, for the immediate introduction of emergency provisions for our study, hardship provisions, to prevent students being withdrawn from education because their parents can no longer afford to keep them at school, where otherwise those families are excluded from our study by the operation of the assets test. Parents excluded should be able to make application for financial assistance on a case-by-case -case basis. The development of appropriate provisions of this kind is an urgent matter and I urge the Minister to give the most serious consideration to the amendment of our study to introduce such provisions as soon as is practically possible. It's a matter of urgency. Last night, the Senate endorsed the opposition motion demanding immediate action from the government to provide emergency assistance to rural families who are being forced to withdraw their children from education on financial grounds as a result of the rural crisis. The cases that one hears about are really quite heartrending cases. Um, I cite the case of a family with four children living in northwest New South Wales, isolated from schooling, one student on correspondence distance education, the mother is finding it difficult to cope and hoping to get help from volunteers, another student boards privately to attend a high school, the third student, her child is at secondary boarding school and the fourth at university. That family describes their financial situation as critical. The assets test excludes them from any additional allowance. The coalition government believes that the assets test on the assistance for isolated children's benefit should be abolished. It is a test which applies solely to rural families and misrepresents their income earning capacity. There are reports now coming in from hostels and boarding schools around Australia of applications for places not taken up and students being withdrawn. In Western Australia, for instance, 47 isolated students did not proceed with their hostel bookings for 1991 
29 have been withdrawn from hostels already this year. Many students have been forced to transfer to distance education and some have just not proceeded to upper secondary level. Mr Deputy Speaker, the opposition has been calling for some time now for a thorough review of our study and pointing out the inequities and inefficiencies which are confirmed by every report which comes out on this scheme. And I am pleased to say that the government has apparently not been deaf, not completely deaf to these calls, and while it hasn't been keen to promote the fact, it has in fact indicated that it is prepared to consider a complete change to student assistance. The Department of Employment, Education and Training has provided me with a document which provides the terms of reference uh, for the consultant's inquiry, and I seek the leave of the minister to table this document for the information of members. Order. Is leave granted? Order. Of course. Yes. Leave is granted. Thank you. It's important that the uh, government come clean on what it intends to do with this review. We criticise the secretive way in which this review has been established, but it is of vital importance to all concerned with this area that there be a uh, public report of the results and that the government be open to constructive suggestions and options about the uh, recommendations of the review. What will be quite unacceptable will be if the government seeks to bury this review and fails to make the vital and needed improvements to student assistance programs in this country. Order. Is the honourable member's amendment seconded? The honourable member for Bratton. Order. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the honourable member for Goldstein has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Port Adelaide. It's interesting, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the member for Goldstein, who I think is a highly intelligent man, but in many ways uh, has a very small focus in terms of what the education needs of this country are. In 25 years in education, 25 years, I have a very good memory in terms of the initiatives of opposition parties. They were subsequently lacking in principle, lacking in policy, and were simply dancing at the margin. They're interested in small, small outcomes, and their record in their period from 76 until 83 was appalling. And if you, even if you look at it at a state level, their promises are continually broken when they talk about expansion of education funding. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Student Assistance Act, which was introduced by the Whitlam government, is the cornerstone of financial assistance to fi financially disadvantaged students and has not undergone any major changes until 1987. From 1987, education income support has been provided mainly through the OS study, AB study and the Assistance for Isolated Children schemes. The objectives of these schemes are intended to provide equality of educational opportunity and to improve educational outcomes through the provisional of financial assistance to students who are financially disadvantaged, of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island origin, geographically isolated or disabled. OS study, the major component of the Student Assistance Act provides assistance on a non-competitive basis to students 16 years of age and over, undertaking approved full-time secondary or tertiary studies. And student assistance, as the member for Goldstein pointed out, is a billion dollar plus expenditure program. The number of secondary student recipients has trebled, trebled since 1983, while the number of tertiary students has increased by 56 per cent in that time. I'll come back to those figures a little later. Currently, there are about 410,000 students in receipt of assistance, which represents a, a doubling of numbers assisted since 1983. Now, corresponding, Mr Deputy Speaker, with the introduction of Ausstudy in 87, year 12 retention rates increased from 48.7 per cent in 86 to 57.6 per cent in 88, and of course they're well over 65 per cent now. Some 42 per cent of tertiary students and 36 per cent of secondary students aged 16 or over are assisted by Ausstudy, and about 44 per cent of all eligible students 
receive full rates for their category. I think that's a pretty reasonable outcome. However, the opposition education spokesperson has said in this House that Ausstudy is a poorly targeted scheme. In fact, Senator Kemp, and I read Senator Kemp in the Senate estimates asked the following. Is it likely that all or even most of those recipients would change their career paths completely if the program was discontinued? And he went on, and I quote, does this not suggest that there are better ways of spending the scarce education dollar? Is it therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, the real policy of the opposition is to abolish the Ausstudy scheme? That's what they're on about. If it is, why don't they come out and state it? Then go out and sell their proposals to the 410,000 recipients of Ausstudy, Abstudy and Assistance for Isolated Children schemes and their families. And while you're at it, Try and sell your education and your health voucher system, your 15 per cent consumption tax, your abolition of capital gains tax, your abolition of fringe benefits tax. I see the member for Goldstein has left the House. And your abolition of the assets test, your general $3 billion reduction in government expenditure in health, education and welfare. Perhaps you'll take a leaf out of your mates and your, your colleagues in New Zealand. Remember that? Been in government six months, the Tories there. What did they do? They reduced tertiary places by 50 per cent, 50 per cent in six months. That's really what your, you lot are on about. Since 1987, by contrast, Mr Deputy Speaker, the number of students assisted have increased by around 50 per cent to the end of 1990, not decreased. The amount of financial assistance provided by this government has increased by well over 50 per cent. In my own state of South Australia, the OS study figures are stark, particularly in regard to secondary and adult secondary education. In 1987, about 10,000 students received assistance. In 1990, three years later, the figures are around the 16,000 mark. The actual funding amount has also increased in relation to the number of students, in addition to this government's policy of targeting funding to those generally in need. It should be noted, Mr Deputy Speaker, that 53 per cent of OSS study recipients are in fact secondary students. This represents a fairly large increase overall in the financial commitment by this government towards equity and fairness of opportunity in the education system. The 1986 Bureau of Statistics survey on geographical breakdown of tertiary graduates shows that Port Adelaide, my seat, has only 4.7 per cent of tertiary educated people, compared with the Liberal blue ribbon seats of Boothby and Kuyonga, which have 18 per cent and 23 per cent respectively. Now, obviously, the financial restraints and barriers to further a student's education in areas such as the western suburbs of Adelaide, and in particular the electorate of Port Adelaide, for some time have needed to be addressed. Clearly, clearly, a voucher system would be a disaster in those areas, and I welcome anyone from the opposition to come to my electorate and try and sell it. The government has come to the party in respect to providing increased student financial assistance and increased places in our tertiary institutions, but there is still a lot to be achieved. 140,000 more places. The University of Adelaide operates the Fairways Scheme, which aims to provide students from disadvantaged backgrounds easier access to university courses. And I am very pleased to note that the Adelaide University has recognised and acted to overcome the, the inequities that still exist. The Fairways Scheme, Mr Deputy Speaker, benefits the western suburbs of Adelaide and the dormitory suburbs both north and south and hopefully will increase the number of tertiary educated students in my electorate to well over the figure of 4.7 per cent in 86. The Student Assistance Amended Bill will not make major changes to the Ausstudy scheme. It will, in short, continue to serve benefits to those generally entitled to payment. The government has introduced wide-ranging policies and programs which identify and target funding to individuals and families more accurately and, indeed, more effectively. The Student Assistant Amendment Bill is no different. By targeting, benefits have and will continue to be maximised to those generally entitled students. No student will receive OSS study if they don't provide their tax file number. And this will also apply to parents or partners if the means test applies to parents or a partner. The Minister will be able to prescribe by regulation similar parallel exemptions to those in the Social Security Act. This measure was announced in the 1990 budget context. It's part of a broader package involving data matching, which will generate savings of some $7 million in a full year. I believe that there have been extensive consultations with the Privacy Commissioner 
to ensure there will be no disclosure of confidential information. There have been some cases, Mr Deputy Speaker, unfortunately, where a student's Ausstudy file has been sought by the non-custodial parent in, in student assistance files from subpoenas by courts and tribunals. Again, this amendment is parallel to provisions in the Social Security Act. However, it will not restrict access to Ausstudy files by courts or tribunals hearing Ausstudy appeals. Another aspect of this bill is the further tightening of the overpayment system clients who receive monies through the Ausstudy program in excess of their entitlement. In future, Mr Deputy Speaker, it will be less financially attractive for students to obtain payments to which they are not entitled to or to receive payments higher than their entitlement. It will reduce both the number of clients who make deliberately false misrepresentations of their circumstances and those who deliberately fail to comply with the notification provisions of the Principal Act. The restructuring of the late payment charges is, is expected to generate revenue of up to $1 million a year and reflect the costs involved in the recovery of those debts. Penalties already apply, again similar to those which applied in the Social Security Act. At present, if a debtor is notified of a debt but does not repay it within three months, the debtor is liable for late payment charge comprising of $15 plus 10 per cent of the outstanding amount after a three-month period up to a maximum of $515. Interest also accrued uh, from the end of this period. The, this bill will vary the existing arrangement so, so that after the three months, the debtor will be liable for a flat payment charge of $100 and interest applied on the debt from the date of advice. Of course, the change is and will, re and will remain a discretionary measure and is to be used primarily to encourage prompt repayments of debts rather than to raise revenue. Other changes are by and large non-controversial and will have little financial impact on the delivery aspect of assistance. The government is putting greater emphasis on the quality and timeliness of processing claims and inquiries. Presently, Mr Deputy Speaker, 90 per cent of applications are being processed within three weeks. The delivery of OSS study is now being developed through the CES network, which will increase the effectiveness and access to the scheme. Many metropolitan offices and all country offices can now accept applications. Mr Speaker, in the short time and in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge there are some shortfalls in the delivery of OSS study benefits, and there is scope for continued refinements which this government will continue to make, particularly in light of the recent House of Representatives report on student financial assistance chaired by my colleague, the member for Chifley. In education, Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair. Mr. My, the member for uh, Chifley just acknowledged that I too was on that committee. In education, this government has created some order out of chaos, a situation that the opposition seems hell-bent on reversing. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order. The immediate question is that the, the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Braddon. Uh, thank you much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to uh, debate uh, this particular bill on Students' Assistance Amendment Bill 1991 uh, with uh, concern about the situation which we're faced with here in Australia. And let's just have a look at the backdrop as to what we're debating here, first of all. First of all, we've got the situation of very high unemployment now with it rapidly rising. And in fact, of course, if we took into account uh, without uh, student assistance schemes which are operating in Australia and the extra students going in, the level of unemployment would be much higher. Secondly, it's interesting to note tonight that uh, the government only has a, a few speakers on this debate and yet uh, at the last election we were supposed to be being led by the Prime Minister to form a clever country. And uh, this is now becoming very typical in debates on education in the parliament here, that the opposition speakers outnumber the government usually by about two to one. And so the concern by the opposition is very obvious about this area of government administration in Australia. And it's a great pity, it's a great pity that the actual assistance which is being given to young people in Australia is not being administered effectively. And uh, I spoke uh, last week, I think it was, on the report 
which was brought into the parliament here. And it's a good report. And it really does go to the heart of the problem. And we need to go back over what this report is saying in regard to student assistance. Because here we have an expenditure in the area of OS study of over a billion dollars. And yet, and yet, there are no clear policy objectives. And one really does wonder how long it takes a government and the department in this area to get their act together. There are no clear policy objectives for a $1 billion expenditure. Like it's absolutely incredible. And I just wonder really where the minister has been in regard to this area and probably where has the department been in alerting the minister to the fact that there are no clear objectives to administer this amount of money. Not only are there no clear objectives, the report has found, there are no adequate performance indicators. Like here we have a situation where we've had student assistance in this country from 1973, I think the first act was brought into the parliament, and we've had this government administering student assistance for over eight years, and yet there are no indicators in place to determine whether it is actually doing the job it should be doing. And the question for any person administering education and student assistance is how well it's being managed. Not the total number of students who are going on to university or continuing to year 12. That is important. I acknowledge that and I support the government in its endeavour to get students to stay at school and to go on to tertiary education because that is fundamental to developing the human resources of this country. But what we are debating here, what we are concerned about, is the fact that the amount of funds which is allocated is not actually being managed effectively. And that can be seen that uh, anything up to 27 per cent of young people receiving assistance back in 1988 were actually overpaid. And of course the consequence of this is, and the opposition is concerned about it, that there are fewer young people who are able to be assisted. Able to be assisted. And it is the responsibility of the government to ensure that the systems are in place which enable the taxpayers' money to go to the maximum number of young people. And it's a great pity that there are young people out there who can't get assistance, who need assistance, and if it had been administered more effectively, then I'm sure they would have got the assistance required because the money would have been available. Now, the previous member, the member for Port Adelaide, stated quite clearly, he said that the opposition was going to abandon our study. Now, of course, this has become a feature of the government in this type of debate, that the opposition is going to abandon this policy or that policy. They're running the line in regard to unemployment benefits, that the opposition is going to abandon unemployment benefits after nine months. It doesn't say anything about the other policies or other programs which are in place to take up after that point of time. And of course, they don't mention the fact that they are going to abolish unemployment benefits after 12 months. Now they come into the parliament tonight and say that the opposition is going to abandon our study. They have got no skerrick of evidence at all to make those statements. And it's purely a fear campaign. And what they're trying to do is paper over paper over the deficiencies of their administration of this particular program. And it's a great pity that the government has to stoop to that level in a debate to try and gain some credibility or to win back support out there in the electorate. The situation is that if the government had set up clear objectives and set up its performance indicators and undertaken a clear assessment of the effectiveness of this program or these programs through the eight years in which they've been in government, 
then we wouldn't be probably having this type of debate here tonight. Nor would the government be undertaking a review of, edu of uh, student assistance programs in the next few months. And like I commend the government for accepting the opposition's plea to undertake a review of our study because it's certainly necessary. And the report which the committee brought down is very clear evidence of the need for a very total review of this area. Now, the coalition believes education has a very important part to play in a functioning society. It has a very important part to play in a whole range of areas of developing people's skills and their talents. And we are fully supportive of having excellence and quality and giving opportunity to people in education. And in particular, as the member for Goldstein said, rural education is one of those areas in which we believe there is a need for some equity. Because when you have a look at the figures of young people who go on to tertiary education, for example, what you find is 42% of young people go on from urban areas, but only 26 per cent from rural areas. Now, that's not equity. The government can't claim that there is social justice in that. Why is it that the outlying rural areas of Australia do not get the same type of assistance and the same number of young people going on per head of population as in the urban areas? And so there is a need to redress that situation in the future. And there is no doubt about it. It is in many of the regional areas of Australia where there is high unemployment and therefore all the greater need for better education for those young people. And it, it is important that whoever is in government, and no doubt we will be there within the next two years, that we address this situation so that people in rural Australia will get the necessary support and assistance. Of course, at this stage, it is critical with the economic circumstances faced in rural Australia that there be some hardship provisions and that the uh, provision of four families so that they can ensure that their young people can maintain going to schools or going on to TAFE or going into higher education in the universities is maintained. And I certainly ask the government that they will look at this in the immediate future so that young people will not just lose out in going on with their education in the event of the economic circumstances which they are faced with. Now, the opposition in regard to uh, the amendments put has been outlined that we support uh, six of the amendments out of the seven which are pro proposed there. Uh, and we expect, though, that uh, the annual report, that there is a uh, reason for it, that it come here before the parliament and shouldn't be just put into the annual report. We believe it's, that uh, that should be open and we should be able to discuss that sort of matter. But the other amendments which are being brought uh, to us, we accept. But I also, uh, as a seconder for the amendment to the motion, want to just uh, finally state that there has been a failure, a failure to define clear objectives, there has been failure to administer student assistance, and there has been failure to structure and administer the programs so that they operate in a fair and an equitable manner. Education is vital for Australia's future. It's unfortunate that the assistance being given to our young people has not been managed effectively and efficiently. Order. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member Chipley. I'm pleased to speak in this debate and uh, I want to uh, just uh, take issue with the Honourable Member for Goldstein who uh, thanked uh, all op opposition members that served on the House of Reps Co Committee and two of the government members who had, were in the House that served on it. And I want to re reiterate my earlier remarks in thanking all members of the committee. And I think it's a pity when we try to uh, uh, make political capital out of what can be a very effective bipartisan uh, uh, process that is the committee system of this House. 
Um, <clears throat> Mr Chairman, sorry, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to say this about Ausstudy, and I want to make a few remarks. Uh, firstly, I've always supported the, uh, the notion and the concept, and particularly Ausstudy, that is, that we should try to target uh, those least able to afford education in our community and provide them with assistance. Of all the people in my electorate that are receiving Ausstudy, none have run, rushed up to me and said, look, this is terrible, uh, this, is a, uh, this is some money that I don't really want. Every reaction I've had is that it's been very, very much appreciated. I think where the difficulty about uh, the committee's report uh, is this. Certainly, the committee was very critical of the administration of the scheme. Uh, it, uh, it did acknowledge, although it's not been subsequently acknowledged in the public debate, that the, the department has striven mightily to improve the service, and indeed the committee said that the service ought to be improved even further, and I stand by that. But I want to acknowledge the fact that the department now, over a period of time, has been um, striving to improve the service. Their difficulty in administration has to do with the complexities of eligibility. And the more easy that you make eligibility, the less better you're able to target the system. The other point that I would want to make is that if we're looking for student financial assistance of its own to actually improve retention rates, that's more people staying on to year 11 and 12 or going on to university, I believe that that's an impossible dream because I think there are many other factors that need to be taken into account and, I'll, uh, and I will uh, come to them later. As the opposition members suggesting that uh, we have a, a massive problem in administration because of overpayments, if there's any error of judgment that I would like to see the department uh, make, it is to process a payment early rather than late. And indeed, they're being specifically encouraged to do so. And the overpayments can often uh, uh, result because of the fluctuating income individual students might receive. And the committee, I think, has made a reasonable recommendation in terms of lifting student income. And I expect that that problem is going to then, therefore, uh, diminish. And it's certainly not a, a question of causing concern uh, for. Uh, for the people of Australia as far as the administration of the scheme um, is concerned. Now, opposition members have pointed out the di social disadvantage in rural Australia. I'm pleased to say that this, was a rec this has been identified uh, in the committee's report. We didn't want to indulge in tokenism and suggest uh, quick fix it solutions, but rather, Mr S Deputy Speaker, that this rural disadvantage had been or has been known and acknowledged for some time, and that we wanted to go, and, and particularly uh, because of the recession, tap into it. But I think what is most ungenerous of our opposition members is that you have had at least two government speakers from metropolitan electorates who are more than happy to acknowledge and committed to doing something about wanting to improve rural educational opportunities, but uh, the opposition members won't acknowledge that there are educational inequalities in urban areas, Western particularly Sydney. Western Sydney, as Western the honourable me member for Parramatta says, and Western Adelaide, uh, as the honourable member for Port Adelaide says. And of course, you wouldn't have two better fighters about educational issues on the government side than those two members. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Yeah, Speaker, well, I'm I'm very pleased now. My colleague, the member for Port Adelaide, pointed out to the increasing number of higher education places that this government uh, has provided. And as, of course, as the honourable member for Parramatta well knows, this government has instituted the University of Western Sydney, something that many commentators said should be denied to the people of Western Sydney. After all, we were just uh, uh, bearers of wood and water, not entitled to such institutions in our midst. And it's a source of pride for us from Western Sydney, and particularly on the government benches, that we've achieved that. And that institution is going to grow and grow and grow, and I suggest it will become one of the preeminent and one of the largest higher edu education institutions in Australia. But getting back to the retention rates and whether providing student financial assistance alone is going to help, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I think not. The greatest area of inequality in Australia, and particularly in New South Wales, the most inflexible of all states, 
is the fact that the education system is biased towards the minority of students who want to go on to tertiary education. Now, let me say this. I support the notion that we should have more students going on to universities, but the reality is that a majority of students don't see that as their career path. They see an equally valuable contribution to be made to society and their own personal careers by choosing things like apprenticeships, like traineeships, like getting a job in, um, in the retail sector, in the hospitality sector and a whole variety of other occupations. But the education system, by and large, especially the views of the opposition, treat them as second-class citizens and they are in an education system that currently doesn't cater for their needs. If there's one urgent reform that's requi required in Australia, it is to address that imbalance. And I must say I'm very excited from having talked to uh, Brian Finn, who I think is uh, chairing perhaps one of the most important um, inquiries into post-compulsory education at the request of the Australian Education um, uh, uh, Council of Ministers. And I look forward to his report because I think at long last the silent majority in education uh, will have a spokesman and will have their needs clearly articulated and a direction. And if that is the case, if that is the case, there's going to be greater opportunities then for people really staying on um, and really seeing school as a vital link and as a vital preparation to that career of work. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've been accused of suggesting that uh, the opposition want to wipe out Ausstudy. Well, let me say, when you hear people being asked, uh, do you think without that system uh, people would still make the decision to go on, and you hear that question time after time, well, then you begin to wonder. And as Ben Chifley said, if, they, you know, if someone looks like a duck, acts like a duck, and generally seen in company with ducks, it's uh, reasonable to presume they are a duck, yes. So, so Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the, my colleague, the member for Port Adelaide, has already mentioned the instance in the Senate. If the opposition are committed to Oz study for secondary students, let them say so clearly. I didn't hear those words in the, in the speech of the, of the shadow minister. Now, the other, thing, the other thing that I would draw to the attention of the House is, that, is, this notion, is this notion of a voucher system. And I suppose what is most depressing about the voucher, voucher system is that you have an opposition wanting to parade something that is a fresh idea that is really recycling something that's been around for 20. It's about 20 years ago since Milton Friedman first suggested vouchers. And the idea initially of vouchers was trying to get some competition between education systems and between schools. And indeed, if you take away the compulsory zoning of schools, you can very well get that uh, competition without vouchers. But the real tragedy is this, is it will be once again a system that will discriminate against those that are financially weak in the community. They won't be able to afford it. It'll be, it'll be great for the upper classes. They'll love it. They'll love it. But it will send education back years, as we've seen in New South Wales. I mean, the, new, the state of New South Wales is a classic example, Mr Deputy Speaker, of the education system under Dr Metherill, as the, the member for Parramatta points out, had to sack him indeed, um, set back education in my electorate by at least 10 years. And the real irony is this, if I want to be frank. I really thought that with a change in government there would be, there would be issues and changes in direction that they would initiate that quite privately I would feel that I would be compelled to support. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's a sad fact that in the electorate of Chifley, education's been set back. In fact, they're doing things like allowing principals now to suspend students. And we've had the ridiculous case of someone in infant school, in infant school for goodness sake, <laughs> being judged guilty by the principal and being suspended. Five years it's old. Five years old. Absolutely outrageous. But this is the new vision from the Liberal Party. This is their vision of excellence, convicting five-year-olds. 
This is their vision of, uh, of a decent education policy. Well, of course, it's absolutely outrageous. And as the honourable member for Port Adelaide said, just look and see what happened in New Zealand. Higher education places cut by 50 per cent. That'll be the legacy. That'll be the vision from the opposition benches, and that will be the reality. Here, here. Order. The honourable, uh, the honourable member for the Trobe. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise tonight to make my contribution to the Student Assistance Amendment Bill. And there really is only one small section of this bill that I wish to address tonight, and that is with respect of revising Section 55 of the Student uh, Assistant Act, uh, so that uh, the report to Parliament uh, be incorporated in the annual report rather than being a separate report. And I would contend, honourable members, that it's simply not good enough. The committee report, which has been well canvassed by the member for Goldstein and the member for Braddon, clearly said to the government that our study is in trouble. It is a system out of control. I've addressed the issue of the committee report at another time in this House and will not continue with that. But what I would, would like to talk about is the cost of student financial assistance and the cost of the government bureaucracy. And I note to honourable members that all student financial assistance in Australia in this financial year is budgeted at $1.2 billion. And in answer to a question of mine on notice, the Minister for Employment, Education and Training has responded and told me that the administrative costs, that is the cost of running DEET, NBEAT and ASTIC equals $561,929 a year, more than more than, honourable members, 50 per cent of the cost of our study. It's ridiculous. We're spending our money on bureaucrats and public servants and not on the students and not on the education system where the money is clearly required. In last Sunday's age, and I quote, the federal government is considering radically changing or replacing the $1 billion our study scheme as part of a wholesale review of student assistance. The government document outlining the scope of the review highlights many criticisms of the scheme, including its impact on farming families and administrative problems such as overpayment and fraud. Well, I have a copy of that report, and the minister is saying, let's go out and hire a consultant to tell us whether or not the government, the government should get rid of our study. It says, and I quote, there have been a number of criticisms of the targeting and other aspects of our study and pressure for change, particularly with respect to older students, i.e. 21 plus. Well, that's true. Against this background, it is now timely to give consideration to whether this current scheme remains appropriate with or without modification of some or all of the major scheme parameters, or alternatively, whether some alternative or modified form of student income support should be introduced. Wow, what a statement. The other side has the audacity to talk about us talking about getting rid of our study. Well, Mr. Minister at the table, it's you that are talking about getting rid of our study. The report goes on and says, and I quote, it is proposed that the consultant prepare an options paper addressing a whole wide range of issues. Well, honorable members, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker and Mr. Minister, it is always possible to provide access without equity but it is clearly impossible to have equity without access. Higher education costs are increasing rapidly in all advanced countries. It is not an Australian phenomenon. We in Australia are faced with the added pressures of one of the highest immigration rates in the world, together with a dramatic increase in retention rates to year 12, both of which contribute to rapidly increasing demand for places in higher education institutions. There has always been a limit to government expenditure in any portfolio, but rate of increase in spending in education in the past few years has been much more rapid than in other areas of government responsibility, and I don't deny that that should be a priority. Any discussion of student financial assistance must of necessity examine the concept of public versus private benefit. 
taking into account all of the players, there probably should be mechanisms for cost sharing between taxpayers, students, parents, partners, institutions, and employers. Equally, in order to satisfy the criterion of supplying access, the amount of public money devoted to income support must be considered in the overall budget context. If taxpayers must supply increasing financial assistance to students to the detriment of capital expenditure on or recurrent expenditure for the institutions themselves, and if as a result we cannot provide higher education to all of those who qualify, then we will not meet any test for equity. The debate regarding student financial assistance must be framed in terms of cost sharing and in our current circumstances must take account of an increasing need for access. If budget constraints will not allow us to provide more places and financially support more students, then alternative means of financial support, student support, must be examined critically. Any call for reduced salaries for those giving the teaching responsibility must be resisted. Quality of outcomes is of critical importance, and high quality is unlikely to be the result of low salaries and poor career opportunities. Consideration of alternative methods for providing student financial assistance must also critically take account of the issue of equity. We must first determine our objectives, public policy goals, in what we expect from higher education, such as numbers versus quality, or numbers versus quality, access versus equity, specific versus generalist and then determine how we apportion the cost. But regardless of such statement of objectives, the costs must be shared. Mr. Deputy Speaker, any attempt at international comparisons with respect to student financial assistance is difficult because of major differences in data collection, differences in priorities, differences in lifestyles, differences in standard of living, differences in cost of living, and differences in community support for education in general. However, for this discussion, it is useful to examine what is happening in the world around us and directions that are being taken by other advanced capitalist societies in terms of financial assistance for tertiary students. During 1990-91, the United Kingdom is introducing a loan scheme which will be gradually increased as a proportion of total student support and eventually equal the combined contribution of parents and grants. Spain also has a grant system, but its system is highly targeted to only approximately 17 percent of students compared to Australia's off study, which is targeted moderately to approximately 40 percent of students. Since 1971, the Federal Republic of Germany has moved from a mean-tested grant system to a mean-tested loans system, 100 percent. France has a highly targeted student grant system, but grants are small, and they're available only to the very needy and assist about 10 to 12 percent of students. Sweden, as would be expected from their extensive state welfare system, expects little from students in terms of work and no assistance whatsoever from parents or spouses. However, Swedish students have access to both loans and grants, and the role of loans relative to grants has increased significantly over the last 25 years. The United States has, in general, a great hodgepodge of systems and is quite substantially different from other major OECD countries in terms of tertiary education. In the first instance, tuition at university is not free, and fees vary from very low at public institutions to very high at private institutions. But the point is that the United States, while it has a grant system, has very rapidly moved from that grant system to now a universal loan system, which is available to all students, uh, regardless of background or regardless of parental income, uh, and uh, is guaranteed by the state. Clearly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we need in this country now as a result of the minister's statement and as a result of his consideration uh, of other options, I think we need to look at other, 
available mechanisms for supplying student financial assistance. Uh, from all that I've said, it is clear that Australia stands relatively alone in the world in support of only a grant system for public student financial assistance. The options that we must consider are continuation of all study, secondly, student part-time work, thirdly, parental support, fourthly, institutional, that is scholarship support, fifthly, student loans, and sixthly, assistance for isolated students. I would maintain, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we should increasingly look at student loans as an option for Australia. Mr. Minister, I offer my discussion paper to you, and I offer to save you the cost of consultant fees in examining the options available and the benefits to Australian students. Order. The debate is interrupted. The chair will be resumed at 8 p.m. The Honourable Member for Adelaide. Uh, Mr Speaker, thank you very much. I'd like to speak in support of the Student Assistance Amendment Bill 1991. <clears throat> this bill makes a number of amendments to the Study Student Assistance Act 1973, which is the statutory basis for the Ausstudy scheme. A major change will be made to Ausstudy, and that will be amendments to the administering of benefits so that benefits can only be paid once a student or means-tested parent has provided a tax file number to the Department of Employment, Education and Training. This measure is consistent with other government policy involving data matching of client records between departments administering income maintenance schemes. This is a move which will help reduce fraud and overpayment and ensure that assistance goes to those students who need it, need it most. The bill will also be amended to restructure the late payment charges. Currently, the system for repaying overpayments is inadequate and there is a low return rate. And under the new rules, late payments of over three months will incur a fee of $100, and after that, interest will be payable from the date of the notice. Prior to the Student Assistance Act being introduced in 1973, students paid, as you know, tertiary fees. And if they were fortunate enough, they got a Commonwealth or State scholarship. And 45 per cent of students, in fact, paid full fees. The Whitlam Labor government abolished fees and introduced TEAS in 1973 which for the first time gave students from all backgrounds financial <coughs> access to education. It's important to note that it wasn't until the election of the Hawke Labor <coughs> government that uh, this was updated and substantial reforms to tertiary assistance were implemented. In 1986, the Student Assistance Act was amended to introduce Ausstudy. The three payments that come under this scheme are Ausstudy, Abstudy, which provides assistance to Aboriginal students, and assistance for isolated children. It's part of this government's educational strategy to raise Australia's economic competitiveness in part by increasing the level of education and opening up higher education to the whole of the community. Our study's aim is to, and I quote, promote equality of educational <coughs> opportunity and improved educational outcomes for disadvantaged students by breaking down the financial barriers to further participation in education and training. And it's anticipated that this scheme will assist almost 395,000 students in 1991. And this shows an increase of 22.6 per cent on us study beneficiaries since 1988. The payment of us study primarily to students from low-income families is consistent with the government's education and, for that matter, social justice policy. 
I grew up in a Welsh working class family and as I've said before, I was probably the first to ever step inside a university. For the rest of my family, there was no consideration of anything more than a very rudimentary education. In Australia, until the 1970s, things were pretty much the same. Access was not a word normally associated with tertiary education. Now we have made education accessible and Australians have taken the opportunity to take their education. More importantly, retention rates in secondary schools have risen from 36% of students finishing year 12 in 1982 to 64% in 1990. And by 1992, federal funding for schools will have increased by almost $500 million in real terms to more than $2 billion a year. Now this commitment to education has been paralleled in higher <laughs> education where about 70,000 additional student places will be created between 1988 and 1993. But what is the most important aspect of federal government policy is that it has opened university education up to students of a variety of backgrounds. And our study has been integral to enabling this change to occur. Spending on student support has trebled since 1982-83 and has been continually refined so that it can be targeted to the most needy, as is the case with most other federal government um, income maintenance schemes. Recently, the personal income test threshold was increased to enable students to provide some of their own income while still receiving benefits. Now, in my electoral office, and you might note that I have uh, not only schools and TAFE colleges, but two universities in my electorate, one which was recently formed as a result of further uh, reforms to tertiary education by this government. In my electorate office, I occasionally receive requests or inquiries or even complaints from constituents who have difficulty with the administration of our study. And let me give you a few examples, Mr Speaker. I often encounter students who have not finished their course in the minimum time. Under the Student Assistance Act, these people are then un unable to claim our study benefits. Now, I don't think that our study should be uh, available for perpetual students to remain at university, dropping in and out at their will, but, uh, and I do believe the current rules are fair. But, however, there are occasionally cases where hardship does prevent a student from finishing a course in which he or she and the community is pretty heavily invested already within the required time. And the our study review processes don't appear to be sufficiently flexible to, to accommodate these kind of awkward situations. One such case was an adult student who'd, become, who'd, who'd begun a course part-time while working full-time. He did not claim any benefits and was no burden on the system. But he could not even claim the expenses as a tax deduction. And for reasons beyond his control, he was then uh, forced to stop his course. So a few years later, he came to South Australia to my seat and began studying full-time. He applied for our study and was granted it for one year, but was then informed that because he'd studied at the same level previously, he could only be given our study for one more year. And I'm not sure that that's quite appropriate. Another fellow called into my office concerned that he would be denied his benefits for some weeks. He was undertaking his education in a manner which is becoming increasingly popular with both students and institutions by studying every year to undertake a bachelor degree in three separate year-long courses which build up from a certificate eventually to a degree. Now, good communication with the department made it possible to, for him to apply for a special benefit from the Department of Social Security for the, in, for the interim, and it looks as though he'll, uh, he'll be able to continue with his course. There's also sometimes a long lead time between applications being lodged and the benefits being paid, which can deter potential students from going back to school if they're not getting their benefits for the first few weeks when they don't have any source of income. There's also been some suggestions that 25 years is too old for the independent <coughs> age threshold to cut in. And I noticed in a survey uh, recently conducted at Adelaide University students that was published in the Advertiser on Monday, this uh, complaint is lodged by the uh, president of the Students' Union at Adelaide University. And having brought up two children who are both now over the age of 25, I can see that in some instances 25 is an appropriate age and in other instances it's, uh, it's greatly inappropriate. However, I'm convinced that odd study should remain as the support which enables a great number of students to attend university and prevents it from being what it was until very recently a privilege for a small number of people to attend and gain access to very uh, lucrative professions and, um, and incomes. <coughs> I've had students coming into my office complaining that their study benefits have been taken away from them because of uh, a re-evaluation of their assets. Now this is a difficult one, uh, but on further checking what I found was that their family uh, farms in, this, in these cases had been valued on the voluntary evaluation at the council valuation for rate, rateable purposes. Now this was a long way from the market value 
in fact, was below market value. And a couple of years later, when someone had the, uh, uh, checked it out, they decided that the asset was, in fact, worth much more than had been evaluated at the time. Now, I sympathise with, uh, with these people, but think that we do, need, uh, we do need to ensure that the correct valuation on assets for an assets test purpose is undertaken. Now, since its introduction, our study has undergone a continual process of re review and refinement, and I note that uh, a further review is to be undertaken. In 1988, the Australian National Audit Office conducted investigations at various deed offices with a view to achieving changes in the administration of our study payments. And on the 31st of May, the House of Reps Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training undertook an inquiry into student financial assistance. And some of the problems raised by that study were to be found in the report on the Sun, in the Sun on the 10th of May 1991, which cites the ability of company directors to minimise their taxable incomes, enabling fairly high uh, income earners to obtain our study for their children. So that uh, the review process, which is about to be undertaken by a consultant for the minister, should, I think, concentrate on wheedling out such potential, uh, uh, if I can call them, uh, legal frauds of the our study payment system. The important thing, I think, to recall in all this is that there is a limited amount of financial assistance available for the tertiary education sector in general and for financial assistance for students in particular. The more money that is made available to higher income and high assets students, the less will be available for those needy who will be unable to enter what is now an accessible sector of education, but they would be unable to enter it without appropriate financial assistance. So if we're not fairly strict about the administration of assets and means test, the money that is going into that sector will not fulfil its social justice uh, objectives, which are to look after people from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds who have been unable to access tertiary education uh, for the last hundred years. These amendments to the Student Assistance Acts will require students and means-tested parents, therefore, to quote their tax file numbers, which should sh save the government, by this method, $7 million next year. Computer matching with the Department of Taxation will eliminate fraud, and coupled with other improvements to the administration of our study, these moves should make this scheme even more equitable. But I might just say, in closing, that uh, I do find in the day-to-day -day work in the electorate office that uh, the administration of our study is difficult because there are so many peculiarities of people undertaking tertiary education these days, in particular tertiary education, and uh, I do believe that the scheme needs continual review and revising in order to ensure that it does do the job it's supposed to, that, that is, make university and other tertiary and secondary education accessible to sectors of the population who voted in a Labor government and expect us to make it accessible to their kids and to their adults. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Member for Wide Bay. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this bill makes changes to the various student assistance schemes, including uh, OS study, AB study. It removes the Australian postgraduate awards from coverage under the student assistance arrangements because in future they'll be funded under the Higher Education Funding Act of 1988. The proposed amendments are not major and are generally supported, but in common with previous speakers, I'd like to direct a few comments about the OS study arrangements. This bill will obligate applicants to provide their tax file number at the time that they are making application for assistance uh, through OS study. And of course, where appropriate, parents and spouses will have to provide that kind of information. This is, of course, a further stage in the government's plan to introduce the Australia card by stealth. They failed in their endeavours to introduce a national numbering system when the public were outraged at the, the lack of personal association with those sorts of numbers and those kinds of data matching arrangements. And yet we're told that the purpose of this particular tax file number being included in OS study arrangements is to again do more data matching to endeavour to stamp out cheating. Now, of course, no one will tolerate any kind of cheating or rorts in the OS study system or anywhere else. And it leaves us then in a difficult position. Whenever we introduce these kinds of measures, we limit or invade people's privacy. It's argued by others that beneficiaries of some kind of government assistance forfeit some rights. However, that also is not a, a principle that one can rest easily with. And so we need to ensure that when these kinds of data matching mechanisms are put in place, 
that there is adequate protection of privacy and an assurance that this kind of information will always remain confidential. Our study is a major program. It's budgeted in the 1990-91 uh, federal budget to cost $935.8 million, rising in 1993-94 to $1,152.7 million. I guess it's our investment in a clever country, and there are some 338,000 off study recipients in 1991. 42 per cent of all tertiary students receive off study and 36 per cent of secondary students over 16 years of age. The AB study costs a further $92.7 million and provides assistance to another 44,200 students. The most controversial aspects of our study have clearly been its means test and its assets <coughs> test. Uh, under our study, the maximum benefit is paid where there is only one dependent child when the income is below $19,300. But it phases out uh, up to $32,000 where there's a single dependent, but in other circumstances, the phase out can go as high as $150,000. People with incomes as high as $150,000 still receiving some kind of off study assistance. We've recently had tabled in this House a report from the House of Representatives Standing Committee on employment, education and training on student financial assistance. And it made the point that the threshold for the payment of where allowances are reduced is too low. It made reference to the fact in, that in 1974, average weekly earnings was the beginning of the phase down level. These days, the figure is much worse than that. And the committee have recommended that it should be set immediately at 75% of male average weekly earnings. And that would put the figure at approximately $21,000. And of course, that is easy to support. However, the real problem arises around the assets test. This is not phased, it is fixed at $347,500, with of course a concession available to farms and businesses to allow a maximum uh, uh, asset of $695,000. There's a major problem with the relativity between the earning limit and the earning capacity of the assets. And it, in the most extreme example, an asset of $695,000, a business asset, would have to return over 20 per cent per annum to trigger the income test. There are few farms that would return the 3 per cent necessary to trigger the lowest of the income tests. And clearly, uh, that is a, a gross discrimination, particularly against the rural sector. ABARE, the Australian Bureau of Agriculture and Resource Ec Economics, has estimated that the return on farm assets last year was only 0.5 per cent, and of course it's going lower. That means then on the assets test, a farm, the average farm, would be returning only $3,500. So a farmer earning, on <coughs> average, $70 per week is considered to be too rich to receive the off-study allowances for him or his family. And that's not just a few farmers. Uh, ABER estimated that 50 per cent of farms have a net asset of $700,000 or more. And indeed, the average was $910,000 last year. So clearly, there is a problem in that many in the rural sector are unable to receive the off-study arrangements on an equivalent basis with people living in urban areas because they, they are unable to pass the assets test. And many businesses are affected as well. And I was disappointed that the Standing Committee has actually recommended a phasing out of the concession for business assets, because there are many business people who face similar problems to the rural sector. It's bad enough that the government chooses to beat farmers and small business. Its economic policy has certainly been ruinous to those trying to contribute to productivity. But when they vent their anger on their families and their children, and their children are denied basic education, I believe that is a gross discrimination which should not be tolerated. Country children are already disadvantaged in health services, future employment opportunity, cultural experience, and if they're denied a basic education, that places them at a significant disadvantage. And indeed, country children are significantly disadvantaged when it comes to receiving tertiary education. 
The federal government in September of 1990, in its higher education series, published a very interesting report on urban and rural participation in, rural education, in, in tertiary education. And that report made the point and made a number of very important highlights, including this one. Particularly in higher education among people from remote areas per head of population, sorry, participation in higher education among people from remote areas per head of population was roughly half that of people from urban areas. The particip participation rate for rural dwellers was slightly higher than for remote areas. So the people who come from rural and remote areas, and that is the vast majority of the area of Australia, have only half as much chance of receiving a tertiary education as those who come from urban areas. The majority of students from all three regions were enrolled full-time. However, the proportion enrolled part-time was, was, was much higher from rural and remote areas. Over three quarters of Australia's higher education students in 1989 came from urban areas, with 19 per cent from rural locations and 3 per cent from remote areas. And the definition of remote in this particular report included about 80 per cent of Australia, including cities like Townsville and Cairns. And it's interesting to note that of all the students coming from remote areas, uh, over half or around half are coming from Queensland. And in fact, the James Cook University alone provides around a quarter of those students coming from remote areas. So there is clearly a major disadvantage applying to country students. Only half as much opportunity to enter tertiary education. The government also recognised this when it published its Fair Chance for All report uh, uh, last year. Uh, in that particular series, there was one particular booklet devoted to people from rural and isolated areas. And the government in that report acknowledged that school leavers in rural areas transfer to higher education at consistently lower rates than their city counterparts. So the problem has been recognised by the government in a number of their reports. The facts are quite clear and quite obvious and beyond dispute. And I think that, Mr Speaker, in a community that believes in equity and a fair go for all, this is something that Australians should not tolerate. It's perhaps no wonder that there's a shortage of doctors and lawyers and architects and other professionals in country areas when there are so few students from those areas uh, entering into tertiary education. There are lots of reasons for the, the poor share of country people's participation in tertiary education. The government's own reports outline some of them. But without doubt, the major factor is financial. The inability of farm families and rural families to meet the extra cost of sending their children off to a faraway city for tertiary education experience. And in many instances, the needs are more desperate than that. The children have to stay home to help on the property to, to help ensure that that basic unit survives. The government boasts of a commitment to fairness and equity and social justice. This is one of the most blatant inequities in our society and it needs to be rectified. I regard it as unacceptable that the children in my electorate have only half as much chance of getting a tertiary education on average than students from metropolitan electorates. And I believe, Mr Speaker, that a government that's serious about equity, that's serious about fairness, must take urgent action to ensure that this, <coughs> that this wrong is corrected. We need effective student assistance measures which are able to achieve these kinds of objectives. The Honourable Member for Parramatta, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the Member for Wide Bay, in speaking to the uh, Student Assistance Amendment Bill, uh, referred to the fact of his criticisms of uh, the Ausstudy arrangements, uh, and some of them relating to uh, the rural sector recovered by the House of Representatives Standing Committee uh, on Employment, Education and Training. And uh, there is some validity in, in some of those matters. But one of the things he uh, uh, talked about, which I certainly take very strong issue with, was his suggestion that uh, uh, the uh, arrangements for the scheme uh, are in fact uh, not effectively targeted and that the threshold should be raised and all this sort of thing. Now, uh, the, the very comment he was making was uh, quite the opposite of what the member for Goldstein was saying earlier in the debate and has made uh, in a number of other comments where he's bemoaned the fact that so many people are in fact in receipt of uh, uh, the Oz study. In fact, uh, on the 19th of September in the House last year, 
He said it's a scheme which is supposed to assist those with, who would otherwise not undertake further study. But 42% of all tertiary students receive it. And he's gone on to say uh, similar things. Uh, he hasn't made too many comments on it, but the ones he have have been very negative about whether the scheme should even continue at all. And indeed, uh, I notice uh, uh, Senator uh, Kemp in the other place has uh, gone as far as advocating that uh, the money spent uh, in uh, education, in the field of education on Oz study, could be better directed to other areas altogether. In other words, go back to the old days and abolish the scheme altogether and make uh, the provision and access to higher education and senior secondary education something that uh, uh, people that uh, are in any way disadvantaged or uh, come from uh, poor family circumstances uh, or have other disability in terms of getting access to education, they just wouldn't have the opportunity. Now, that seems to be what the opposition is really advocating. They've always been uh, hostile to schemes which are built on the principles of equality, fairness and giving everyone the opportunity to get access to education. And there is no greater means for most people, particularly those from working class areas, such as in the western suburbs of Sydney, to get uh, a, a chance to develop and uh, achieve their uh, full aspirations in life than an effective and comprehensive education. And uh, repeatedly uh, we see that being undermined by the sort of approach that the opposition in this place take, and particularly the approach that we've seen uh, the Griner government take in New South Wales. Now, there's a number of uh, salient facts to talk about. Uh, here, and I think uh, some of the most important relate to the fact that under this government, in the time of the Hawke Labor government, the number of people, students completing uh, secondary education has doubled. Uh, certainly in areas such as the western part of Sydney, only one in three, if you are lucky, using the best set of statistics, uh, uh, completed secondary education. It's now two in three. And as well as that, you have the uh, opportunity, or those students now have the opportunity to go on uh, to higher education and they're completing that in, uh, in larger numbers all the time. Of course, that's been largely due to the uh, very significant resources we've devoted to the education uh, portfolio, both in terms of the student assistance schemes and in terms of the number of places we've funded within institutions uh, and the development of new institutions such as the University of Western Sydney. Now, I think everyone would acknowledge that uh, the expenditure on education, indeed some people opposite criticise that there's been such a, an increase in expenditure on education under this government. But what has happened is that for the first time in uh, areas of high growth population such as uh, uh, the western suburbs of Sydney, those students now have uh, higher educational institutions. They're now given those opportunities. Under the Fraser government, the talk of development of a university in western Sydney would have been the furthest thing from their mind. Uh, they just wouldn't have ever contemplated the idea that people from the western suburbs of Sydney would actually uh, desire or seek to go on to uh, university. Well, of course, uh, that campaign has been run and won by the Labor Party to ensure that there was a university there so that you, we could have uh, equal opportunity, we could have access for those students to aspire to, to go on and complete uh, uh, higher education. Now, one of the other salient points, of course, is that uh, there's uh, a wealth of statistics which show that people who've had families where there's been people that have completed university are more likely to have their children go on and complete education as well. And you only develop that sort of uh, uh, ethos as far as the, the opportunity and the development of education by uh, largely people that have families or others who have a commitment uh, to the, the process. And it's only because of development of a university in a geographic area such as Western Sydney you really achieve those objectives. Now, that has meant uh, more resources need to be devoted. It will mean as population increases in uh, Western Sydney faster than anywhere else in, uh, in the urban areas throughout Australia, that more resources have to be de devoted to higher education in that region just to keep up with a, a per capita growth rate. And that will be a challenge for the government, which I'm sure they will uh, match. But what's important in looking at Oz study is to ensure that it is a scheme that does fundamentally promote the principle of fairness. It does fundamentally give opportunities for people who historically would never have got the chance to go on uh, to university, who historically wouldn't have been able to complete secondary education. There were so many disincentives built into the system under the old days, under the system where uh, the question of means wasn't the issue that really determined uh, whether people got assistance or not. It is only fair and equitable if it's a comprehensive uh, set of uh, study arrangements that are put in place. That's what we've done. That's why we recognise the whole area of training is so crucial, and so many of the government's initiatives are directed towards that uh, training 
and uh, skills development. And that's a fundamental part of our whole approach in this area. Now, you compare that uh, with the sort of comment that the uh, member for Wide Bay uh, was talking about, where he suggested the, the changes in this particular legislation was just an att attempt to introduce uh, the Australia card by stealth. That's what he referred to it as. Now, I can't uh, really quite uh, understand how anyone could have the uh, uh, sort of uh, breadth of uh, imagination to come to the conclusion that because you want to ensure that those people who get the Oz study are the ones who are entitled to it, how there is anything fundamentally wrong with that principle, when at the same time the people opposite say that what they would really like to do is introduce vouchers for education, and where they say also uh, repeatedly that there should be massive cuts in uh, uh, the, the fiscal uh, restraint and massive cuts in public expenditure, which is part of their sort of uh, alternative uh, uh, budgetary agenda, how they can actually come to the conclusion that by trying to ensure that the scheme is clean, the, the scheme is, uh, com has uh, adequate compliance, and at the same time does have the opportunity so that everyone who really needs study assistance can get it and can use that uh, uh, financial means to be able to complete uh, their university or a senior secondary education. Now, that's what they're advocating. They're saying they don't want to ensure that it's uh, only those who are entitled to it get it. Uh, that's what the member for Wide Bay is saying. But of course, some of the others say it should be targeted more precisely. Now, there's a fundamental contradiction in the sort of position they're putting and it's something that uh, I think uh, they need to explain as they actually develop a policy which they clearly haven't got in the field of uh, uh, this uh, study arrangement at the moment. Indeed, I've watched the debate go on when the uh, House of Representatives Standing Committee was producing their report. And one of the things that's notable about that, of course, is that uh, that was uh, a debate, apparently, from the opposition where only one or two people participated, yet they all signed their name to the, the document that actually comes out, which doesn't give it a lot of credibility. And the fact that the member for, the fact that the member for Goldstein uh, the fact of the member for Goldstein actually goes through uh, the process of sort of finding every fault he thinks exists in our study suggests that what their real agenda is, what the real agenda of the opposition is, to scrap it all together and so that the people from poor, needy families whose only chance to get to, to uh, complete uh, their education is, uh, from the, as, as the member for Chifley says, from areas like the western suburbs of Sydney, the only chance they get to do it is because there is something of the nature of the Oz study arrangement in place. If you don't have that, they simply don't get an education. And we go back to the old days, presumably, where we say less than one in three of those people can even complete secondary schooling. That was the Fraser government's record. That was their legacy. Not only the, uh, the great rate of unemployment they left us with, but uh, fundamentally the fact that they said that people from anywhere west of uh, Parramatta in Sydney, they really didn't have the right to go on to, uh, to uh, the expectation to go on to university. It wasn't something that they should aspire to. The member for Chifley referred to that earlier in the debate. And it's a shameful uh, set of circumstances to report that people in this place should have the uh, power to determine whether those people who live in areas such as Western Sydney actually get the chance uh, to have a full and comprehensive <laughs> education. And, uh, the other point that needs to be made about this area is we've seen the attack, as I said earlier, by the uh, Griner government in New South Wales on educational opportunity. They paraded it as somehow an attempt to try and improve education standards, yet there wouldn't be a school, there wouldn't be a teacher in any of the western part of uh, uh, Sydney who would, could actually claim, because you've had less teachers, less choices as far as subjects are concerned, less opportunities for students, that somehow that's improved educational standards. It, it more composite classes, as the member for Chifley says. And that's been the sort of attack, that's the sort of a record that the Liberals and the National Parties actually believe should apply in education. Now, these amendments are useful amendments, and what they fundamentally reinforce is the fact that we see uh, the area of uh, education as fundamental to the rights of all students and all young people to have opportunities in life, irrespective of what their family background, their parental background might be, or what the income of the family might be, or their uh, dis relative disadvantage. For those reasons, these amendments are useful, and they should be part of building on the very important initiatives that we've taken in the education field. The question is that this bill be now read a second time, um, and uh, Bendigo. the Honourable Member for Bendigo, and I was Thank just you. checking something. Oh. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, the Student Assistance Amendment Bill seeks to amend the Student Assistant Act 
1973, and the Act constitutes the statutory basis for what we now know as the Ausstudy Scheme. And uh, one of the major provisions in this bill is to provide that assistance will be paid only when students have provided their tax file numbers to the department. The requirement will also apply to parents or spouses if the means test applies to the parents or spouse. It's uh, opportune, I think, to go over a brief part of the history, history of Ausstudy. The present Ausstudy scheme succeeded the old T scheme in 1984. It's always been income tested. However, the assets test for Ausstudy began in January 1989. And the scheme is designed to ensure that those whose parental or personal income is less than 33,000 per annum and whose assets are less than 340,000 are assisted in their quest for further education beyond the age of 16. These income and asset limits are indexed annually. Farmers and small businessmen are allowed to devalue their assets by 50 per cent. Consequently, their net asset value can be approximately 700,000. One of the major problems of the Ausstudy program has been that the Labor government here in Australia has never ever established any clear policy objectives on what they were trying to do with financial assistance for students. And this has been borne out in many ways and uh, none more pointedly than the Rural Inequity Study, which was done by the Bendigo College of Advanced Education, now the University College of Northern Victoria, a report which was done by Dr Doug Lloyd and his colleagues at that institution, an excellent report which highlighted the inequities for rural students in, under the Ausstudy scheme. The government quite successfully tried to suppress this uh, report for many months and would not let this report uh, come to light. However, uh, fortunately one of them found its way into my hands and I was able to read many of the recommendations and the uh, inequities which had been found in that study into the Hansard in this parliament. Many of those issues have been addressed also by the, um, the joint, uh, the sorry, the um, House of Representatives Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training Student Financial Assistance Report, which was tabled in the House on March 1991. And they also identify the matter that I have referred to regarding the government's lack of clear policy objectives for student financial assistance. And it's regrettable that uh, the government did not establish those uh, objectives right from the outset of the Ausstudy scheme because in many areas of Australia, particularly in rural areas, many students uh, have been at a disadvantage for many years in their efforts to seek tertiary uh, education, whether it be in the metropolitan area or whether it be in uh, a, a country-based tertiary institution. And uh, they are, the parents of those students have always faced the additional cost of uh, finding accommodation for their son or daughter in the metropolitan area or in a large country centre so that their uh, children could obtain the advantages of tertiary study. And of course uh, that has imposed tremendous financial pressures on uh, parents and also on the students. So they're already at a disadvantage and of course uh, many of the inequities uh, which were identified in the Rural Inequity Study highlighted uh, the problems that uh, country students had in obtaining access to Ausstudy, uh, particularly when many of the uh, farmers in the rural community uh, had probably uh, what appeared to be uh, large assets, but in fact uh, whilst they looked as though they had substantial assets, their actual income was very, very modest and uh, they were having great difficulty in uh, being able to uh, receive the Ausstudy support which was so necessary to support those students. The changes um, that have been made over a period of time really have not had a, a great deal of impact on 
the way the scheme has been administered. And uh, the standing report, uh, or the committee by the standing, sorry, the report by the Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training uh, highlighted many of the administration problems uh, as a result of uh, a flawed, flawed uh, br blueprint right from the outset of the Ofstudy scheme. One of the things that uh, has happened um, has been the outlays for student assistance, uh, which have grown at a, quite a remarkable rate, and uh, they've grown at about an average annual rate of 6.9 per cent since 8081, and this growth reflects the increasing number of secondary and tertiary students becoming eligible for assistance and the increased maximum rates of allowances as student payments were aligned with employment benefit rates in 1988. In fact, in 1990-91, the budget provided $1.233 billion for student assistance, including $935.8 million for OSS study. What this uh, bill does is it seeks to increase the savings from the administration of the Student Assistance Act and strengthen the safeguards against fraud. And the government uh, estimates, estimates savings to be approximately eight million, seven million from the tax file number requirement and associated package involving data comparison and one million from the restructuring of the data proposal change. What uh, I'd like to mention is some of the issues that the standing committee did find in their recommendations in the report which was tabled in this House. And um, I think that probably the, the situation for rural people uh, is particularly highlighted in recommendation seven. Uh, the committee under the chairmanship of uh, Mr Roger Price MP as chairman and my colleague Mr Bob Charles MP as deputy chairman the recommendation seven recommended that the government examine additional means by which assistance can be provided to rural families to assist with the education of their children, particularly through the introduction of a tapered assets test and the introduction of a rural loan scheme. This highlights the uh, problem that I've been talking about and uh, this report has now been in the parliament for some time now and uh, I still haven't uh, seen any positive action from the government on the implementation of many of these recommendations that are contained in this report. The earlier study that I mentioned, the Rural Inequity Study, also had a number of issues which uh, required government action. Uh, very few of those uh, actions have been taken by the Hawke Labor government to implement some of the improvements to the scheme. There are still many problems in the administration of the scheme and in fact uh, every day in my electorate office in Bendigo we would have several off-study uh, complaints and inquiries even at this point. There seems to be, have been a dramatic uh, lack of training and assistance by the government to the employees of uh, the Department of Employment, Education and Training in uh, performing their task and it's made it very difficult for the employees of uh, DEET to carry out the administration of the Ausstudy program. And I don't uh, cast any blame on the staff. They have been battling under enormous odds. One of the problems has been that they've been absolutely overwhelmed and swamped with inquiries and in fact it got so bad that the staff found that they had to remove the phone from the hook because of the massive number of inquiries that they were receiving and in, in their efforts to try and assist people uh, hopefully that phone service will be improved because it was one of the major issues which was identified in this uh, student financial assistance report by the uh, Employment Education and Training um, committee. Now, what I want to say to the government is have a very close look at the recommendations in that report and start implementing those recommendations because many of them, if they are implemented, will overcome a lot of the problems which are 
currently involved in the off study program. The question is the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Cowan. Speaker. Uh, the shadow minister's remarks in this debate earlier were interesting in their hypocrisy at least. He outlined the opposition's support for education and the principle of broad access to education. He indicated their laudable support for the concept that finance should not be a barrier to such access. History, however, tells a different story on the opposition's support for student assistance and on the opposition's willingness to outlay monies on education places. Our memories on this side of the House are not so hazy that we forget the opposition's attempts, when in government, to reduce the level of student assistance in the form of the Tertiary Education Allowance Scheme, to reduce access to education by students, to increase the charges in such a way as to remove the opportunity of students from lower income families to attend higher education. Under their government, there was no assistance available to high school students to stay on at school or no significant assistance available to high school students to stay on at school and no attempt to bring in the assistance required for them to do so. I'd like to quote to the House a couple of passages from a speech which was made some time ago in this place. It says, I refer government members to a report seeing as we seem to be talking about reports tonight, to a report commissioned by the government which points to the fact that the reason why there has been a continual drift in the view of the committee towards people from more privileged backgrounds getting into universities and colleges has been the decline in the value of the tertiary education assistance scheme allowance and the restrictions in the eligibility for it. The report indicates that the number of students who are not in receipt of any public support at all doubled from 21% to 41% during 1974 to 1979. The report states, in our view, this suggests that the shift in full-time student population towards financing by parents or by themselves has led to a relative decrease in full-time university and CAE students from less privileged backgrounds. That has happened during the term of this government. The cause of that continual regressive shift has been identified as the failure of the government to maintain the value of T's and the eligibility for it. That quote came from the Hansard on 9th of December 1982, and the speaker was John Dawkins, the present minister. He wasn't the minister at that time, needless to say. He also goes on in the same contribution to say, I just want to say that the government has recently been presented with what constitutes an extraordinary indictment of its education policies in relation to declining participation rates in schools and in higher education. The report entitled Learning and Earning might have included the word yearning too, because in this country I'm sure we have an enormous untapped talent which is yearning for an opportunity to participate effectively in the education process. But people are simply not doing so. They are deserting our educational institutions in droves. There is an enormous flight from learning which this government has not begun to appropriately address. We have a serious problem in this country if we are trying to provide the sort of skills which we obviously need and we are, if we are to have any sort of economic recovery anything that means anything to provide the sort of job opportunities for people in the future, we are not going to do it with an undereducated population. I think that that quote indicates that the minister has been consistent in his position on education and trying to establish the principles that would allow for people from low-income families and underprivileged backgrounds to enter the education system in this country at whatever level they choose. I can't say that the opposition has been uh, consistent in the same way and uh, I regret that there is such a situation existing where we're being criticised for in fact opening up the education system in this country. It was Gough Whitlam's Labor government which introduced the student assistant measures outlined in the Parent Act of 1973 and promoted the concept of free tertiary education 
as a means of increasing the access of people from low-income families to education. Now, the House of Representatives Standing Committee did put down, bring down a report in March 1991, and I'll draw the attention of the member who preceded me to the date of that report. It wasn't that long ago for the government to have responded. Um, I was a member of that committee, and I uh, think that most of the members of the committee did take their job very seriously. Uh, we did criticise the administration of Oz study. there's no question about that. It also criticised the absence of clear objectives for the scheme, which would form the basis of any evaluation of the scheme's success in meeting those objectives. It is not that there has never been an objective, rather that the objective seems to have shifted somewhat over time and needs to be restated so as to enable a proper evaluation of its effectiveness. But anecdotal evidence does indicate that it is providing substantial assistance to many people, including young people, who are now able to make the decision to stay on to Year 12 at school. And in the context of Oz study effectiveness, um, I bring the attention of the House to Chapter 2 of that report uh, and indicate that the National Union of Students claimed that one of the basic problems was that there was no historical overview of the Commonwealth financial support to students, sorry, was that there had never been a comprehensive statement by the Commonwealth as to what the policy intentions were for either TEAS or Oz study. But it did appear that when the program was established, its intention was to meet the basic living expenses. And that can be uh, maintained, that position, because the Minister, when introducing the legislation in 1973, observed that student allowances ought to be sufficient to give students the leisure they, to think as they pursued their studies. The Department of Employment, Education and Training believed that the stated objective of, of study was to overcome financial barriers to continuation of secondary and tertiary education by providing income support to financially disadvantaged students undertaking full-time studies and that the specific program goals were to increase overall retention rates in the post-compulsory secondary school years and participation rates in tertiary education and higher education participation rates of the financially disadvantaged. I think those are all objectives which most of the people in this House would agree with. But DEET advised that in order to assess the effectiveness of the Oz study against its objectives, two key areas needed to be considered. The first was that the take-up rate by eligible students and to a lesser extent the coverage of Oz study, and the second was the effect of Oz study on secondary retention and completion rates and tertiary participation rates. So DEET did provide information which in its view indicated that the aim of improving access to education was almost certainly being met. And we did have an appendix in the report which showed that participation rates in all education sectors are increasing and, in fact, accelerated following the introduction of Oz study in 1987. And in recent years, Australia has been experiencing rapidly increasing Year 12 retention rates uh, and completion rates through increases in secondary and ter tertiary and sorry, increases in secondary and tertiary participation rates. Now, those things haven't come about by accident. They have come about through the targeting of Oz study to people on, uh, from families of low incomes. And I know that in my electorate, as in, indeed in the electorate of the Deputy Speaker, uh, we have seen considerable improvements in participation rates of uh, young people attending Year 12 and staying on to Year 12 in high school. And the, the, those sorts of indicators are the indicators we have to look at if we look at the effectiveness of Oz study in assisting people to stay in education. Another indicator of the relative effectiveness of Oz study in achieving its objectives of improving education outcomes is the estimated year 12 completion rate, which is different than the, uh, than the other measure. And one of the graphs in the report also shows that the overall completion rate has increased substantially between 1984 and 1989, going from 43% to 58%, and that these completion rates are clearly increasing for each socioeconomic status level. Those figures are a bit difficult to comprehend in toto, but I think it's important to get them on the record because Oz study is working at least as far as I can uh, tell, and basically 
I and many other members of the committee have no argument with the concept of Ausstudy, only with the difficulty in ascertaining the efficacy of its targeting, <coughs> given those, uh, those reluctances, I suppose, in the past for people to actually establish uh, the objective in an ongoing uh, sense. Like my other colleagues, I would want to see Oz study eligibility criteria made more simple and to ensure that it is directed principally to members of low-income families who might not otherwise be able to continue on to year 12 at high school or to take up the opportunity of technical and further education or university indeed. And uh, I would join with the member for Parramatta in indicating that I believe that Oz study is a fundamental element of the promotion of a fairer society in Australia and commend the uh, bill that we have before us tonight to the House um, in order to assist the administration of Oz study in the future. Thank you. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for McPherson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The uh, Student Assistance Amendment Bill is not of itself uh, particularly uh, momentous. However, it does raise once again the very important issue of student financial assistance. and We have therefore had, uh, uh, during the course of this evening, a full and broad-ranging debate on this very important subject. And I, want to, I want to say to the House that we on this side believe education is absolutely vital. It has, in fact, become, in our view, an absolutely critical policy area in recent times, as we've come to realise how important it is that Australia does, in fact, become an intelligent country. And so for us, we see it as critical. And uh, we see, of course, as we look at the current scheme, many deficiencies. And the Honourable Member for Goldstein has moved an amendment, uh, whilst, uh, which in effect says that what we will support the bill because it does uh, represent some improvements to the scheme. Uh, but nevertheless, we have an amendment before the House which uh, deplores the government's continued mismanagement of education. In particular, in the amendment, we deplore the government's failure to define clear objectives for the implementation and operation of students' assistance programs, the government's failure to administer student assistance programs in a financially responsible manner, and uh, thirdly, the failure of the government to structure and administer student assistance programs so that they operate in a fair and equitable manner. Now, I would hope um, the members of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training, of which the Honourable Member for Cowan was a, mem a member, as she mentioned, would be able to support that amendment. Because if, if the Honourable Member for Cowan and the Chairman who spoke earlier on, the Honourable Member for Chipley and, uh, and others who have spoken in this debate who were on that committee, they, they could not but support that amendment. Because the, um, the, uh, the committee's report clearly condemned our study in, in so many different aspects. Uh, we were faced with an Auditor General's report of 1990, which brought down 124 recommendations, which highlighted many deficiencies in the Department of Employment, Education and Training's administration of our study, including the fact that there were, were millions and millions of dollars in overpayments and the potential for millions and millions of dollars of fraud occurring. And so I challenge the members of that committee, and I even note that the, the Honourable Member for Chifley had the gall to criticise the Vice Chairman of the committee, the Honourable Member for Latrobe, for having the temerity to criticise the, the Minister, the Honourable John Dawkins. Well, I, would, I won't, uh, I won't uh, hold back from criticising him. I've described in this place time after time the number of Dawkins disasters that we've witnessed uh, during the period of time that he's been in office. And I could, I could list them if I had time. I mean, there'd be 20 or 30 on a long list of what I call Dawkins disasters. Mr Deputy Speaker, the current legislation is overdue because it does, in fact, address some obvious deficiencies. And as I say, the opposition supports those measures. However, we reiterate our concern about whether our study is, in fact, going to those who need it most. There's no assurance at all that it is being, in fact, correctly targeted. And that was one of the essential features of the, of the Employment uh, and Training, uh, Education and Training Committee's report, that we were astounded, astounded to find that there were no clear objectives for our study. And because of that, of course, there was no real indication that its effectiveness had ever been properly assessed. And we're talking here about a government program where in 1990 91 
$1.2 billion has been allocated. And there's no guarantee, as far as the committee was concerned, and certainly on our side of the House, as far as we're concerned, that that money is being used effectively. And the Honourable Member for Cowan mentions uh, the fact that the government has, uh, has decided to give our study to secondary students, and uh, the cost of that alone in 1991 is 350-odd is, uh, million dollars, and yet there's no indication at all that it's achieving anything other than adding to the incomes of those families of the, of the children who are getting it. There's no real evidence, there's no hard evidence, in fact, that it's, it's contributing to keeping kids at school at all. And to the extent that they do stay at school, they're staying at school because they're getting off study, but they're not really staying there to achieve anything. They've, uh, they, they tend, in some cases, to be disruptive, and their attendance records tend to be a bit spasmodic. So on the contrary, uh, there's, a, there's a strong suggestion, in my view, coming out in the report that uh, the payment of off study to secondary students is not, uh, is not achieving anything at all, and yet we're talking there about the expenditure of $350 million. Mr Deputy Speaker, there obviously needs to be a very careful reassessment of the whole area of OS study. It's an area of, of, of significant and increasing cost, in, 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 in fact. There is an increasing cost element, and it's vital that the scheme has clear objectives and be properly targeted. Now, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, earlier this evening, uh, the Honourable Member for Goldstein tabled in the House, a report uh, called, or actually a brief, call, uh, for a review of our study, which has been commissioned by the Department of Employment, Education and Training. And I'd like to refer very briefly uh, back to that particular document because it's very interesting. It's very enlightening. For what do we find here? And let's put this in the context of the hollow criticism we've heard from this side of the House that says that the opposition is about destroying our study that the opposition undervalues the importance of student financial assistance. Nothing could be further from the truth, Mr Deputy Speaker. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, we recognise the importance of making sure that everyone has access to education. And people on our side of the House I've heard expressing particular concerns about the problem of access for country, uh, country young people, and that's a particular concern of ours. So we are concerned about making sure that every young person in this country has an opportunity to stay at school to get a proper secondary education and then to have the opportunity to go on and have a tertiary education, whether it be in the TAFE sector or in the university sector. So we are concerned about that and it is an important policy area for us. And as we carry out a substantial review of student financial assistance, I believe that we will bring forward a policy that is credible and workable and fair and equitable and will achieve objectives which we will set for it. But I refer back to this interesting document, this review of our study, for it says, and I quote, uh, in the context that I've outlined, against this background, it is now timely to give consideration to whether the current scheme remains appropriate with or without modifications of some or all of the major scheme parameters or alternatively whether some alternative or modified form of student income support should be introduced. Now isn't that interesting, Mr Deputy, Mr. Deputy Speaker? This is a document uh, that's, that's been provided, it's been tabled by the Honourable Member for Goldstein and it is a brief for a review of our study provided to consultants by the Department of Employment, Education and Training. And it implies through those words that I referred to, that there is a need to review the whole scheme. I'm sure, and there is, as the Honourable Member for La Trobe says, there is a need. The committee said that, the committee of which we're all a member, the members that are in the House at the moment, that was one of our first recommendations. We expressed concern about the lack of objectives, about the concern of adequate measures of effectiveness. And the government's now admitting that in giving this brief to its consultants it says that it is now timely to give consideration to whether the current scheme remains appropriate, with or without modification of some or all, all of the major scheme parameters. So there is, so, that, so it's calling, in, in, in effect, as the member for Goldstein says, for something perhaps completely different. Now we are on this side of the House thinking laterally about the issue. 
We recognise the deficiencies in our study. Our amendment, in fact, uh, of course, uh, hones right in on that when we condemn the government for, for, the, for its failure to define clear objectives for the implementation and operation of student assistance programs. So we are looking for solutions to the problem. We are committed to education. We are committed to making sure that all kids in Australia who want an education can have access to an education. We're serious about that. Mr Deputy Speaker, as the Minister's second reading speech observes, a major provision of this bill is the requirement that students provide their tax file numbers to the department before they receive assistance. In the remaining couple of minutes uh, that I have, I'd like to perhaps sound a note of caution about this process. Putting aside the fact that this will require many students to apply for a tax file number, and that's probably not such a big deal, it does nevertheless raise the broader issue of what the government is attempting to achieve by virtue of its tax file number requirements. Clearly, Mr Deputy Speaker, the original purpose of the tax file number has changed. It's now very much more like a profile number or a Clayton's Australia card. The tax file number has now become a powerful personal identification element and its extension, I believe, should be viewed with caution. And in the context of this particular bill, as we now see uh, the interaction between uh, taxation and social security, and we see that that may have, in this particular case, if it leads to the reduction of fraud and overpayment and detecting people who are ripping off the system, and after all, that should be a very important element of, uh, of, of the monitoring of the program, is to make sure that people are not ripping off the system, um, then there may be some uh, commendable features uh, to using uh, the, that particular process, uh, if it does achieve those objectives. But I believe in uh, sounding this note of warning, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the trend for extending the use of the tax file number may ultimately result in abuse, and I think there's a considerable amount of concern in the community that that may well be the case. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've been uh, very pleased to be able to participate in this particular debate, and I reiterate that for us on this side of the House, education is a priority area. There's no doubt, as far as we're concerned, that if Australia is to become an intelligent country, then greater attention and emphasis must be placed on education. We're strongly committed to coming up with a student financial assistance package which works, one that has clear objectives and one that can be Order. clearly evaluated for its effectiveness. Order. The time allotted for the second reading of the bill has expired. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the Honourable Member for Goldstein has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Oh, the ayes, I beg your pardon, the ayes have it. Uh, the question now is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Student Assistance Act 1973 and for related purposes. Okay. Committee, committee required? Right. Honourable Member Throsby. Uh, is it the wish of the committee to take clauses 1 to 19 together? Yes. Uh, I will allow that. Uh, the question is that the clauses 1 to 19 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, clause 20. Uh, the Honourable Member for Goldstein. Mr Chairman, I want to move the amendments that have been circulated in my name to Clause 20. Um, there are two amendments here. Uh, the effect of them is to uh, delete the... Uh, proposed amendment put forward by the government, which would relieve the government of the uh, necessity to annually report to the parliament separately on the operation of the Student Assistance uh, Act. The uh, proposal that the government is putting forward is that the report on the operation of the Act just, be... In uh, just sorry to interrupt the Honourable Member for Goldstein. You're seeking leave to move your two amendments together. Yes, I am. I take it. Yes. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The, uh, the, the effect of the uh, government's proposal uh, would be to uh, uh, absorb the 
report on the operation of the Act into the annual report of the Department. Uh, this seems to us to be uh, exceedingly undesirable at the present time. Uh, there may be a case for such an absorption at some time, but the student assistance schemes of the government are at the moment under quite serious question. As we've seen throughout this debate, uh, a parliamentary committee uh, has raised uh, questions uh, of the most fundamental kind about the scheme. The government has itself uh, quietly uh, commissioned a, uh, a consultant's report on student assistance, and uh, it is asking uh, in that report that the consultant advise the government on the objectives for student assistance schemes, uh, and has left open the possibility that the report may recommend some scheme that is completely different to the current OS study scheme. So let's hear no more cant from the government about the opposition being dissatisfied with OS study um, and uh, the misleading and dis deceiving statements that are coming from the government side that the opposition wishes to abolish OS study. The government itself has put the future of OS study on the line in commissioning this report from a consultant. Now, under these circumstances, it is important that this parliament receives full and adequate uh, reporting each year on the operation of the government's student assistance programs. And it will not do that, we believe, if this report is absorbed into the annual report of the department. Accordingly, uh, I am moving on behalf of the opposition to delete the government's proposed amendment. The Honourable the Minister. Just on the behalf of the government, the, um, the government really uh, sees the proposal in the bill as set out uh, as being merely a fairly straightforward, common sense streamlining operation. The fact is that the annual report of the Department of Employment, Education and Training is uh, tabled in Parliament that is publicly open to scrutiny before this House. It really makes no practical difference. And uh, really, it's uh, all the practical consequence of it is it produces a small savings to government revenue to actually incorporate the report on the Students Ass Student Assistance Act in into the Department of Employment, Education and Training. Obviously, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the report that will be incorporated will be uh, substantially more than is incorporated in the current report. That's, that is the proposal. However, we uh, don't see this as a a huge matter of principle if uh, rather than have the legislation delayed by a Senate amendment, uh, the government's uh, inclination is to accept the amendment or not to oppose the amendment, even though we think it's uh, fairly pointless. I mean, there's a whole range of things. The, the time uh, oh, allocated okay. uh, has expired. Uh, the question is that the amendments uh, be agreed in the clauses as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say, that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the question now is that the clauses as amended be agreed to. The, uh, those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the, cr the question now is that the remainder of the bill and the clause in the circulated amendments of the government be agreed to and the bill be reported with amendments. And the bill be reported with amendments. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have to report that the House has agreed to the bill with amendment. Minister. I move that the report be adopted. The question is, the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is, the bill will be now read a third time. Uh, the Honourable Member for La Trobe. Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, I thank you very much for this opportunity, brief though it may be, and I congratulate the minister in his common sense in accepting the opposition's recommendation for revision uh, to this legislative uh, uh, bill before the parliament. And it is particularly important that we consider it in light of the information given me, to me today by uh, the minister's minister 
that the DEET, Department of Employment, Education and Training, spends $535 million plus per year in administrative costs. Now, I note that the expense for our study is only some $900 plus million, so more than 50% more than of the amount of money that we spend on student financial assistance in this country is consumed by the bureaucracy. And I have maintained over and over again in this place, and I will continue to do so, that it is an overloaded bureaucracy at both federal and state level that is denying students places in tertiary and secondary education in our country. And access, access, Mr. Deputy Speaker, has become an important and critical issue in this debate about education around our country. We talk constantly about equity, but I maintain again and again there is no equity, no equity without access. Because if you can't get an education, if there are no places available, it matters not whether we provide you with student financial assistance, whether we provide a million teachers, or what other services we provide to our students who want to go on and help contribute to an advanced Australian society if, in fact, they cannot study because of lack of funds and lack of government provision of support services. So, again, there is no equity without access. Once again, I congratulate the minister. I thank the minister for his good common sense, and at least we will continue to have a report in this place by the Department of Employment and Education and Training on this most critical issue, this issue which is of major national importance, and that is student financial assistance. The direction that we are going to take in the future is, of course, now completely up in the air as a result of the minister and the department's paper, which gives to a consultant the opportunity to provide to the government information on the direction we will head in the future. And since we are now to examine the whole issue, that is, how we support our students, then that gives us the opportunity to examine our study, not just for the technical aspects of our study, not just whether or not it's meeting its objectives, but the whole issue of equity and access. And I contend that that debate will rage for some time in this place and in the broader community. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Student Assistance Act 1973 and for related purposes. Clark. Order today number two, copyright amendment bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. The honourable member for Kuyong. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Acting Speaker, I just wish um, there were uh, there were more here this hour of the night uh, to recognise just what this government has done. I have uh, here a folio of uh, a fair representation of the amount of work that's been done on this bit of legislation uh, by my own office and myself uh, to date. This. Uh, is just outrageous, to put it mildly. Quite outrageous that uh, a uh, second reading debate uh, on this measure is being guillotined and that uh, a bill which is uh, taken from uh, at least December 1989, when the previous Attorney General announced by way of press release of the intention to introduce measures of reform, the bill then introduced in October 1990, it's taken until now to be de debated, together with 13 amendments from the government, 13 amendments from the government to its own bill, and the amendments that will be moved from by me, uh, both at the second reading and the committee stage, and we're guillotined in less than two hours on both sides. Indeed, the story is worse than I've mentioned, for in fact the bill stems from a referral uh, to the Copyright Law Review Committee in 1983, which reported in September of 1988. So, in effect, on a measure which has taken nearly eight years to come on for a second reading debate, there is less than two hours to consider the bill, plus the 13 government amendments to its own bill, plus the opposition amendments. And uh, if ever there was an example 
of the disgraceful regard that this executive has to this parliament, it's summed up in this copyright amendment bill. I mean, I regard this as a crucial piece of legislation. It signals a new way forward for those who want to take it. Uh, and there is a little regard being paid to the elements of debate or to the various interests in the community uh, who have an interest uh, in this matter. Now, I get on because I've got to keep my remarks brief on this second reading instead of the normal period of time that the opposition spokesman would have in dealing uh, with this matter. If I am to take the full period allocated to me, namely half an hour, it will leave very limited time for the other speakers to participate uh, in this debate. The Honourable, Member, the Honourable Member for Curtin has put a lot of work into this measure, as, uh, as uh, he so frequently does. He will have to curtail his remarks. Uh, I trust government members will do the same, so that the uh, amendments being moved by both government and committee can at least get some time. Though I envisage that uh, in an hour or so we'll be racing those uh, Re uh, amendments through with hardly any explanation of just what is involved to such a crucial piece of legislation. Well, now, uh, from the opposition's point of view, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Acting Speaker, we introduced in this parliament my predecessor, the Honourable Member for Menzies, who was then Shadow uh, Attorney General, introduced in 1989 a private member's bill which uh, reflected the recommendations of the Copyright Law Review Committee. Had that bill been picked up by the government at that time, we'd have had two years, virtually, almost, of a new legislation in place. But, oh no, further delay with the glacial speed of this government in regard to uh, law reform. Uh, since that measure was introduced by my predecessor, which really represented opposition policy at that time, We've now had the opportunity to consider in detail the later Prices Surveillance Authority inquiry into books. And uh, I have to say that from the opposition's point of view, uh, the Prices Surveillance Authority's uh, inquiry and its report uh, has been accepted by the opposition. The PSA uh, found, of course, against the outmoded protected regime and called for significant deregulation. And uh, in the short time available, I have to say to you that we believe that a concerted effort should be made to implement the uh, PSA recommendations. And I use the term concerted effort because I do recommend that though filled with reforming zeal, as the PSA was, it did tend to gloss over some of the apparent impediments that appear at this juncture to be in the way of the implementation of their recommendations. Um, these impediments at the international uh, level are impediments, uh, are impediments in the way of immediate implementation, and I stress um, the word immediate implementation of the PSA recommendations, but they ought not be impediments uh, uh, through full period of time. These impediments uh, revolve around the GATT Uruguay round, the Berne Convention, uh, for the protection of literary and artistic works and the United States Trade Act. Nevertheless, uh, interested parties, and there are many with many and varied views, should note that we on this side of the House, having had extensive investigation of the matter, are committed to the Price of Surveillance Authority recommendations. I should say also at this point, uh, Mr Acting Speaker, that there are many interests over and above the fundamental interest that we at the end of the day came down in favour of, namely the consumer himself, uh, who assisted me with their views, put them forward, and I'm very, very grateful for that. But I did find it somewhat frustrating at the end of the day in regard to this particular industry that there is, of course, uh, just no uh, consistent viewpoint. The uh, viewpoints are heterogeneous. They reflect the particular vested interest that is speaking to you at the time and in many instances uh, totally conflict one with the other. Um, I will um, be uh, moving an in principle second reading amendment at the conclusion of this speech reflecting our support for the Price of Surveillance Authority. And I should at this juncture foreshadow that I'll be moving amendments in the committee stage to, among other things, extend the bill's operation to other copyright articles. At the end of the debate, however, we will not be opposing the bill before us as it does represent 
some improvement to and opening up of the current closed market, inadequate though the bill is. Mr Speaker, uh, we believe the, uh, the uh, Copyright Law Review uh, Committee's report was qualified and guarded. Perhaps this was inevitable, bearing in mind its composition. By that I don't mean a broad brush attack on uh, those uh, heavily qualified in the law, but generally they approach uh, reform of society and reform of laws um, in a cautious manner, in contrast with what I'll touch on with, uh, as the uh, Process Surveillance Authority. Now, the CLRC uh, faced um, with the uh, question whether it should recommend the complete repeal of the copyright provisions so that there would be an open market for imported publications, which would in effect deny the operation of the Copyright Act, the CLRC decided against such a course. The Price of Surveillance uh, Authority, however, was nowhere near as half-hearted, and its report, I suppose, uh, reads like a libertarian's charter. It recommended the complete abolition of the copyright provisions, which prevent the open flow of overseas published books to Australia. And the PSA also argued that although its recommendations related only to books, the copyright argument applied also to other areas, particularly to sound recordings. And it was later to examine this area and uh, it upheld its earlier views. Well, as I indicated earlier in this succinct appraisal, uh, we support now the uh, PSA recommendations. We believe that Australia should not shirk from seeking the first open market for books in the English-speaking world. Uh, it's disgraceful. The more one reviews this matter, the more firmly is one moved to the conclusion that it is disgraceful that in the latter part of the 20th century, the controls of the colonial past still operate on this country. It is disgraceful that Australians should have delayed for distribution, if at all, books from overseas. It is disgraceful that their availability is at the whim of international publishers. And it is disgraceful, as the PSA report found, that Australian prices are, for example, more than 31 per cent above United Kingdom prices. Now, I don't want to get uh, unduly jingoistic, and I'm just not going to. But no Australian should have to tolerate this. And under us, no Australian will have to tolerate it. I am just not going to wear, and my party is not going to wear, a situation where Australians are denied access as a consequence of a closed market which has uh, its germination in a period long gone. And, uh, not only in terms of the right of consumers, which ought to compel you to this view, but in terms of the industry's own efficiency. If you are fair dinkum about opening up markets, if you are really intent on putting a scythe through protective mechanisms, freeing up systems and embarking on a real charter of microeconomic reform, that alone ought to compel you to the view. And in fact, that may be the overriding view. From my own point of view, I just say to you that I, uh, I now having looked at this at some great length, uh, find it distasteful that Australians just have to tolerate the situation, which has been fine for those on the gravy train, um, who uh, but uh, uh, have to pay through the nose and indeed in some instances can't even pay uh, uh, for the books because they're simply not made available. It's not only an abject, disgraceful aberration so far as consumers are concerned, as I say, it flies uh, also in the face of the need for a more competitive liberal trading program. And it ought to be part of the government's program of microeconomic reform, but of course it's not. Um, mercifully, however, it's part of ours. They are, however, making some changes, and as I say, the bill will therefore uh, be supported by us after we seek to move various amendments, because it is certainly an improvement. Uh, awkward compromise though it may be between the CLRC and the PSA and uh, I would say the Minister has probably struggled manfully as I have with all the representations and all the detail of this intricate area and I'm sure because of the respect I have for him that he's wanted at the end of the day at the very least to do something better for consumers 
even if his government's not prepared to embark on the programs of microeconomic reform that we would. Nevertheless, awkward though the compromise is, we will be supporting the bill that he has uh, presented. Um, this problem, of course, has been with us a long time, and it's really up to this parliament to correct it. And as I say, a small step is taken in that direction with this legislation. And in terms of um, how long it's been, I mean, I refer to a uh, High Court case fairly recently, I mean, back in 1977, but in terms of the colonial vestiges and appendages that are still binding us in this present moment, um, it goes way back further than that. But in 1977, in the um, leading case of Interstate Parcel Express Company Proprietary Limited and Time Life International uh, bracket Netherlands closed bracket uh, BV, a report of which can be found in volume 138 of the Commonwealth Law Reports at page 534, the High Court uh, found that reliance upon the importation provisions by copyright owners may give rise to concerns of the type that I've been discussing. For example, at page 555 of the report, we find Mr Justice Stephen, as he then was, saying, and I quote, there is then no novelty in the view that direct infringement of copyright results from the importation of material which, until imported, infringe no copyright and may indeed have originated with the plaintiff copyright owner. Any undesirable economic or cultural effects which some may discern as flowing from this aspect of copyright protection are a matter for the legislature." End of quote. Absolutely correct, and the legislature is taking some steps uh, here this evening. And that's the task, therefore, that we're charged with tonight. We're going about the task after having had the benefit of considering the data, findings and recommendations that have been produced by the various inquiries. I reiterate that uh, had Mr Brown's bill been picked, had, had uh, the Honourable for Menzies' bill uh, been supported by the government, we would also have had the benefit of some practical experience of reform over a 18-month, two-year period by now. And before concluding in this limited time, I think I'd just uh, like to note that it's interesting that uh, in the Time Life bookcase, the late Mr Justice Murphy also intimated that there was a need for reform in this area. However, rather than modifying the level of protection offered by the importation provisions, which is what we are advocating uh, here, Mr Justice Murphy thought it would be more appropriate to seek redress in the provisions of the Trade Practices Act. Now, I'm not proffering this viewpoint with a strong degree of support uh, because, as I say, I think we've got to have an onslaught on the levels of protection. But it was interesting that he addressed this particular area in the following way. For at page 561 of the report, uh, His Honour indicated that it should be incumbent upon copyright holders who choose to rely upon the importation provisions to first, and I quote, demonstrate that the Trade Practices Act was not being breached that the public interest was not being injured and that the enforcement of copyright by the relief sought would not be used to breach the Act or injure the public interest." End of quote. Mr Justice Murphy um, made these comments after finding that the evidence in that case suggested, and I quote, that the Australian public will suffer if the respondents, that is the copyright owners, succeed, that the copyright is being used to manipulate the Australian market and that the respondents will control the outlets and the price to the public will almost be double it. And the Australian public will have delayed access to publications freely available in the United States." End of quote. An interesting view and uh, comments, of course, that are akin uh, to those that I've made in regard to, to the closed market. Now, uh, uh, Mr Acting Speaker, I feel bound, regrettably, to curtail my remarks on this extraordinarily important bill. I think honourable members are aware that I do give a lot of thought and detail to second reading speeches uh, on the significant legislative changes. And again, I, uh, I end as I began, that it is this disgraceful implementation of a guillotine that requires this, if other members are also to have a say, and if the government itself is able to make the amendments that are necessary uh, to its view. So I'm curtailing my remarks because of the guillotine in the hope that there will be time adequately to deal with amendments at the committee stage. And I move the amendment to the second reading circulated in my name. Thanks. Order. Is the amendment Thanks. seconded? The amendment is seconded. The honourable member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, the need for access and availability of textbooks is an integral part of furthering one's education, and I am pleased to stand and speak in support of the legislation which, amongst other things, will do much to free up the supply of textbooks to Australia's students. I believe this claim can be made competently, given the detail of the two reports which immediately preceded the drafting of the legislation, these being the Copyright Law Review Committee's investigation September 1988 into the importation provisions of the Copyright Act 1968 and the inquiry, into late, in the inquiry in late 1989 by the Price Surveillance Authority into book prices. The Principal Copyright Act of 1968 impacts upon many facets of our education system, from the block monies required by schools to be paid to publishers, from the multiple copying, uh, copying, copying of um, certain texts to the amounts incorporated in the cost of imported textbooks that have a tendency to make them restricted to the reader, both through the relatively high cost and the limited numbers imported. More recently, the importance of the Price Surveillance Authority in protecting the Australian consumer has been displayed with monitoring of petrol prices during the Gulf conflict and a detailed investigation of the prices of musical recordings in Australia. Significantly, though, it was just as important that the Authority's interim report into book prices set the scene in August 1989 for considerable pub public debate on the future of Australia's book market. Amongst the conclusions contained in the PSA's final report in December of that year was the welcome by the authority of how this had broadened public understanding of how the book market actually worked. Interestingly, the investigation by the Price Surveillance Authority preceded a number of other calls for intervention in the price of books, price of books in Australia, amongst them investigation by the Trade Practices Commission in 1972, which rejected calls for the retail price maintenance of books. A quote from the Trade Practices Commission at that time is very pertinent to the legislation we are debating here tonight. The most, and I quote, the most obvious form of competition is price competition, particularly in industries where quality or product is fairly uniform. Keen retail price competition promotes efficiencies, uh, penalises the inefficient and generally means lower prices for consumers, unquote. And it is with this background that the government has arrived at the Copyright Amendment Bill before us which will see a fairer deal for consumers of books in Australia. This has been achieved with due regard to the domestic publishing industry, ensuring that they won't be severely disadvantaged. This provision is encompassed in the, in the proposed section 44A2 that gives effect to the government's decision to enable a person to import a non-infringing book into Australia for commercial distribution where the book was not able to be supplied by the copyright owner for a period of at least 90 days. There exist stringent protection conditions that need to be adhered to before exclusion from copyright infringement can be granted. The person importing the book must have ordered in writing from the copyright owner or the copyright owner's agent or licensee one or more of the relevant versions of the book. I point out here the important distinction from the consumer's standpoint between a version and an edition of the same book, for if there are two different uh, paperback editions of the same book, either would qualify as a paperback version of the book. It's also a condition that the copies ordered must not be second-hand copies or more in number than are needed to satisfy the person's reasonable requirements. To prevent the illicit importation of books at the time a person orders an imported copy of a book, the written order to the copyright owner or agent or, lic or licensee must not have been withdrawn or cancelled by the person. Further along this track, the copyright owner, licensee or agent, must not have filled the person's written order and, and, and there must also have been at least 90 days lapsed since the person placed the order. So as not to prevent the uh, free trade, once these conditions have been met, it is proposed in the bill that it not be considered to be an infringement of copyright to sell or otherwise commercially deal with the book in Australia. Given the outcries from the Australian publishing industry, whenever the suggestion of a relaxing of the copyright regulations have been moved in the past, it is only natural that the measures of this legislation, aimed at giving the consumer a fairer go, would receive some attention. It needs to be stressed, though, that the government has, been, has given due regard to the domestic publishing industry and the booksellers, as is again reflected in section 44A5 of the bill. This section proposes that an order will only be considered to be filled when the copyright owner, licensee or owner, has, has sent to the person who placed the order the full number of copies ordered. What this prevents is someone unscrupulously attempting to 
to import books for phantom orders that bring about unfair competition against the Australian publishers, but it also ensures that booksellers' orders are fulfilled in total and on time. In regard to the bigger protection picture, publishing is no different from any other industry. Often the local market to a, uh, to a Opening the, open the local market to a flood of overseas publications, in the short term, consumers pick up a few cheap buys. But in the long term, however, Australian publishers would fold up, into, would fold up causing great economic disruption to an industry that the Price of Arts Authority found to be worth more than $1 billion a year. Such a scenario would also close the door to many lesser-known Australian writers, an outcome totally impalpable to those on this side of the House. Over the years, our literary talent has become known the world over, and this is something that we as Australians are extremely proud of. It would, not be, it would not be the wish of the government to have in place a system of copyright regulations which prevented the next Henry Lawson, Banjo Patterson, Colleen McCulloch or Thomas uh, um, Keneally making their, uh, from making their first break. Our literary history is very much part of a heritage, uh, so much so when we mention uh, the name of Henry Lawson, particularly for those people on this side of the House, uh, when we celebrate the uh, centenary of the Australian Labor Party and all the great works that Henry Lawson actually wrote for the, uh, uh, for, the Labor, uh, for the Labor movement in its early days. But there's something unique about our writings that makes Australian people from, make, makes people from outside stand up and say, that's Australian, and, and makes them want to explore the other facets of this country which can always encourage people to come to Australia to our shores and certainly boost some of our other industries. Of the scenario that would comfort, uh, confront the less confront the lesser known Australian writer should the market be open too widely, the plight was perhaps best expressed in a letter published in the Financial Review, 31st of January 1990, by Ms. Gail Cork, um, Cork uh, the Executive Officer of the Australian Society of Authors, referring to the comments of more renowned authors on the issue of copyright. And the letter reads in part, and I quote, did it not occur to the journalists writing the story that, that they were name authors from journalists hounded for, for comment throughout this debate? Of course, their voices were heard above the rest. They are public figures. In fact, the average author who has only achieved publication in Australia stood to lose far more than with those with international reputation and, and, a, and a heavyweight agent standing guard over their interest. The loss of publishing opportunities in Australia, for one thing, would have dealt a severe blow to new and moderately successful Australian authors." Unquote. I say confidently that the outcome for lesser known Australian writers via the Copyright Legislation Amendment Bill is one that gives them a far more secure future than they may have once feared. There is also the issue of Australia's international reputation as a credible and trustworthy nation, specifically in regard to our signature to the Berne Copyright Convention of 1886. This convention commits, every, commits each signatory country to providing copyright protection for works published in all other signatory countries. In the, in the publishing area, as in, as in other areas, Australia has a fine reputation in the international arena for its adherence to and tangible support for, worth, for worldwide um, conventions. Be, um, be it far from the world of books, our involvement in the United Nations International Task Force in the Middle East is recent proof of our commitment to this end. Involvement which we are showing to the world that we are prepared to back up our signature with tangible support through Australia's involvement in removing the destruction of chemical weapons facilities uh, presently going on in the Middle East. The government's recognition of the principles of the Berne Convention of 1886 in this bill, uh, while at the same time having due regard for the Australian publishing industry and our future writers, shows that the government has given proper consideration by, by members on this side of the House to Australia's present and future copyright requirements. This is clearly seen in the outcome, which, uh, which overcomes consumer access difficulties, makes for a sustainable future for the domestic publishing industry, and creates an environment in which authors can devote all their resources to the thing they do best, and that is writing. I believe the issue of copyright often involves a difficult balance between the rights of copyright owners who have invested time, money, originality and creativity in a particular piece of work, and the right of the public to access to their works in a reasonable time and at a reasonable cost. It is a difficult task to achieve this balance in all cases, but I believe the amendments before us here have done just that, and I commend the legislation to the House.
Order. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the Honourable Member for Kuyong has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for Curtin. Mr Deputy Speaker, the bill provides for the partial deregulation of the importation provisions for books in the Copyright Act. This legislation has been a long time coming, as the Honourable Member for Kuyong has already pointed out. Despite the overwhelming evidence that British publishers and their Australian subsidiaries were abusing the monopoly rights conferred on them under the existing Act of 1968, it was not until 1983 that the Commonwealth subjected these provisions of the Act to an examination by the Copyright uh, Law Review Committee. That committee, as we've already been told, reported in September 1988. But it wasn't until the Prices Surveillance Authority handed down the final report of its inquiry into book prices in December of 1989 that we uh, saw moves towards this legislation, which we're now finally debating. After all this time, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, considerable public debate, the legislation is notable more for what it doesn't achieve rather than for any impact it might have on the market for uh, books uh, 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 published overseas and, uh, and sold in Australia. For a start, it fails to amend identical provisions relating to the importation of sound recordings, which have seen Australians paying outrageous monopoly prices for compact discs records and cassettes. This is despite the existence of an excellent and thoroughgoing examination of this question by the Prices Surveillance Authority in a report handed down, or in the report handed down last December. It's ridiculous that we should amend the Act for one product when the same provisions are producing identical results with other copyright materials that have also been the subject of a detailed report by a government authority. It's a wasted legislative opportunity, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the part of a government that rams legislation through the House, as it is tonight under the guillotine, on the pre pretext of uh, limited sitting hours. The provisions of this bill are essentially the recommendations of the Copyright Law Review Committee's report of 1988. The committee recommended that the importation of an overseas published book should be deregulated only in the case of the copyright owner failing to make that book available in Australia after a reasonable time. This bill provides that the copyright owner will retain exclusive distribution rights over any books that are first published within Australia, as well as those that are first published overseas but then published in Australia within 30 days. However, booksellers will be able to import directly books for commercial distribution where the Australian copyright owner can't supply those titles within 90 90 <coughs> days of a written order. Parallel imports can continue until such time as the copyright owner fulfils any outstanding order. The principal effect of this bill could be to make overseas published works available in this country much sooner than at present, and to that extent it's welcome. This will end the situation where Australians have had to wait months for overseas titles to be released here, which has turned Australia into something of a, a, a literary backwater over recent years. It's clear, however, that this bill will have only a marginal impact on book prices in Australia. Copyright owners need only to ensure the timely distribution of books within Australia in order to retain their exclusive distribution rights under the territorial distribution of copyright that's been organised between British and United States publishers. United Kingdom publishers, when obtaining publishing rights, have, it seems, always existed on agreements that give them exclusive rights to distribute their, in their traditional markets, and that includes Australia. UK publishers can then 
price discriminate between different countries because the ban on parallel imports prevents international arbitrage on the part of booksellers. Because Australia's, uh, Australians are, are great book lovers, we purchase more books per capita than any other country in the world. The demand for books in this country is relatively unresponsive to price. This allows British publishers to charge much higher prices for books in Australia than they do elsewhere without adversely affecting their total unit sales. There's also evidence to suggest that British publishers engaged in formal collusion to, to, to set roughly equivalent prices for books which are close substitutes for one another, further restricting competition. With imported books constituting over half the retail value of the Australian market, the effects of these pricing arrangements in this country are of course considerable. To cite evidence relevant to, to my own constituency, a study of book prices in Perth conducted by the Department of Library and Information Studies at Curtin University found an average 52 per cent markup on the overseas public prices. That's over the overseas published prices for the same works. This bill therefore fails to alleviate what the Prices Surveillance Authority has accurately described as a tax on our cultural enrichment. As far as this legislation is concerned, the two PSA inquiries into book and sound recording prices might well not have happened. In adopting the recommendations of the Copyright Law Review Committee, the government has ignored the important criticisms, criticisms that, uh, that were made of its report by the PSA and the overwhelming evidence the PSA brought to bear on the subject. The government appears to have caved into the demands of Australian publishers and Australian authors for protection against foreign competition to the detriment of Australian readers. The minister claimed in his second reading speech that uh, the influx of cheap overseas books produced for much bigger domestic markets would threaten economic loss to both Australian publishers and Australian authors if the PSA's recommendations were adopted. If this situation were in fact to eventuate, then it would be highly desirable from the standpoint of many consumers, Mr Deputy Speaker. In the case of publishers, the economic loss referred to is the loss of monopoly profits that are gained at the expense of community, uh, consumers. In the case of Australian authors, the Minister's anticipation of losses can only be considered something of an insult to their literary talents. It implies that their work is an, of an inferior quality that needs to be protected by higher prices from imported books by foreign authors. Admittedly, Australian authors, to the extent that they are accurately represented by the Australian Society of Authors, share the Minister's sentiments. These writers apparently have no confidence in their ability to compete with overseas authors. The Australian Society of Authors has no qualms about depriving Australians of affordable access to the literature of the world, thus turning Australia into a culturally introspective and somewhat parochial literary backwater. The Minister claims that consumers would uh, suffer from the decline in, in, in distinctively Australian literature in a fully deregulated import market. But what is the literature worth if Australians have expressed a preference for imported books? And by what right does the government establish itself as the guardian of our literary tastes? That literature should be viewed in such chauvinistic terms, Mr Deputy Speaker, is entirely inappropriate. Literature should not be held hostage to national boundaries. Rather, it should foster a cosmopolitan and international appreciation of cultural life. It's deeply ironic that intellectuals who so often set themselves up as opponents of the state and of property rights should run to the government for protection for their publishers' exclusive rights when faced with potential competition from overseas writers and what they fear will prove to be a more highly sought-after product by Australian readers. 
It's extremely ironic that our left-wing intellectuals should suddenly become defenders of the monopoly profits of British publishers and their Australian subsidiaries. Such are the double standards of our taxpayer-funded literary establishment. One might be forgiven sus for suspecting that there is a hidden agenda to this bill with the, the government seeking to buy off sections of the Australian intelligentsia for the purposes of the next election by saving them from the PSA's recommendation and greater competition. As the Sydney Morning Herald noted in an editorial of the 6th of January last year, when this bill was first mooted, plainly Mr Bowen's compromise reform is designed to shut up the authors and publishers in the period before the next election. Well, there's always another election around the corner, Mr Deputy Speaker. With the music industry, where the government has initiated Austrade funding ex uh, assistance, it's continuing to protect monopoly distribution rights in sound recordings through the provisions of the Copyright Act. The Treasurer's support for the record industry is well known. And if press reports uh, are to be believed, Senator Richardson has also been captured by the Record Industry Association, a very powerful ally indeed. It's interesting to contrast that with the ACTU, which argued strongly at the PSA inquiry for the abolition of, mon of monopoly in sound recordings. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's been suggested that the protected in and inflated profits of British publishers are used to help develop marginal first-time Australian authors. The element of risk inherent <coughs> in publishing means that successful titles will inevitably end up subsidising less successful works. That's the way it goes. But nobody's asking publishers to publish books on anything other than a commercial basis. We have every reason to believe that the interest of publishers in Australian authors is based purely on the profits they expect to gain from publishing their work. The publishers have provided no evidence whatsoever that they willingly engage in the systematic cross-subsidisation of marginal Australian authors. If the government wishes to assist Australian authors, it should subsidise them directly through the Australia Council or similar bodies, rather than conferring monopoly profits on foreign publishers in the faint hope that some of those profits might benefit Australian literature. There are many industries which don't have access to monopoly profits that nevertheless invest in new and innovative products on the basis of anticipated future returns. This is an, egg, an integral part of entrepreneurship and there's no reason why publishers or the record industry should be given special consideration. The government should recognise the extent to which these monopoly profits conferred on overseas publishers have prevented the emergence of independent Australian publishers. Higher book prices have acted as a tax on the consumption of literature in Australia to the detriment of overall market size from which Australian authors derive a large part of their income. There has been some concern expressed at the possibility of overseas e editions of works by Australian authors being remainded and then dumped on the Australian market. This is something which would not be covered, as I understand it, by anti-dumping legislation, since it uh, couldn't be said to result in material uh, injury to a particular industry. Well, without getting into the debate about the merits or demerits of dumping, it's worth noting that this is a matter that could be easily addressed by contractual means if Australian authors were not so beholden to their monopolistic publishers. Many of the problems faced by Australian authors are the result of their relationships with their publishers and have nothing to do with the importation provisions attached to the Act. As the PSA argued in its final report, it would be inappropriate to try and solve the problem by perpetuating a system which serves mainly to boost publishers' profits. Rather, the solution must lie in the contractual relationship of authors and publishers. It also needs to be said that most Australian authors don't have an international readership. 
Most Australian writing is for the Australian market, for which foreign authored, book, authored books are not close substitutes. The views of the Australian Society of Authors, therefore, don't reflect the interests of most Australian writers. The provisions of this bill, which provide for the more, readily availabil more ready availability of overseas published works, will also result in major losses of consumer benefits through greater administrative costs. Potential importers will have to establish the lack of availability of each title by having placed a written order with the Australian copyright owner who's allowed 90 days to fill the order. If the copyright owner fails to fill the order, the importer will then face further costs, given that orders for imports will also have to be placed in writing with another publisher before being granted exception from copyright infringement. After all this effort, the copyright owner may then re-establish monopoly rights simply by supplying the market at a later date. It's noteworthy, Mr Deputy Speaker, that under the existing law, books and sound recordings can be freely imported by individuals for non-commercial purposes, and that this bill further provides that booksellers can do this in response to requests from, requests from individual customers. Many people purchase their books and records directly from overseas because even with exchange rate differences and shipping costs, it's cheaper and quicker to import them direct from an overseas supplier than to pay monopoly prices here in Australia. One United States supplier, Book Call, operates a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week fax service which can fill Australian orders within a week. In the case of compact discs, their small size and lightweight means that they can be posted extremely cheaply enabling Australian consumers to enjoy far cheaper prices available from record stores overseas. All this entails some very unwelcome consequences for our balance of payments as Australian consumers increasingly discover that they don't have to contribute to the monopoly profits of overseas publishers and record companies simply by buying overseas instead of in Australia. The minister referred to developments in the, copyright, in the copyright law of other countries in justifying the inadequacies of, uh, of uh, the bill as it is at the moment. If other countries wish to restrict the access of their customers to the cultural products of the world, then that is a lamentable development, Mr De Deputy Speaker, but not something which Australia should, should emulate. But what the minister seems to ignore in the case of the UK, for the example, is that being a net exporter of books puts it, the UK, in a completely different position to that of Australia, which is a net importer of books and therefore stands to suffer considerably at the hands of restrictive importation practices in copyright laws, whereas the UK stands to benefit. This bill is yet another example of failed microeconomic reform, as the, as the Honourable Member for Kuyong has already said. To quote the PSA report into the prices of sound recordings, restrictions on parallel imports are most unusual and extreme by the standards of modern international trade policy around the world, and they almost totally insulate the industry from the effects of macroeconomic policy and place a greater burden on the rest of Australian industry, which consequently has to face a larger burden of adjustment than otherwise. The industry's prices are therefore in need of change as part of the agenda of microeconomic reform in Australia. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the Honourable Member for Kuyong in, in the amendment, amendment he has moved, and I do so wholeheartedly. Order. The immediate question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Attorney General. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, as the uh, uh, member for Kuyong indicated, uh, this is in a sense a compromise between uh, uh, the Copyright, Copyright Law Reform Committee and the PSA report. And of course, as been pointed out, it's not easy uh, to balance all of the interests because there are interests, of course, of Australian uh, writers uh, 
Australian publishers and, of course, uh, consumers. Uh, the member uh, for Curtin, if I could just deal with some of the matters that he raised first, Mr Deputy Speaker, said that uh, uh, this bill in fact caved in uh, to the interests of Australian writers and publishers to the detriment of Australian readers. It's worth, I think, coming back uh, to what this bill is all about. What the intention of the bill is, is to make books, both hardbacks and paperbacks, uh, available to Australian consumers more quickly and uh, for cheaper prices. And the means uh, to bring that uh, about is uh, or will be the improved uh, availability which will result from three main changes in this area. Copyright owners' existing uh, control over commercial importation of copies of their works will be lost, that is, anyone will be able to import books uh, of their works for sale in Australia, one, uh, unless new overseas titles are published simultaneously, that, in with, that is, within 30 days in Australia, that's section 44A1 and 112A1. Secondly, if copies of any title uh, is unavailable from the copyright owner for more than 90 days, section 44A2 and 112A2. And three, to satisfy customers' orders uh, for single copies of books at any time, section 44A3 and 112A3. Cheaper prices uh, should result from allowing anyone to import paperback versions of a book available in Australia uh, only in hardback if the copyright owners won't supply paperbacks for more than 90 days. I think, therefore, the, the uh, points raised by the member for Curtin, <laughs> uh, whilst I note what he's got to say, I think it's, it's just incorrect, and that the bill goes a good deal further than I think the mem member for Curtin has acknowledged. It certainly goes further than the copyright, copyright law reform uh, recommendations uh, and adopts uh, the PSA report in part. Uh, and in saying that, uh, I uh, move to one example of that. The, the loss, or the crucial example of it, the loss of import control uh, if a new overseas title is not published in Australia within 30 days exceeds the CLRC recommendations and leans in the direction uh, of the PSA. And I think that that was also implicitly acknowledged uh, in the contribution by the member for Kuyong. Yes, my, I, I agree with you. My, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. May I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, uh, this has been an extremely uh, difficult bill. And as the member uh, for Kuyong pointed out, um, the government decision, uh, subject to amendments uh, to be moved tonight, was announced in December '89, and all of the amendments uh, to be, which have been foreshadowed uh, have arisen from discussions with booksellers, publishers, authors and other interested parties. The bill came in in October 1990, uh, eight months ago, and there has been considerable discussion throughout that period uh, with uh, all interested parties, including um, the shadow attorney and his office, and uh, I think that that uh, led to, uh, to some extent, to the fact that whilst uh, there are amendments to be moved by the opposition, and there was in fact, uh, in addition to the amendments to be moved in committee, which have been foreshadowed, uh, there was also the second reading amendment, but at the end of the day, uh, the opposition are saying that this is a big improvement uh, on where we have been. And uh, I think that uh, to the extent of that limited uh, bipartisanship, uh, that's a good thing uh, and something which we probably don't see enough of. In respect of the second reading amendment moved by the member for Kuyong, um, he seems, I think, in that motion uh, to be asking for basically two things. The first is he calls for Australia to promote a uniform regime in the GATT, and secondly, uh, seeks 
clarification uh, or amendment of the Berne Convention and Universal Copyright Convention. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, in relation to both of those matters, uh, we're already uh, uh, moving uh, very strongly in that area, that is the question of a uniform regime in the GATT, and uh, I can assure the member for Kuyong uh, that that activity uh, started uh, at uh, the beginning of this Uruguay GATT round, the current round. And uh, I can further assure him that uh, if he didn't have uh, a, an ambition, which I sometimes wonder why anyone would have it, to want to be Attorney General, he may find the delights of uh, arguing intellectual property in the Green Room in Geneva, something which would uh, uh, cure his interest in this matter, I think, fairly quickly. But I think that it is not correct to say that uh, to be moving an amendment that we pursue the international negotiations by con contracting parties to the General Agreement uh, on Tariffs and Trade, because that is being done. Uh, it has been done vigorously and, in fact, has been done throughout the whole uh, of this round of the Uruguay negotiations. Also, this country uh, has been extremely active uh, in uh, both uh, Bern and VCC meetings, and uh, we will be attending uh, meetings of Bern exports on a possible protocol to the Bern Convention. So whilst I understand what the opposition are uh, uh, saying in the, uh, in the second reading amendment, the fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I think both of those matters are being more than adequately dealt with by uh, the present government, um, irrespective of what uh, the views opposite may be. Mr Deputy Speaker, the member for Kuyong uh, also spent some time on the fact that uh, there is going to be a very limited amount of time uh, for debate this evening and also the, um, particularly the uh, committee stages. And uh, uh, I understand uh, his concern about that. And in order to assist uh, with his agreement in respect of the way we conduct this debate this evening, uh, I just propose at this stage, Mr Deputy Speaker, to uh, touch on uh, the amendments which have been uh, circulated uh, in my name uh, at, rather than continue uh, my remarks at this stage uh, in closing the second reading debate. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, I take the opportunity uh, of presenting the explanatory memorandum uh, amendments to be moved on behalf of the government. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, as honourable members will be aware uh, this bill has been the subject of very close examination, as I indicated earlier, uh, by the government and interested parties and, uh, as I also said, by uh, the shadow attorney uh, and uh, his staff. These amendments that the government uh, have circulated tonight are the result of that detailed examination and I believe that the amendments are to be moved, there are 13 amendments, as the member for Kuyong uh, pointed out, uh, will greatly enhance the operation of the scheme. Amendment uh, number one confines the countries from which books may be imported uh, to member countries of international conventions to which Australia is a party and other countries which enforce Australian copyright under section 184 of the Act. This amendment is at slight variance with the original government decision uh, because that decision only referred to overseas countries that were members of the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works. And uh, we believe it's necessary to include uh, member countries of other cop copyright conventions to which Australia is a party, namely the Universal Copyright Convention and our recently concluded bilateral agreement with Singapore. Uh, these, this amendment uh, also leaves open the possibility of adding further countries uh, from time to time. The amendment also prevents the importation of books made under a compulsory licence in another country so that such books will not be able to be imported into Australia without the permission of the copyright owner. 
The reason for this is that uh, this, this is proposed as a consequence of a concern that compulsory licences are available to developing countries under the Berne Convention and permit them in certain circumstances to make copies of works of, uh, of foreign copyright owners without their permission, but forbid exportation of books so made uh, to other countries. And this proposed amendment will ensure importation uh, into Australia of such copies uh, is prevented. Mr. Because of the time available, Mr. Um, Deputy Speaker, the, there are various amendments which are linked. Amendments 2, 5, 6, 8, 11 and 12. These proposed amendments are largely consequential upon other amendments and do not involve any change of policy. The introduction of the new defined expression overseas works, that's amendment number two, and overseas edition, amendment number eight, uh, are, I believe, an improvement in the direction of plain English. Amendments five and 11 are consequential upon the introduction of those expressions. I move to amendments three and nine. These amendments will substitute a reworded section 44 capital A2 and section 112 capital A2, respectively, in the bill. And the rewording is consequential upon the substitution of the new expression overseas work and overseas edition and are the subject of the new definition introduced by amendments 7 and 13. More importantly, Mr Deputy Speaker, section 44A2D1 and its mirror provision for published editions, which is section 112A2D1, are new provisions which have been inserted as a result of what we found to be a convincing submission by the Australian Book Publishers Association, the Australian Copyright Council and the Australian Society of Authors. Under, this, under the present bill, a bookseller must wait 90 days before importing backlist books. It's now proposed that if a publisher or his or her agent cannot confirm ability to supply within seven days of receipt of the order, a bookseller may proceed to import from elsewhere without having to wait the 90 days. I believe that if a publisher is in fact uh, able to advise that it cannot supply uh, the market with a certain book, then a bookseller should be able to import from elsewhere without having to wait 90 days. In my view, this would work to the advantage of both the industry and consumers, as booksellers would be more certain about when they would be able to import and books would become available in Australia more readily. As this change has the support of the publishers, I do not envisage there would be any opposition to it. And I am inclined to think, Mr Deputy Speaker, that that may not have been something which had been picked up uh, by the member for Curtin before his contribution this evening. <coughs> the final uh, um, set of amendments, amendments uh, four and 10 uh, and 7 and 13. In respect of 4 and 10, these amendments will prevent the importation of copies of a hardback version of a book where the copyright owner, although unable to fill an order for copies of that version of the book or published edition, can supply copies of the paperback version. The possibility of dumping, uh, another matter referred to by the member for Curtin, of uh, remainder hardbacks was viewed by the uh, ABPA to operate against the protection of paperbacks by Australian authors. Whilst the original government decision referred to treating hardback and paperback versions of books as separate articles, uh, I must say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I have been uh, completely persuaded by the ABPA that the bill as drafted would work against the interest of Australian authors when hardback versions of their work could be imported at a lower price than the local uh, paperback. Uh, finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, in respect of uh, Amendments 7 and 13, these amendments clarify by the new definition of overseas work and overseas edition that the right to import copies of new titles published overseas does not arise until the expiration of 30 days uh, from the first publication overseas or at all uh, if the title is published in Australia within that period. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, I do not uh, uh, propose to uh, take any further time in uh, summing up this debate because of the, the fact that, as the member for Keong has indicated, there are uh, difficulties of time in respect of the, uh, the amendments to be moved uh, in committee. Uh, and uh, I thank those who have contributed to the debate, and particularly from our side, uh, the member uh, for Oxley uh, and uh, those on the opposition side. And I hope that uh, some of the matters raised by the member for Curtin, uh, whilst I understand what he was on about, I think that in fact uh, I have probably, uh, I hope, answered to his satisfaction some of his concerns. Order. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the Honourable Member for Kuyong has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that this bill be now read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Copyright Act 1968. Is a committee required? Committee required, Mr Neil. The question is that clause one be agreed to. All those of the opinion say aye, those of the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Honourable Member for Kuyong. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, um, as the Attorney General has implied, and I think uh, I mentioned in my second reading speech, there are a significant number of amendments I wish to move over and above the amendments 13 and all that the Government is moving. Um, and I foreshadowed that in the second reading debate. I formally move Amendment 1, which has been circulated in my name. That would be clause a new 1A in the bill. The bill is silent as to the commencement date. And by the provision of the Act's Interpretation Act, the bill is to commence 28 days after the day on which it receives the Royal Assent. Well, this amendment of mine um, seeks to extend the commencement date so that it is three months after the day of royal assent. Now, even though I criticised the government for being so slow in this arena, and I think there is justification for that, um, with the amendments they are producing now, 13 amendments to a bill which is making very significant changes to the bill that was circulated uh, to the industry. In many respects, this bill is therefore very different. And I think we should give the industry uh, some time to adjust to it. And the, uh, the amendment in seeking to extend the commencement date so that it's three months after the date of assent will allow for authors, uh, publishers, distributors and booksellers to make appropriate uh, industry adjustments uh, in the light of changes to be brought about by the bill, uh, particularly in, uh, in light of the substantial amendments that the government is moving which have not yet been made public. Uh, the making of regulations for the purposes of Clause 2B of the bill prescribing countries from which books may be imported uh, and additionally regulations to be made for the purposes of new Part 4A to prescribe the relevant reasonable, quote, reasonable time, end of quote, for different copyright articles. It's for this reason that I think in the circumstances we should not allow the writ of the Act's Interpretation Act simply to run for the 28 days and uh, it's why I move for uh, the commencement date to be extended so that it's three months after the day of royal assent. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr uh, Neil, the uh, amendment moved is not acceptable as I indicated earlier in touching on matters before we moved into committee. Uh, there are substantial amendments, as the member for Kuyong indicated, 
This does go back to a government decision in uh, December 1989. The bill was introduced in October 1990. And in fact, the amendments uh, which have come forward tonight uh, were not something that were dreamt up um, on this side of the House. They came, in fact, uh, as a result uh, of discussions uh, with booksellers, uh, publishers and others interested. And uh, I just don't see any reason uh, to delay further the operation of uh, the bill. The question is that the clause proposed to be inserted be so inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. I thought you might. <laughs> the, the, the question is that the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Kuyong. The question is that Clause 2 be agreed to. Um, the Member for Kuyong. I rise um, to move uh, Amendment 2 that's been circulated in my name, uh, Mr uh, Chairman. Uh, this um, amends the definition of uh, infringing uh, copy, in quotes, infringing copy, in subsection 10.1 of the Act uh, to make it clear uh, that importation of articles under new part 4A um, does not result in an infringement of copyright. The Honourable the Attorney. Uh, Mr Chairman, as I understand it, the member um, for Kuyong will appreciate that uh, while he's expressed some concerns, uh, and I understand that, regarding the timing, um, the amendments uh, were not available till uh, fairly late tonight. And as far as I understand, amendment number two, it relates uh, to amendment number nine, which is proposed to be moved by the uh, member for Kuyong. And uh, uh, if there's any response to that, I'll uh, reply at that time. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the clause as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say clause two be agreed to. The minister. Uh, Mr. Did you say the ayes uh, had the... Yeah. Uh, no. Agreed to the amendment uh, that was uh, moved by me. No. I, no. Well, I, I, are you overturning that, are you? Your hearing is defective. <laughs> I don't know that it is. You we do have a bad cold. <laughs> Indeed, I do. Yeah. But I, I, <coughs> I always take the opportunity of anticipating sometimes, and sometimes anticipation I exceeds desire. I have such regard for you, Mr Chairman, I naturally accept if I'm wrong. Well, I knew you would. Yes. Exactly. Thank, thank, the attorney. thank you very much, thank Mr you. Chairman. Mm, yes, Mr. I know it should be so too. Yeah. Mr Chairman, I formally move uh, uh, the go Government Amendment Number 1 circulated in my name. I've already spoken to it in, in summing up the second reading um, and don't propose to speak to the matter at this stage. It's formally moved the Amendment Number 1. The question is that Amendment number one be amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is the clause as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that um, clause three be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Kuyong. Uh, Mr uh, Speaker, um, I move, in fact, uh, amendments three to seven. Uh, you know, well, well uh, the, the, the amendments have been circulated in my name and I just make some remarks. I, I move am uh, amendment three. It applies also um, to succeeding amendments that are embraced uh, within this. I um, have to say that um, I now look forward to the attorney supporting this amendment because the reason that he gave for rejecting my previous amendment was that, of course, he'd only received the amendments this evening. And, and uh, uh, well, Attorney, um, my hearing may have been effective um, half a minute ago, but a minute and a half ago it certainly was not. And I heard you say that uh, you would be unable to accept it because you only had these amendments this evening. Now, Attorney... Now, Attorney, I know you don't normally engage in selective amnesia, so if you put your mind back to a conversation that your officers would have had with you, diligent as they are, uh, you will recall that 
amendments three to seven were left with your office in December of 1990. Now, I think, therefore, that a period of some six months is a pretty fair period of time to consider amendments three to seven, and purely and simply on the basis that you rejected my previous amendment because you hadn't had enough time. With the abundance of your time, I'm sure you'll embrace this enthusiastically because paragraph A of these amendments makes it clear that the importation provisions are to be read subject to the provisions of new part 4A. And paragraph B of these amendments seek to change the existing provisions of subsections 37.1, 38.1, uh, 102 1 and 103 1 by deleting the words, quote, where to his knowledge, end of quote, and substituting the words, if a person knew or ought reasonably to have known that, end of quote. The amendments are based upon the recommendations of the Copyright Law Review uh, Committee in its report of September 1988 at page 6 that the knowledge requirements be brought into line with the changes made uh, to section 132 of the Act dealing with criminal offences for lawful importation by the Copyright, Copyright Amendment Act 1986. Now, don't shatter my expectations by telling me you reject them. Mr Chairman, uh, in respect of selective amnesia, amend amendment number two, uh, I said uh, because of the fact that amendment number two was circulated rather late. As I understood number two, it related to amendment <coughs> number nine, uh, and I'll deal with number two when we get to number nine. The shadow attorney is now moving amendments three to seven. In respect of those amendments, uh, three... If I may interrupt the, the attorney, I might, uh, for his benefit and that of the member for Keogh, advise the, the House that it is only Amendment 3, amendment and three. the member for Kuyong is foreshadowing mm. that he's going to move 4 to 7 thereafter. We're only dealing with Amendment 3 at the present okay. time. Uh, well, in respect of uh, Amendment 3, uh, that clearly uh, introduces a constructive knowledge test rather mm -hmm. than an actual knowledge test and is linked uh, to Amendment number 10. And in respect of that amendment, that's the three which has now been moved and foreshadowing the movement of 327. Um, in respect of uh, three, uh, I uh, must say that uh, if you link three, which it has to be to 10, uh, I think that the, uh, it's very difficult, whether it was uh, three hours, three minutes or three months, uh, for the government to be convinced <coughs> that this provision does <coughs> anything uh, than is, that is or not already accomplished in the, uh, in the bill as amended. And uh, if the shadow attorney looks at section 132.1d, uh, it does what this amendment, I think, does what this amendment is proposing. It seems to double up uh, on section 132.1d and is not acceptable. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, those of the contrary no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the clause be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, of the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Kuyong, are you going to move? Yes, um, clause four? I, I formally move um, uh, Amendment uh, 4. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, those of the contrary no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the clause be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clause five, the attorney. Uh, Mr Chairman, I formally move the government amendment uh, number two to clause five, circulated in my name. The question is that um, government amendment number two to clause five be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Mr um, Kuyong. Yes. Um, Mr Chairman, thank you. I uh, move uh, my amendment clause to uh, my amendment five, and I foreshadow in these remarks uh, that I'll be moving amendment eight that uh, relates thereto because a similar change that I'm proposing in five is made to 
subsection 112A, subsection 7 by Amendment 8. Uh, Mr uh, Chairman, um, this amendment uh, seeks to introduce an exemption for textbooks from the operation of the bill. A new paragraph D is added to subsection 44A, subsection 7, to provide that a book does not include, and I quote, a book, the primary purpose of the publication of which is for use by students of an educational institute as a book required for a course of study at that institution, end of quote. It's worth at least noting that uh, the, quote, primary purpose, end of quote, test is one which is found in a number of Commonwealth and state statutes. A similar phrase of, quote, substantial purpose, end of quote, has also been considered by the courts on a number of occasions in the trade practices area. Now, um, if the attorney is going to again reject this amendment, I would just ask him to pause for a moment and open his mind on this issue. I've had a very good look at a number of textbooks that are produced internationally and that students desperately need in this country. And they require adaptation to Australian standards. And the textbook exemption will be subject to a two-year sunset clause. And the reasons behind it are twofold. Firstly, the PSA found uh, the concerns regarding availability and cost, which had preoccupied them and concerned them so much, uh, were not that great regarding tertiary textbooks. And secondly, substantial resources are put in for Australian adaptation of international textbooks. I picked up one international textbook and compared it to the Australian text that's been adapted an extraordinary amount of work is done. For example, if you're dealing with marketing in the United States and you give many case examples of what transpires in marketing a particular product on the west coast of the United States, on the east coast, in Cleveland or Ohio or various states, these authors have to go to uh, the uh, difficult process, expensive and time-consuming process of adapting that all for the Australian condition so that when the student is reading, he's not reading about west coast of America and east coast of America, he's reading about various regional differences in Australia, the way in which you market in those different ones and the techniques that have been successful, the companies that have done this, and they're all Australian. It's really quite impressive to see how you can pick up the most authoritative text on a given subject that's produced in America and you desperately want your students to have that and so that they can more readily understand its relevance in Australia. It is rewritten with tested case studies in Australia and uh, I really would urge him, even if he's rejecting this tonight, as it wends its way to another place, uh, if he would have a look at this, it would be in the interests of a significant body of students and it might at last lend subs some substantiation to his leader's desire for Australia to become a clever country. The question... Your Honourable uh, Attorney. Mr Chairman, the bill uh, already, of course, as the uh, Shadow Attorney is aware, uh, has exclusions, but the exclusions are not really books. I mean, the, if you look at the exclusions, they do not include books. This amendment uh, does exclude uh, educational books, and if you look at the uh, history of uh, this matter, one of the main sources of complaint has been the cost of books for education and the delays in getting them. Uh, there uh, have been particular concerns expressed by American uh, uh, publishers, which appear, may not be the case, but they appear to be reflected uh, in this amendment. Uh, the, in fact, this, as the situation is now, um, the books will be in competition uh, with uh, foreign books, and uh, as far as the examination of the uh, history of this matter and the, the, the matters that have been put before me, uh, I just do not see that there's any justification uh, uh, in this amendment at all. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, those of the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. I understand that uh, it is the desire of the government to move 
Amendments three to seven together by leave. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Leave thank is granted. Thank the Honourable you. Attorney. Uh, Mr Chairman, uh, I move uh, uh, the Government Amendments three to seven. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question uh, is that the clause as amended be agreed to. Out, those of that have said. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The um, opposition amendment number six, the honourable member for Kuyong. The question is that clause six be agreed to. Uh, uh, Mr Chairman, I formally move uh, amendment six. The question is that the amendment. You did indeed. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the clause be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. I think the uh, those of the, those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is referring to opposition amendment number seven. That the amendment be agreed to. The honourable member, clause seven. Yes. Honourable uh, member for Kuyong. I uh, f uh, again, this matter was uh, foreshadowed earlier, and I formally move uh, my amendment seven. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the clause be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that. Um, the government clauses eight to be agreed to. Those of that opinion, or the, or the honourable the attorney. I, I formally move uh, the government amendments eight to twelve, which uh, I moved together. Uh, I, I will I'm seek sorry, leave in a moment. Assume assume leave. Not yet. I so know you are always reasonable, but the minister, the well, attorney, I, has not I, yet I must asked say to I leave. Had to as leave granted. Thank you. Uh, of all government amendments eight to twelve by uh, leave. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mm. Leave is granted. The question is that the amendments mm. be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that. Yes, the honourable member. Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, uh, again, in terms of. Um, uh, yes, 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 this is amendment. It's got to concentrate here. Uh, it's uh, amendment eight which you'll recall I foreshadowed in regard to Amendment 5. It's yes, it is. It's a, as I think I indicated at that time in foreshadowing it, it's a similar change being made to subsection 112A, subsection 7, uh, by this particular amendment, I, Amendment 8, and I formally move it. The question is that um, the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Um, the question is... No, the noes were here. They were just very quiet. The, the question is, the Minister, the Honourable the Attorney. Uh, Mr Chairman, I move Government Amendment 13, which has been circulated in my name. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the clause as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Kuyong. Um, we've still got control of this scene, remarkably. You're uh, about to move new nine right. and ten. Indeed I am. Indeed I am. And, uh, by leave. B by leave. Is leave granted? Attorney. Yes, I'm sorry. Is leave granted for me to move... Uh, no, I asked that, not well, you. Is sorry. leave granted? <laughs> For the Honourable Member for Kew Yong to move the new clauses <laughs> 9 and 10. This is, this is like is a, granted. Leave is granted. This is like a 10 act show. Uh, uh, goodness me. I know I move all these amendments. There's occasions like this I start to regret that I put all this work into it. But anyhow, uh, I, uh, I move uh, amendments 9 and 10. Uh, in terms of um, uh, amendment 9, this amendment seeks to introduce a new part 4A into the Act. And the purpose of the new Part 4A is to extend the operation of the Bill to other copyright articles in light of the recommendations of the uh, Copyright Law Review Committee in September 1988, which dealt with all copyright articles, and of the, the uh, Price of Surveillance Authority in December of 1990, dealing with records. 
any terms of what, the, what I've said in arguing the case of opening up restrictive markets, which was so endorsed by the Price of Surveillance Authority, whilst this bill as drafted is dealing only uh, with books, I seek by this amendment to extend it into other copyright areas. Um, and there is, I beg your pardon? Well, it's not premature because if you'd read as I have thoroughly every word of the uh, Copyright Law Review Committee report and the Price of Surveillance Authority report, the, particularly that latter one dealing with records, you would know how substantial the case is for this. And all the arguments that both my colleague, the member for Curtin, and the arguments that I more succinctly in trying to get through in the time available on the second reading produced in regard to the constraints uh, within the marketplace on books apply equally elsewhere. In this, uh, in fact, though, uh, um, as a question of a model, the new Part 4A uh, is modelled on the private member's bill that was introduced uh, into this House by the Honourable Member for Menzies in August of 1989. And it's worth noting that the interface uh, between uh, new Part 4A and the provisions of the Government's Bill dealing with books as set out in uh, proposed uh, Section 1113 involves uh, the following. Uh, firstly, the exemption set out in the Government's Bill, that's subsections 44A7 and 112A7, with the addition of the textbook exemption that I was seeking before, remain exempted under the provisions of new Part 4A. Secondly, in addition, a further exemption is provided for in relation to computer software, computer programs and manuals used in connection with such programs. This is done in light of the pending inquiry by the uh, uh, Copyright Law Review Committee on computer software, which includes a reference to examine the operation of the importation provisions vis-a-vis -vis computer software. A similar exemption also appears in the government's definition of what is not a book, that is subsections 44A7 and 112A7. And thirdly, um, all of these exemptions are subject to a two-year sunset clause. If the sunset clause takes effect, these exempted articles may be imported under the provisions of new part 4A. Now, that is, of course, in regard to Amendment 9. Now, Amendment 10 uh, is an amendment which flows from the introduction of new Part 4A, and the amendment seeks to amend the provisions of sections, uh, one three, section 132, as I recall, of the Act, uh, which deals with criminal offences for unlawful importation, that is where the importation would constitute a breach of copyright. In essence, uh, the amendment provides that if a procedure of the type set out in part 4A is properly followed, no criminal liability will arise. Now, I do urge the attorney again uh, to uh, uh, examine the merits of this proposal. We're at the end of uh, not a lengthy, which was the point of my complaint, complaint but a very technical examination in committee here of suggestions that have been put forward. The arguments on textbooks were compelling and yet they were rejected out of hand. Uh, the arguments, however, for the introduction uh, of a new Part 4A into the Act, I think, commend themselves. Here we have a situation, and I'm uh, concluding on the note that I began, where the strength of argument contained in the reports that I'd referred to, both the uh, uh, CLRCs and the PSAs, uh, ought be uh, picked up by uh, what has been proffered on behalf of the opposition uh, with these amendments 9 and 10. The question is that the clauses proposed to be added be so added. Oh, the Honourable the Attorney. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, as we've already been uh, uh, in speaking to amendments 9 and 10, uh, as uh, opposition amendments 9 and 10, uh, as we've already been reminded uh, by the member for Kuyong, uh, the PSA was given a reference to inquire into the prices of records uh, after it finished its book prices report. And uh, it presented that report, the one on records, prices last December. Uh, since that time, uh, 
I think, as has been the case uh, with the bill before us tonight, uh, we have had uh, an enormous number of, of representations and submissions in relation to this matter. And an interdepartmental committee, because it involves, as the shadow attorney will uh, understand, particularly industry areas, um, other than the Attorney General's department, and that IDC has been examining the PSA's recommendations in light of comments it sought uh, from interested parties. And uh, there are similarities between uh, the arguments, I think that can be conceded, in uh, uh, the record prices debate and the books debate. However, uh, I think the shadow attorney would agree that there are very important and significant differences. Uh, a couple of things, uh, uh, like the existence of two copyrights in sound recordings. I mean, there are two there, music and the recording. The position of performers, uh, who are not also <coughs> composers of what they perform. Uh, the question of uh, uh, the uniformity of uh, format of records and tapes and the consequences that that has for pricing. These and other characteristics of records are not found in the book scene. More broadly, the, uh, the whole industry arrangements built on the exploitation of sound record recordings are different, are different to those uh, governing books. And uh, despite uh, Mr Chairman having spent a, a substantial period preparing its report on book prices, the PSA found it necessary to spend a comparable amount of time and effort on the record prices report. And people I uh, uh, would put uh, to the shadow attorney have the right to expect uh, that any government uh, would study the records report with the benefit of advice uh, from the IDC in light of uh, comments which have been sought from interested parties before making a decision on the PSA's recommendation on records. And I th it would hardly uh, do justice uh, to the matter by accepting uh, this opposition amendment. The government is giving consideration uh, to the records recommendations uh, very shortly, uh, but in the meantime, I'd suggest uh, uh, to the opposition that we focus on books. Uh, that's the uh, sole concern of this bill, and I do not think uh, that uh, uh, we ought to move in uh, to the uh, uh, to the area of uh, of uh, records uh, in relation uh, to this bill, and for those reasons. Uh, uh, that is not, um, the suggested amendment is not acceptable. As I also said earlier in respect of uh, Opposition Amendment 10, I again refer uh, the shadow attorney uh, to section 132.1d uh, because this, the uh, uh, amendment number 10 seems to me uh, to do no more than double up on the existing section 131, 132.1d and the amendments are not acceptable. The question is that the clauses proposed to be added be so added. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. Somebody say no? Oh, I think the no's have it. The question now is that the title be agreed to. Those of that opinion is... Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I am incited to speak on the title uh, after the remarks that the attorney has just passed. And I'll be very brief. Um, I do have pass to point them or make them? No, uh, he just made them. He just made them. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'd play with that if you wish. Uh, Fowler would say that you could use both, but then he, his language may have been getting fouler and fouler by the time he'd finished his text. But I, uh, it may be the fact, pass too. Yeah. Well, I'll let that pass. Um, I, um, I, I, I moved to rise at this point because. Uh, on the title, because it, it may well be that in, in the light of the remarks you've just passed, the title ought to be Made. the Copyright Narrowly Construed Amendment Bill. Because if you get up and tell me that in fact there are two copyrights on, rec on books, on records I should say, and that that's a compelling argument for rejecting the amendment, there are after all in many instances two copyrights on books. But more to the point, the IDC on which you hang your hat for rejecting my amendment in saying, look, it's just gone off to the IDC, attorney, you've forgotten that uh, in saying I was premature in moving this, 
that the government in fact set up an interdepartmental committee to consider the Process Surveillance Authority report and it was to conclude by when? By March of 1991. Now, to the best of my knowledge and belief, today is Tuesday the 14th of May. So you have had that report, if it met the guidelines you set down, for some two months. And if it didn't meet the side guidelines you set down, you would have a rocket on the IDC because they've been getting away with murder for decades, even when I was a minister from time to time. So I rose at this occasion really to use this opportunity on the title to answer what you just said. And those amendments should have been accepted because you should have had the report by March. You should have been able to move beyond the normal glacial pace and have implemented it and backed that amendment. The question is that the title be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that I report the bill with amendments. Those of that opinion say aye. Those of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Deputy Speaker, I have to report that the committee has agreed to the bill with amendments. The Minister. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move that the report be adopted. Uh, the question is that the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the Honourable the Attorney. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. Uh, the question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Copyright Act 1968. Order of the day Clark. number three, departure tax amendment bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. Um, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable, the member for Fadden. Mr Deputy Speaker, just prior to Christmas last, Minister Simmons, the Minister for Tourism, announced that the uh, federal government was going to allocate another $23 million for a major overseas advertising campaign by the Australian Tourist Commission. He announced at that time that this was going to be paid for by an increase in the rate of departure tax from Australia from $10 to $20. And this particular move, in fact, is going to raise that $23 million for the ATC campaign. But uh, in its first full year of operation, it in fact will raise some $35 million and in subsequent years some $37 million. I wonder if the government can inform me as to whether or not this is going to be their now, now their principal form of funding the Australian Tourist Commission, whether or not we are going to have a user pays principle. And at last, if we do that, then we might see some genuine funding of the promotion of tourism overseas. I must say that this particular move by the government to spend the additional $23 million, principally on a television campaign, has been welcomed by this side of the parliament. There is no doubt that the momentum that had been gained in the tourist industry in recent years has in fact suffered. It suffered because of the most stupid dispute that Australia has ever seen in an industrial sense, the airline dispute of 1989 and 1990. It was affected by bad weather, it has been affected by the Gulf War, and it has been affected by uh, the downturn in the economy of some of our major partners in the tourism business. May I also say that the concentration of the government program or the Australian Tourist Commission program in this particular campaign has in fact been in those major markets of Japan and the United States and also it is being used to open up a brand new market for Australian tourism and that is the market of Korea. And Korea in fact promises to be one of the principal international markets over the next decade for inbound tourists into Australia. One can only hope that it won't be too long before we see an increase in the number of airline services out of Korea. At the moment we have two a week and uh, Qantas continually put back the operation of their particular services. But it is my belief that over the next five to ten years Korea is going to develop as one of the most important markets in Australia. It was also important that we make sure that we consolidate our position as far as Japan is concerned. Because if we look at the figures, we see in fact that Japan is the biggest provider of short-term visitors to Australia. And it's quite interesting if you make an analysis of the uh, nature of tourism in Australia into Australia in the last 12 months. Because in fact the four major countries are now providing 64 per cent 
of the total short-term visitor arrivals in Australia. And those four countries are Japan, New Zealand, the United States, and interestingly, the United Kingdom, which has expanded quite quickly. So the rest of the world provides just 36% of the short-term visitors. And that's not to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we should be ignoring those particular markets, because within those markets there is the potential to provide a great number of tourists. And I refer particularly to areas such as South Africa, and the indication is at the moment that the government is likely to reopen the air routes between Australia and South Africa. And the other interesting one that comes through on the visitor arrival figures is the Scandinavian market. And as one who has been standing in this place for many, many years now, promoting the virtues of uh, Scandinavian tourism to Australia, it's interesting to see that that is emerging as one of the principal markets out of Europe, along with Switzerland. It's also interesting and the, at this stage that the government has not negotiated any sort of air services arrangements uh, with the Scandinavian countries, and maybe that's one that uh, some concentration could be put into in terms of uh, air service arrangements and also in terms of the uh, future promotional programs of the Australian Tourism Commission. I must say that I think it is fair to say that there is still, at all levels of government in Australia and indeed uh, in this House, there is a failure to recognise just what the tourism industry is all about in Australia. Because the tourist industry now ranks as Australia's largest earner of export income. It generates $6.5 billion in foreign exchange in 1989-90. It contributed 5.4 per cent to Australia's gross domestic product. It accounted for 9 per cent of our export dollars and it employed 500,000 Australians, 5.9 per cent of the workforce. It is, in fact, the single largest private sector employer. The industry is credited with producing a total of $22.5 billion in tourism expenditure in 89, $16.5 billion of it in domestic tourism. It's estimated that total indirect taxes derived from the industry in 88-89 was around about $2.7 billion and that a substantial $21.2 billion of new tourist projects are now firmly committed or under construction as of March of last year. And they, they are very telling figures. And uh, I mentioned a little earlier that I hope that this may be part of a new direction, marrying in the uh, departure tax that's contributed not only by Australians going overseas, but indeed all international visitors passing through our gateway ports as a means of funding tourism promotion. Because there is no doubt that while the amount of money that has been expended on promoting tourism has increased in recent years, it's still a very small section of the total contribution generated by tourism to the Australian economy. And in fact, when you realise that $2.7 billion in tax has uh, got by this government out of uh, the tourist industry, the 40 million or thereabouts that is usually uh, expended on tourism is a very small percentage indeed, compared with some of the assistance that the other industries get. Now, I'm not one who's uh, going to stand up here and ask the government to pour dollars and dollars into uh, uh, the support of the tourist industry because I don't really think it needs it. I think the tourist industry would be quite happy to stand on its own two feet ultimately but if there is a mechanism whereby uh, this uh, user pays principle can be evoked, then we're part of the way of uh, really seeing tourism promotion get underway the way it, it should do. Can I just raise a couple of points, because this uh, bill is not terribly contentious, but one of the things that has concerned me during the 13 years of the operation of the departure tax is the method of collection. And I'm sure that members in this particular house who have travelled overseas have lined up at the cages which have been established at the various uh, airport terminals to pay their 10 or, or $20 departure tax. Um, they've been subjected to queues. They may even have been embarrassed when they found out that they uh, maybe didn't have enough money to pay for their departure tax. They've probably been absolutely amazed if they didn't have any money when they proffered their plastic in years gone by, because you wouldn't take credit cards. They're probably even more amazed when they could actually sign an IOU. Now, a little Japanese person who is leaving Australia after a good holiday, hopefully having spent four or five thousand dollars while he is here, lines up at the cage and is subjected to these uniformed people telling him to sign an IOU. Now, if he understands that, that's all right. But a little further down the track, he starts getting all these dirty notes from the Australian government 
saying you haven't paid this particular money. And it is a crazy setup. It is a stupid setup. And there must be some way that we can make sure that the departure tax becomes a component of the airline ticket, as it is in so many other parts of the world. And we're doing it in a domestic sense. I mean, if you travel through Cairns Airport or you travel through Hamilton Island Airport, you don't know you're paying a passenger handling charge. But next time you have a ticket with those two destinations on it, have a look at the little box at the bottom of the coupon where it says taxes. And you'll see that when you pass through Cairns, there's uh, some dollars that are expended there as a passenger handling charge. You might be absolutely amazed at what you pay when you go through Hamilton Island as part of the, uh, as part of the ticket. But that expense is combined as part of the ticket and part of the fare, and quite frankly, most people don't realise they're paying it. And some people have argued that maybe the increase of the departure tax from $10 to $20 is far too high. Well, in actual fact, our departure tax rates compare fairly favourably with most of the areas uh, in our immediate area of, of influence. I mean, most of the departure tax is somewhere between $10 and $20 in places like Hong Kong, in Singapore, and uh, in, indeed in Bangkok. But have a look at the charges that are applied in terms of departure taxes and various other taxes in the United States. And I think I'm right in saying that, in fact, in an airline ticket in the United States, there are five taxes written into that ticket. But when a passenger buys their ticket, they have no idea they're paying it. The coupon is ripped off, off they fly, happy as Larry, but at the end of the day, there are taxes distributed to various government agencies and various airports in the United States. Some of the highest passenger handling fees in the world are in the United Kingdom. And I think on last count, the total charges at Heathrow are in excess of $80. But you don't see that in your ticket. You don't line up at a little cage where somebody uh, uh, in a brown uniform is there demanding that you hand out this money before you go. And there has been tremendous arguments over the years as to uh, why somebody can't collect this tax in a much more subtle way than has been done in the past. Now, I know that the airlines will kick and scream all the way saying it's not their job and they won't do it. But there are other methods that we could look at. And I, while uh, you can substitute a post office or a travel agent uh, for the cage at the airport, you really don't overcome the problem. Now, there are a couple of clearing houses that we could look at. We could look at the IATA setup, or we could look at uh, the system that is in fact used by the airlines at the moment, uh, the BSP, which is the bank settlement plan. I think it would be worth investigating the cost of maybe having the BSP plan applied to departure taxes in Australia. Sure, we would be paying some commissions, but it is now some years since I investigated the cost of uh, collecting the departure tax, but I think on the last count, and it's, it's quite a number of years ago, it was costing the Commonwealth something like $880,000 per year. So there could well be some argument at looking at one of these settlement plans as a means of uh, being able to collect the departure tax without subjecting international visitors to Australia of the embarrassment and, in many cases, the annoyance of having to depart with those uh, last few dollars as they left the country. And I must say that one of the great things about uh, airports is their capacity to generate money from people prior to their leaving Australia. And if you look at uh, some of the business that is done in duty-free shops and other concession ar around Australian airports, uh, it's a wonderful way of ridding people of their last few dollars. And I think it is some time ago now but uh, there were some surveys done as towards the attitude of people leaving Australia. And some of them uh, in that survey came out uh, quite clearly saying that the fact that they had to depart, they were part with 10 or $20 before they left, in fact turned them off spending that money, probably on Australian goods in the air airport concessions. And we all know that those airport concessions contribute very greatly indeed to the cost of running an airport. And while the minister is at the table, May I say that uh, I was, I've been quite pleased, in fact, to see that there is a, a more commercial attitude starting to creep into the Federal Airports Corporation. And while I've no doubt there is going to be some controversy in terms of Sydney, the advent of poker machines on the air side of the departure area at Sydney International Airport is uh, just one of many ways that uh, we can contribute more and more to the cost of running airports. And while it's about 60 per 
It is very, and very generous of me too, but uh, one of these days I'll tell you about our plans for uh, some future airport development, which will probably make your hair stand on end. But, uh, but, uh, but, no, but the, the, the plain facts are that airports are there as a, as, as a tremendous source of being able to generate income. And if they are developed commercially and well, the contribution that they can make to those tremendous costs that are, uh, that are involved in airports ultimately, at the end of the day, should be able to mean that you've got cheaper costs to visitors coming in and out of Australia. May I just say that uh, I think that the opposition would join with the government in uh, expressing their thanks to Greg Norman, who in fact is going to head the television campaign in promoting Australia for the Australian Tourist Commission uh, in the overseas television commercials that are being financed by this particular uh, exercise tonight. There is no doubt that the uh, previous campaign that we had with, uh, with Paul Hogan was a great contributor to the flow of uh, inbound vis visitors coming into Australia, and we would trust that uh, Greg Norman might lead the Gulf-led uh, recovery in terms of Australian tourism. And it is essential that we do have the right funding and that we do have the right attitude by the ATC at the moment because we need international tourism more and more. Because the plain facts are that uh, while domestic tourism in Australia provides about 80% of the business at the time of the economic downturn, we are presently seeing a situation where the domestic industry is in real trouble. And if you look at the major tourist destinations around Australia, such as Cairns or the Gold Coast, uh, the top of the market properties, the five star properties, frankly are doing very, very well. But it's all international visitors. At the bottom end of the market, the backpackers that are starting to come in are there in their numbers as well, and uh, that's not a problem. But it's the mums and dads properties in the middle, the two, three and four star properties that are absolutely empty at the moment. And uh, for economies such as Cairns and parts of Western Australia and uh, indeed uh, parts of New South Wales, if you've got the capacity to be able to fill up some of those properties and uh, get some of the expenditure up in terms of the uh, international uh, visitors, then you're going to really help um, take some of the pressure off those communities. Can I say that really our share of the world tourism market is quite minuscule. We only get about 2% of the North American market. At the moment we're only getting about 4% of Japanese travellers. And when you consider that out of the United States every year, some 17 million Americans travel overseas and that 10 million Japanese will travel overseas this year, uh, our percentage of the business is very, very small. One would hope that the contribution that is going to be made to the uh, promotion of Australia as an international destination by this increase in the departure tax will see those numbers uh, increase quite dramatically indeed. Because uh, quite frankly, if you could double the numbers from those two particular countries, you're going a long way indeed to uh, reducing some of our balance of payment problems. May I also? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, minister, the minister raises the fact that we need a few slots in Japan. I mean, Minister, you're quite right. You're quite right. And what this country has got to realise, of course, is that whether we like it or not, about 60% of our international tourism traffic over the next decade is going to come out of Asia. And there is a, a, a great deal of importance uh, being put on uh, uh, the negotiation of air rights at the moment to make sure we get that right. The only thing that worries me is that if uh, we do put all our eggs in the one basket and, uh, and, and concentrate entirely on Japan, that market can be quite fickle and it can change fairly dramatically. Um, my friend, the member for McPherson, has expressed some concern, for example, at uh, law and order problems that have come in on the Gold Coast. Now, they're not terribly serious at the moment, but the word is getting around Japan. But if that situation did get serious and that, that, that market went away, uh, then we could, we could have some problems. So we have to look at the full Asian spread and somehow we've got to get back into that North American market because one of the things that has happened in recent times is that we've seen a fairly dramatic decline in the number of American visitors coming in. And while the capacity on that US route has been opened up fairly well and we've got uh, some more carriers coming online, some more services coming online, we've really got to start filling those services. And the thing that has concerned me is that immediately after the Gulf War, when uh, carriers like American Airlines and uh, Continental were going into the US market offering some amazing deals, 
round trip from Los Angeles to Sydney, for example, really that market didn't take off to the extent that, uh, that uh, I, I think it should have. And part of the reason for that was I think there were some of the operators from Europe who were probably a little bit smarter than we were and got their promotional campaign in place before we had the chance to get these, these commercials on the air. But with a good campaign there, hopefully we'll start getting some of, uh, of that particular market back. But there is no doubt that we will see uh, a dramatic increase in the number of international visitors coming to Australia during this next decade. I know the government has as its objective to double the number of international visitors. Um, I would like to think that we might have the capacity of, of, of doubling that again by the year 2000. I think the government is looking at 1995 to double the existing numbers. If you could double that again by the year 2000, you'd be looking at 10 million international visitors coming in here. Frankly, we've got the stock and we've got the plant to be able to handle them. So much of it is going to depend on air rights and making sure that we get that uh, web of international air arrangements in place to be able to handle those visitors. And once again, I come back to the fact that, that the Asian market is going to be just so important because about 60% of our business is there, but we must never forget that we have a potential giant sitting on our doorstep in terms of what may be able to happen out of Europe when we start spending some promotional money there, when we start looking at, uh, at opening up some of the, those markets. And uh, I would hope that the minister would be looking, in fact, at uh, moving towards trying to get some air services agreements in place in Eastern Europe. Now, it's going to be some years before those markets come online, and it's quite interesting. I, I, I mean, you talk to, uh, uh, to some of the, the carriers, and particularly the Germans, um, it would be my guess that, that uh, the East German market will probably be online in, in about five years, although some of the carriers are saying in two years that they'll, they'll really see the movement coming. And if you, if you look at areas like Poland, I mean, even the USSR, uh, Germany as it is now, and Czechoslovakia in particular, I think there is some tremendous potential there to start building those markets, provided we've got that infrastructure in place. Uh, I know this particular debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, is, uh, is uh, on a time scale tonight, and I'll close my remarks there, except to say that the opposition does welcome this particular increase and the fact that this money is being poured virtually directly into the promotion of Australia overseas as a major international destination. We've got to make sure, quite frankly, in these economic times of hardship, that we do get international visitors coming in here, because as I said in my opening remarks, tourism is one of the few industries that we've got going for us. It's a huge earner of foreign exchange. It is our biggest private sector employer. 500,000 people are employed in the industry now, and we must never forget the Bureau of Industry Economics figures that have been proved time and time again that every time we have a net increase of 25,000 international visitors coming to Australia, we create another 1,400 jobs. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for MacArthur. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to uh, participate in this debate tonight on what I consider to be, a, uh, as indicated by the Honourable Member for FADNA, a wide-ranging debate on the issues of tourism and on uh, a number of associated matters. But uh, specifically, of course, the Departure Tax Amendment Bill 1991 is, uh, ha or has as its aim, the provision that the rate of departure tax be increased from $10 to $20, uh, with effect from the 1st of August of 1991. The uh, decision, of course, follows the announcement by the government in December of last year that uh, the increase by some $23 million, although I accept the, uh, the figures that have been tendered by the Honourable Member for Fadden tonight, uh, funding for the promotion of Australia as a tourist destination. And uh, of course this promotion will enable Australia to capitalise on recent growth in tourism. It's indicated, uh, for example, or estimated that some 8,700 jobs are created for every 10 per cent increase in international visitor arrivals. And Australia's departure tax will remain on a par with similar taxes collected in a number of other countries. And of course, the Honourable Member for Fadden went to that in some detail. I too uh, am pleased that the majority of this funding is to go to a promotion campaign from the Australian Tourism Commission, which will employ Greg Norman in, uh, in a very large role to promote Australia as a tourist destination. And indeed, it does follow a very successful campaign which involved Paul Hogan. In fact, I well remember the time when the Paul Hogan commercials 
went to air in the United States that within a matter of days the switchboards at Qantas offices in that country were absolutely jammed with people that wanted to get more information and come to Australia. In fact, the response rate was just so incredibly high that Qantas uh, hadn't been prepared for it. They thought the ads were reasonable, talking about throwing another shrimp on the barbie or whatever, but they didn't realise just the extent to which a market such as the United States was ripe, was ready for Australian inbound tourism to pick up on, and uh, I think they suddenly realised they had to plough some further resources into it. Indeed, I remember also in the Japanese case, when the Hogan's commercials went to air there, that uh, uh, they had actually determined, I think, uh, well, perhaps they didn't go to where they were going to, and the ATC determined uh, that they wouldn't do it because of the enormous uh, rush that they would have of uh, Japanese people, again, wanting to get further information about Australia. Now, I think that, uh, that uh, promotion utilising Australian national identity, such as uh, Paul Hogan, such as Greg Norman and so on, uh, are master strokes on behalf of the Australian Tourism Commission, indeed the government. I will remember that it was the former Minister for Tourism, the Hon John Brown, who uh, uh, in fact spoke to Paul Hogan and was instrumental in his appearing in many of those particular commercials on behalf of, uh, of the Australian Tourism Commission and of course has been uh, proven to be so successful as we've already acknowledged tonight. But Mr Deputy Speaker, what does concern me about the question of tourism in Australia at the moment, about the issue associated with infrastructure, which the Honourable Member for Fadden went to, about the general question of economic benefit to this country, is that there doesn't seem to be a coordinated policy amongst the various levels of government. Because it disturbs me to see a series of articles written very recently, in fact this month, in uh, many of the financial papers, the Financial Review, the Sydney Morning Herald and so on, talking under the headlines, quote, it's time for all politicians to recognise tourism's huge value, quote, Australia, it now rides on the overseas visitors back, quote, industry's place in economy still not appreciated and, quote, call for plan to cope with tourist influx. All of those and the subsequent articles talking about some reports which have been presented by CEDA, subsequent reports to the CEDA meeting by the Honourable John Brown in his capacity as Chairman of the Tourism Task Force, and indeed with the industry itself, trying to get into people's minds the significance of tourism to the Australian economy. Now, the Honourable Member for Fadden quoted all the figures to us tonight, and he's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. It is the number one. It's the number one income earner for this country, and uh, in fact, uh, many of the uh, many of the uh, particular uh, figures that were being talked about just here illustrate that extremely well. I mean, it talks about uh, estimates suggesting that at each 10% real increase in earnings from inbound tourism leads to a $180 million increase in, in gross domestic product and an extra $310 million in foreign exchange earnings from travel, travel credits, uh, uh, costs $120 million in extra imports and gives a net contribution to the current account of $190 million. Now, an industry that can do that, therefore, has to be taken seriously. And I think there is this need to, to take it seriously, but as was suggested, in this uh, CEDA report, which was tabled and in fact released by the Prime Minister earlier this month, clearly called for greater cooperation and coordination. The report was critical of the support given to tourism, as I've indicated, by all levels of government, saying fragmented policies, um, saying fragmented policies suggested that governments were making only a token commitment to tourism. Now, tonight we've seen that that token commitment, at least as far as this federal government is concerned, is more than that by injecting at least the $23 million in prospect, perhaps $35 million in real terms, into a promotion campaign such as this, into the Australian Tourism Commission, is tangible evidence, again, of this government's commitment to tourism and, and, and its promotion. But, uh, uh, I mean, the, again, I go back to that original report. I mean, what this report said is that conflicting federal, state and local government policies were resulting in duplicated efforts 
inefficiencies and inconsistencies in tourism planning, management and marketing. And the report also says that the country's fastest growing industry is a major catalyst for economic growth and structural change. Now we'd all agree with that. We all agree with it. But there is the need, obviously, for that coordinated approach. And I think that's something which people in the Australian Tourism Commission, whether it be in John Brown's Tourism Task Force, whether it be levels of government, need to look at. And again, from an, a, a personal example that I know in the Illawarra, uh, some uh, 18 months or so ago, the Prime Minister established within the Illawarra uh, a regional consultative council. It drew on people from a variety of areas to put together a regional development strategy for the Illawarra region. And part of that, part of that, in fact, went to the question of tourism. Now, I take the, the interjection from my very good friend, the member for Parramatta, quite seriously because, in fact, it is through sporting events with successful teams like the Illawarra Steelers, the Illawarra Hawks, uh, it might be the Wollongong City Wolves or Wollongong Macedonia in the soccer, whoever, are important in attracting day tourists to the Illawarra. It is something which I have raised in this parliament previously in two committee inquiry reports which I chaired into the funding and administration of sport in this country and still nothing has been done about it. I think it is an enormous market, whether it be Greg Norman bringing golfers to Australia, whether it be in the case of the Illawarra uh, and, and its sporting teams attracting people from the southwest of Sydney or whatever, all important. And in fact, for the tourist dollar that comes in on a daily basis, the Illawarra Tourist Association estimates that it's well in excess of uh, several million dollars a year a to an economy like the Illawarra battling to try and diversify its economic base. Now, what we're doing in the Illawarra is not dissimilar to what people would like to do in the Hunter, the attractions of the vineyards, other parts in, in, in parts of uh, Western Australia uh, that the Honourable Member of, for Perth is, is well familiar with. Groom is a place that's been mentioned. The southwest of Western Australia, very attractive, Margaret River and so on. Now, all of those are important destinations which need promotion, but it's important to get the coordinated strategy. And in fact, the report that I was talking about, the Regional Development Strategy for the Illawarra, typifies that very thing. What we in fact said was that there was a need to coordinate the role being played by the Illawarra Tourist Association with the State Department of Tourism that were drawing up tourism plans for different parts of New South Wales. But they needed to be speaking with the one voice. It is no good trying to promote things in a region that just won't happen. You have to look at the tourism benefits in the Illawarra, particularly with day trippers, although the conference market has also expanded, and you have to promote that. And, that, and, and, and surely following that will be the development of, uh, of uh, infrastructure to go hand in glove with the needs and the demands as they arise. And uh, of course, going with that is the economic benefit of the continuance of the creation of jobs. Now, it's often been said, the greatest put down in my view is that we don't want to be turned into a nation of waiters. That's not right. That is not right. People in the tourism industry, in the service industry, go to a range of operations. It might go to the person that collects the duty-free vouchers at Sydney Airport. It goes to the person that runs the, uh, the duty-free outlet and the other shops at Sydney, uh, uh, at Sydney Airport. It goes to the people operating the hotels, the bus operators, the train operators, mainly states, I suppose, but they get some benefit from it. And it's all interlinked. And uh, as far as uh, I'm sure most members of this place are concerned, it is important then to get that coordinated approach as we go along. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I know that uh, there is a time limit and I did see uh, yes. a wind-up signal being given to me by the Whip's office very quietly back there. But uh, it is an important topic. Uh, she's now gone, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's all right. Don't seek her out any longer. I'm glad I didn't miss anything. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I do see the look. The Leader of the House is also now interjecting on me as well. I do want to conclude, however, by, by again saying it is time for all politicians and the industry itself and the business community to recognise tourism's huge value to Australia. We must get involved. We must promote it at every opportunity. We should not be blinkered by people's concerns about 
certain people coming to this country, if they are coming, if anyone is coming and they are spending dollars and creating jobs in Australia, then we're going to benefit. This bill goes some way to ensuring that the promotion of Australia is going to be enhanced. It is tangible evidence, as I said, of uh, the government's commitment to that promotion, to supporting the Australian Tourism Commission's initiatives, supporting organisations like John Brown's Tourism Task Force, which again are doing an excellent job, and I commend the legislation to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for McPherson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I uh, very happy to uh, speak in this uh, debate on the departure tax amendment bill, and I do so. Uh, as a member of the Opposition Tourism and Aviation Committee and also, of course, be, uh, because my electorate encompasses uh, Australia's number one tourist resort and I would like to say uh, perhaps one of the great tourist uh, destinations in the world. Uh, but we're not without our problems and it was interesting to hear the member for Fadden in his introductory comments talk about Sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thought you. I was just suggesting that you didn't have Coffs Harbour in your electorate when you're talking about. No, no, no. Major, Coffs Harbour is well to the south. Destination. Well Port, to the Port, south. Port, well to the south and way down the pecking order. But redist the Deputy's redistribution is coming. <laughs> I'm sure I'll never get Coffs Harbour in my election, no matter what happens. I'm sure you won't either. <laughs> but I. <laughs> All right. But I, uh, I, well, I mean, the, the member for Fadden pointed out the problem we, we do have with crime, and I mean, we don't want to talk about it a lot because uh, we don't want to draw, draw undue attention to it. But I want to say here, uh, because the member for Fadden mentioned it, that uh, that uh, the Goss government, the Goss Labor government we now have in Queensland, really has not delivered in terms of uh, adequate policing for the Gold Coast. I mean, it is a concern. It's a concern that's not being addressed, and it's a concern that I that I believe I should bring forward here. And the other area that concerns us, another area of laxity on behalf of the federal government, and that is that there are real concerns that because of the government's failure in terms of its business migration program, that there is, of course, now some evidence that there is an organised crime uh, activity on the Gold Coast. And even in the last uh, week or so, a uh, person has been uh, forced to leave Australia who's found to have had uh, contacts with organised crime overseas. And I believe uh, I made the statement publicly in the last few days that I think there'd be uh, many other people in that category simply because in that area and indeed in, uh, in the Foreign Investment Review Board's inactivity in this area that there are people coming into the country um, illegally, staying, overstaying and uh, coming in under various migration programs uh, who are uh, people that have got criminal records overseas. But Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, just returning to the, the bill, uh, there's been on both sides already a great deal of emphasis given the importance of tourism to the Australian economy, and, and I would like to uh, underline that. We also, of course, need to recognise the enormous potential we have as a country to increase our share of the world tourism market. We know that it, tourism contributes already 5.4 per cent to Australia's GDP, and it accounts for 9 per cent of our export dollars. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, although we can be uh, both agree on the importance of tourism. I mean, I, I just don't think, notwithstanding, that we've got very much to thank the government for in terms of what it's actually done for tourism. I mean, when we look at the main issues that are affecting tourism in this country at the moment, we find that the government has really failed. I mean, take the third runway. Now, I mean, there is a, 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 a primary concern of the tourist industry, and yet the government has vacillated about that issue for years, and they still seem to be doing it. Now, we need that third runway. That is vital to the tourism industry in Australia. What about the pilots' dispute? I mean, there, there is a case in point, the damage that that, dis that dispute did to the tourism industry. And, 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 that, and, that's, and as the member for Fadden said, that's the reason why we've had to increase the departure tax to, uh, to, to get revenue together to help the tourist industry out in these difficult times. Now, the handling of the pilots' dispute was absolutely deplorable and it did almost irreparable damage to the tourism industry. It sent many small tourist operators out of business. And I think the government needs to be constantly reminded about that matter. And how, how ironic it is when we see that the recent deal that the Prime Minister did with the waterfronts and we compare waterfront uh, uh, employees and we compare that with the way he handled the pilots' dispute. I had a letter, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I, I guess I hope all members of parliament did, from a pilot the other day 
uh, just complaining about the fact that he was now unemployed. And, I, and as I fly around the country, as we members of parliament do, um, I'm frequently confronted with, with pilots who are not Australians. Not, not, uh, they become Australian citizens because the government let them in. And I'm constantly confronted with Australians, and many of them live in my electorate, they've chosen to do that for years, who are now unemployed. Australians, former ANSET and Australian pilots who are now unemployed, not able to get jobs, or they are they're having to go overseas to get jobs. They're working around the world. And I think that's a deplorable state of affairs. And this particular pilot, of course, uh, um, points out the fact, and I, and I agree with him, that it's all about mateship. I mean, the deal with the waterfront was for the mates. The, de the, deal on, the, the, the deal on the airline dispute was with, with, uh, with the Prime Minister's mate, Sir Peter Abels. And I, I will never let the, this government forget that its handling of the pilots' dispute, the Prime Minister in particular, personally culpable in my view, did irreparable damage to the Australian tourism industry. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to resolve from making that statement at every opportunity. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is an encouraged in, encouraging degree of resilience existing in the tourist industry despite the recession. I mean, we had the pilots dispute, now we've got the recession, but we're hanging in there. And now, fortunately, and I, and I commend the government on this, I mean, we're supporting this bill, we will have additional funds for tourism promotion. As far as we're concerned, the departure tax is in accord with the general principle of user pays to the extent that it contributes to government, government revenues. Um, the costs of maintaining immigration and customs services in particular are quite significant and uh, I don't have any particular problem with a tax of this form um, that's contributing directly in a sense uh, or indirectly in, 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 in the way that it's, uh, it's being collected at the moment uh, towards meeting those costs. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, uh, the two million odd international visitors that came to Australia in 1989 is a very significant number. And of course, if we look at the, uh, the increasing numbers that we hope we would get over the next uh, year or two, then the increased revenue from that departure tax will be, will be considerable. And we're talking, of course, only about increasing the tax from a mere $10 to $20. And I think the member for Fadden po pointed out that really this is quite a small amount compared to what's actually charged in some countries. But the difference, of course, is visibility. And here, of course, where you line up and you pay the amount before you go, uh, you know that you're paying 10 or $20, whereas overseas it's included in the price of the ticket. And I was very pleased to hear the member for Fadden say that, uh, that he believed that initiatives should be taken to ensure that that's the approach that's adopted here, that the airlines, through one mechanism or another, in fact, uh, are involved in the collection of that tax by having it incorporated in the price of the ticket. Mr Deputy Speaker, now, quite clearly, uh, the problems that exist with the uh, system where people have to pay cash before they go, although uh, since I think uh, uh, sometime in 1990 you could use credit cards, but uh, very often people, of course, haven't got any money left when they go. Now, that's great. I wish every tourist that came to Australia was broke when they left. Yeah. Now, one of the problems we, we've identified... But, well, they, they, I'm happy if they go broke in my, in my electorate, as the minister suggests, but I mean, the, 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 the disturbing thing was, and coincidentally, that uh, a survey taken of Japanese visitors was that they were often going home with a lot of money in their pockets, and I think that was something of indictment on, on the retail industry. Now, I've got many friends that are retailers, so I don't want to offend them, but we really have to lift our game in terms of servicing the Japanese, and we want to take all their money off them while they're here in Australia. They go home with our money in their pockets, as the member for Fadden says. So we really have to turn that around. Uh, but the, the problem, of course, is if they don't have the money to pay the tax under the current system, then it's very embarrassing. As the member for Fadden, Fadden put it, they actually get an IOU. Now, I had a case of a constituent of mine who had a relative from Moscow visit him, and he left without any money. He probably came without any money too, I suppose. But anyway, he left without any money. And, uh, and he got, a, he got a, 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 a bluey in the mail that said, you're advised that failure to pay the tax will render you liable for prosecution under section six of the above act. Now I, I wrote, yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it, well it mightn't have got that bad, but anyway, I wrote to the, I wrote to the <coughs> Assistant Secretary of the National Aviation Policy Division. I said, well, 
well, hang on, you've threatened this guy with legal action. Are you going to extradite him? And some months later, and it was many months later, I got a response saying, well, no, they, they, wouldn't, uh, they didn't plan to extradite him. In fact, the system worked quite well and people, when they were reminded, generally paid up. Uh, and if they didn't, in any case, it would be referred to the Director of Public Prosecutions, who would then make a decision about Moscow. whether he would prosecute to recover the $10. But they would take into account, I was pleased to note, the person's domicile, which I took to mean where the person lived. And, uh, and I was pleased does. to hear that. But I, but I did figure out that it must have cost a, a heck of a lot, a, a, a considerable amount more uh, than the $10 to go through this procedure to collect the departure tax from someone who left that didn't have the money. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, my time is, is almost up, but I'm very pleased to, to see that a feature of the collection of this additional money is that it, uh, that it will, that is its dedication to tourism promotion. The minister, in his second reading speech, uh, said that the uh, revenues generated will go towards offsetting the costs of the government's announced increase by $23 million in funding for tourism promotion. And the coalition certainly welcomes that decision by the government to increase spending on tourism promotion. Um, really, the tourism promotion, for all that it does for Australia, receives very, very little government assistance compared with other industries and particularly compared with the amount of, uh, amount of uh, revenue that actually generates for the government. Deputy Speaker, I, finally, just uh, going back to where I started from, there is great opportunity for Australia to, to expand its share of the world market, and I believe it's crucial that we do so. Uh, it's been said that uh, there are jobs created, 8,700 jobs created for every 10 per cent increase in visitor arrivals. So I believe that increasing those visitor arrivals must surely be a major focus in these times of rising unemployment. The question is that this bill be now read a second time and the Chair would be grateful if the Member for Parramatta could avoid any reference to the KGB and his contribution. Yes, I, I didn't intend to refer to that, Mr Deputy Speaker. You'd be pleased to know. Uh, I would like to take up just a couple of matters that the Member for McPherson raised, which I think contrasted quite sharply with the comments of the Member for Fadden in a number of respects. but. Uh, the question relating to the, the pilots dispute is one that the opposition talks about frequently. I would have thought that uh, the opposition's support for the pilots in the action they've taken is something they'd be trying to uh, move away from as quickly as they possibly could. And it's, uh, uh, If you look at the actual development of our tourism industry, uh, both prior to the pilots dispute and since, and see how remarkably resilient it's been uh, through difficult economic times and through uh, uh, various other crises in international uh, affairs with the Gulf War and so forth, you see that uh, we have a great story to tell with our tourism. It has been, I think, one of the great areas of achievement of the 80s to get reach the 2.1 million uh, tourists that we've had to come here, particularly in the lead up to uh, Expo in 1988. And it certainly has the potential, as this uh, bill provides with a proper marketing campaign, uh, to ensure not only the doubling of that uh, number, but uh, a gr much greater multiplier, as the member for MacArthur talked about earlier. And I think uh, for far too long uh, we didn't appreciate just what a valuable industry this was. Uh, all too often we've had discussions in the past about notions about uh, picking winners and whether government should be in the business of picking winners in uh, industry uh, structure and, uh, and development. Well, tourism is one that we don't have to uh, be seen to be picking the winners in, what we have to do is to provide the infrastructure support so that those people that are the specialists in it can go out and achieve uh, uh, the objective. And that's what we're doing through this particular uh, departure tax. Uh, that's what we're doing through this. We're providing the mechanism so that people uh, can uh, sell the campaign internationally, the Tourism Commission and the various agencies and affili affiliates that it used to do that in our peak markets uh, can have the opportunity to, to sell the message and to achieve uh, uh, the sort of increase uh, I referred to. But uh, it's noteworthy, uh, given that there's been talk about the expenditure that has been allocated with the Norman campaign, uh, the Minister for Tourism was telling me only today that uh, in the lead up to the Norman campaign ads going to air on television, a uh, print uh, advertising campaign was run uh, both in Asia, the States and Japan, and the number of inquiries that that generated, just that print advertising campaign, was absolutely enormous, I'm told, by the, uh, by the minister, based on the uh, information that he's received from overseas. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt that that opportunity, that scope is there, 
it uh, certainly, I think, uh, increasingly will become uh, a popular destination. Australia will become a popular destination, and this time, when the tourism industry really takes off again, we have so much of the infrastructure that we lacked when the first campaign uh, with the Hogan uh, commercials was run. And of course, that's one thing that my predecessor, as member for Parramatta, John Brown talked about was at the time that tourism really took off in the early 80s uh, as part of the Hogan initiative, uh, we didn't have much of the infrastructure. We didn't have the sorts of facilities all around uh, uh, North Queensland and Western Australia and even in areas uh, closer to uh, uh, Sydney where there just wasn't the facilities. Well, today, in all of those regions, there's uh, unique uh, potential there for tourists to, to come here. And we have to do a number of things as well as run uh, the uh, advertising campaign, which the departure tax uh, achieves in a, in a painless way. We also have to ensure that the developments in the aviation side of things are, are got uh, correct. Uh, we have to ensure that we do have the flexibility ourselves and that we encourage uh, our uh, uh, international uh, partners uh, in these ventures to have the flexibility, both in terms of the access they give into their uh, destinations, their uh, air, uh, airports and so forth around the world, and that we can get uh, the capacity that uh, Japan should rightly offer in terms of our uh, aircraft and their seats on the aircraft to uh, encourage the Jap more Japanese to come here. But uh, I think the member for Fadden was quite right in referring to the potential that exists in Asia. Now, that is a market that we haven't really uh, targeted uh, adequately in the past, and it is no there is no doubt that that is one area where there is uh, unique potential, uh, which uh, no one quite knows uh, just how great that will be. But I've no doubt that with the Norman campaign uh, advertising, uh, we will start to see just what uh, opportunity there is from Asia, uh, particularly be it from Korea and other places, to uh, be a, a great contributor to at least achieving the five million visitors that the Tourism Commission talks about. The uh, other aspect of uh, the tourism uh, development, which I think is important, is that we recognise the integration, as the member for MacArthur referred to earlier, between the various other forms of uh, entertainment, uh, the various other uh, attributes that we have that bring people to Australia. Now, one of the things that I think is uh, important is that uh, uh, we develop the flexibility in, uh, in those arrangements. Now, with the member for MacArthur, we've recently been involved in inquiry into things like the customs service and the need to integrate the services that customs provide to be relevant to the sort of things that tourist operators and the entrepreneurs in the tourism industry want to do. And that means moving away from some of our past practices as far as how customs do their activities. It means that, uh, obviously, uh, places like Hamilton Island, where there's a lot of potential there, well, we have to be flexible and adapt to their needs so that uh, we can bring people not only to those sort of uh, uh, important uh, holiday destinations, but link them up with cities like Sydney, where there's great uh, potential to do uh, packages that uh, are successful. And if you just take the Sydney uh, area, there's all sorts of facilities that people want to come to in Sydney. Just in the western part of Sydney, we now have uh, items such as uh, Wonderland, the Blue Mountains, uh, the Eastern Creek, and shortly, with the, if uh, hopefully we're successful with the bid for the Olympic Games, we're going to have more and more people coming uh, to Australia. Now, all of that means that we've got to get uh, the integration of uh, the service provision. Uh, the operators have to achieve their objectives uh, uh, precisely, and we as government have to ensure the various agencies of government that are involved in that process are very conscious that service and the satisfaction that people will get uh, from an enjoyable and pleasurable time in Australia will promote more and more people to come here. And I've no uh, doubt at all that the sort of multiplier effect that we've talked about in jobs, the sort of potential the industry has as a foreign exchange earner, is one that we just uh, should take very much to heart, because it is in uh, the nation's interest to do that. Other speakers in the debate have spoken about the uh, fact that Far too often, people have been inclined to diminish uh, the worth of jobs in tourism uh, in the, and in the hospitality industry. We can't afford to do that anymore because we have a unique potential here. We've got uh, the best climate in the world. We've got uh, uh, the, the peace uh, that uh, uh, so many parts of the world can't uh, achieve in term because of their difficulties with terrorism and all sorts of other activities uh, that are a cause for concern. But above all else, we have the unique opportunity that uh, this vast nation provides to bring people from uh, very different climates 
at climate times that are undesirable in, their, in the northern hemisphere. And so if we can use uh, particularly that, uh, that summer period where there are so many people who will see the southern hemisphere as a very worthwhile place to come and enjoy their holidays, well there's no reason at all why that uh, uh, tourism potential can't be even magnified much above what the, uh, the Tourism Commission has talked about. And that really will be the test for us. We have to recognise that much of the job creation that's going to occur, the real jobs that are going to be created in the next decade, are going to be in different industries to some of those that might have been applied in the 50s and 60s. And if we recognise that and we adapt to that, well, we can certainly take advantage of that for Australia and uh, the great uh, range of tourist facilities that operate in this country. I'm going to, because of the time constraints and because uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, my colleague, the member for Perth, wants to have some time in the debate as well. Uh, again, to conclude on that uh, note, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I certainly welcome this uh, important initiative uh, for the Australian tourism industry. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Lyme. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the first of the year of the airport tax was 1978-9 and the income was $12 million. In 1988, 89, the income was $66 million, and of course for this year now it'll be approximately $42 million. And it dropped off, of course, because of the fact that there was a reduction in the tax generally. Naturally, of course, we had the strike, and this seriously affected the economy so far as the uh, tourist industry was actually concerned. I want to speak, uh, to speak very strongly in support of the bill before the House because. Uh, we have to understand here in Australia that the tourist industry is a growing industry and one that means so much so far as the economy to Australia is concerned. I won't go into the figures because a member for Fadden has uh, actually described these which are correct and he's pointed out the evidence of the fact that, uh, the, that uh, the industry is so import, important so far as the economy of Australia is concerned. I want to raise a couple of the matters which I believe are important, Mr Deputy Speaker, and one is the fact that Australia is so far away from the rest of the world. And uh, this means, of course, that the cost to reach Australia is very, very great indeed compared with the rest of the tourist countries of the world. We only share about 1% uh, of tourism generally. and. Uh, we have to realise that if we are going to attract these extra people here for Australia, well then we have to see that it is cheaper to reach the shores of this country of ours. And it does concern me at times that the Qantas is uh, somewhat restricted in the opportunities that they have to spread themselves around the world, particularly into the countries that we believe that there is a, a potential to, to actually increase the trade. I know it has to be reciprocal, but there are countries of the world, both in America, Japan, over the Asian scene, Britain, Europe, who uh, want the opportunity to be able to fly into Australia. And I think that the deregulation of, uh, of airlines within Australia is already showing to us, we have to see the result, but already showing to us that people can travel around Australia at a much cheaper deal than what they were a year or so ago. And so what is happening there can be transmitted so far as our world scene is actually concerned. And I appeal to the government to allow Qantas to be able to expand and to purchase the extra aircraft that they need. The extra ones that they buy per year is only uh, a small share of what some of the major countries of the world are buying to enable themselves to keep up with this great opportunity for tourism here in Australia. And so it is, it's a very competitive thing. It's a competitive thing outside of Australia for us to attract, to think of an industry that brings in $4 billion a year into Australia, over that in fact. And to think that, that, that if we can double, if we can double the turnover of tourism here in Australia, that's $8 million per year that we have income, over $5 billion dollars so far as uh, indirect taxation is concerned, which is a very big factor so far as income to Australia is concerned. Of course, Mr Deputy, uh, Mr uh, Speaker, not only so far as the airline side is concerned to get people here to Australia, I also once again, of course, raise here in the House the situation concerning the Sydney airport. 
uh, it's been spoken of here this evening, look, for goodness sake, let us get the people into Australia. 50% of the people arriving here want to come into Sydney. 52% last year wanted to go out through the Sydney airport. And so let's accede to the demands of these people and the wishes of these people that want to pay their attention here to Australia. Not only is it important, of course, so far as our world trade for tourism is concerned, but it's so important also so far as the intrastate travel of our people are actually concerned. Also, Mr Speaker, I, uh, I wish to just very briefly uh, uh, say uh, something about the, about the responsibility of private enterprise so far as the promotion of tourism is concerned. If people are going to travel, today the people that we see here in Australia are broadly people who can afford to come here and they spend money. Each Australian, each visitor that arrives here, in fact, spends almost $2,000 each in the time that they're here. And that's a lot of money to spend. But uh, the fact of the matter is that these people look for a standard of accommodation that is good. They look for a standard, standard so far as the restaurants are concerned, so far as their transport, their air, railway, their vehicle, the buses, private cars on the road. And so they're a mixture of all of these things. A lot of people love to travel by train. And we've never, I feel here in Australia, given, taken the opportunity to be able to cross Australia, to go to Alice Springs, to go to Perth, provide the transport by train that people want to when they arrive here. People want to do so many different things, Mr Speaker, from their fishing and from their sport. They want to look at the museums. They want to look at our countryside. They want to see the beaches. These are all these things. What an opportunity. You know, as a member for Parramatta happened to me, Mark, a while ago, so far as our seasons are concerned, winter, summer, autumn, spring is a place that, we're, that people are welcome to and can enjoy their time here in Australia. People that are coming from those misty and those cold parts of the world that want to come here over the winter months, even summer months, the same as we'd like to go to the north of Queensland over the winter months. So these are all factors that we have to consider. And yes, we we're very pleased to see you because your son's there working in the radio station and doing a very good job too. So you're welcome to come back at Tari any time. Sure, for a member for Fadden. But Mr Speaker, these are the things that uh, I wish to just say something about tourism, yes. It's been, it's, it's the opportunity that we have at the greatest income earner of all the industries of, that we have got today in Australia. And as a member for MacArthur said, we don't want everybody to be, uh, to work in a restaurant or somewhere to concern, but our TAFE colleges and our uh, our leading accommodation house of Australia are training people on management and how to cater for the people of Asia, the people of the European scene. This is being emphasised today. We've got to meet these demands everywhere around Australia. And I look, I would love to see, just concluding, Mr Speaker, to give the opportunity for first to say a word or so, just concluding, I would love to see more people attracted into our rural parts of Australia within my electorate of Lyon, to Nelson, Bay, to Foster, to Port Macquarie, these areas up in the mountains, the waterfalls, to see what the beauty that we have. And I hope that private enterprise can set themselves through their package trips can include lots of these places around Australia that we can entertain the people from around the world. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to be able to uh, support the bill. The Honourable Member for Perth. Thank you very much, and I thank the uh, member for Lyon very much for giving me a couple of minutes uh, to make some comments. I know, for instance, that the minister at the table has remained in here because he's interested to hear my contribution. Normally, we would have found him uh, making his way out the door, but uh, he uh, he is uh, concerned about this issue, <laughs> and uh, and uh, he uh, he wants to uh, he wants to hear my contribution. What I wanted to say, and there were a number of issues I wanted to raise, but I f should firstly say that I think that, uh, once again, the member for Fadden has given us a, a very thoughtful and balanced uh, critique of the legislation, and indeed uh, it, isn't, it isn't controversial legislation, it's legislation that's uh, supported by both of us, because it goes to uh, a very, the support of a very important industry in Australia, that of the tourist industry. 
what I wanted to do was just to make one or two comments about uh, Qantas, which of course is the, the largest uh, private promoter of Australia as a tourist destination. And many of us are of course aware of uh, Qantas's present parlour state. And indeed, uh, there are uh, significant concerns about the management uh, of Qantas and the way in which uh, indeed it has uh, operated in a difficult environment. The minister would say, and I, I've heard his defence of Qantas, that uh, of course these are very difficult times for international airlines. But if one compares the performance of an airline like Qantas with uh, Cathay Pacific, uh, an airline of similar size and uh, uh, operating in, uh, uh, in uh, the region, then uh, it's interesting to note that their operating profit for calendar year 1990 was $300 million. And uh, the last half of 1990 was, of course, a difficult period. So one has to look at the way in which that airline operates in comparison with Qantas. And uh, one would uh, note certainly firstly that of course they don't have the massive overstaffing difficulty that uh, Qantas finds itself faced with. I think uh, uh, strategically you find an airline in Cathay Pacific that uh, perhaps picks its markets better than Qantas. And I think that uh, it is fair to say that uh, Qantas has recognised that uh, it did stretch itself too widely and therefore I have some concern about the comments made by the member for Fadden when he suggested that Scandinavia should in fact uh, we should be considering uh, air service arrangements with the uh, countries in that region because I really think that's uh, outside our ballpark. We need to get our act in order in this region first of all. The third thing I think that is important and that is perhaps most critical is that Cathay Pacific strikes me as an airline that is customer driven. And, uh, in all service industries, and in particular tourism, that's something that is absolutely critical. And I might just give an example here, if I can, of my most recent holiday, because when we are able to get away from this place, we get the opportunity from time to time to travel. And I travelled to the southwest of Western Australia, the southwest of Western Australia recently with the family, and uh, unfortunately my trip to the southwest coincided with a cyclone in Perth, and of course trees were falling across the road before me and behind me all the way. When I got there, unfortunately, the power was cut off at the, uh, at the chalet units in the Cary Forest in the deep south of Western Australia. And uh, after booking into the chalet, I discovered that the electricity was off due to uh, natural causes, not the sort of thing that one should uh, be especially concerned about and one should understand. But I was amazed that uh, the people at reception were neglected to tell me that this was the case. And so after I'd stumbled around finding a candle, the kids thought it was the best you holiday ever. But be kept in the dark. For, for me, who was kept in the dark, without refrigeration, electric light, heating, it was a terrible problem. And imagine my chagrin when, when uh, 24 hours later the power was still off and then the water had cut out because they couldn't pump water into the tank. And again, they neglected to tell me. What it was goes the to the what issue the of, of service place? and providing and providing service and uh, customer services. <laughs> and in, in respect of tourism, I think, uh, and uh, in respect of our airline and the way in which we, we provide tourism services, this is something that's most important. What this uh, legislation will do is it will provide extra funds for the ATC for the promotion of Australia as destination. The benefits have been clearly spelled out by the member for Fadden, and uh, it is uh, legislation that I support, and I would hope that uh, we will see uh, uh, the benefits of this flowing into our economy in the years to come. Order. It being mi midnight, the time allotted for the remaining stages of the bill has expired. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Departure Tax Act 1978. <laughs> the question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Departure Tax Act 1978. The Honourable Minister. Move the House to now adjourn. The Move question the is that the House do now adjourn. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Today. that she would not commit the crime again. Mrs Mandela's co-accused, Mylisa Falati, was sentenced to six years jail, while Mrs Mandela's driver, John Morgan, was given a one-year suspended sentence. Mr Bezos has announced he'll seek leave to appeal against a guilty verdict. Rob Rashke, Johannesburg. And Mrs Mandela was released on bail. The federal opposition has...